a very very good sunday morning to all of you i welcome you all on behalf of professor titial chief rp center professor rajpal and professor venkatesh uh, professor rajpal head of retina unit and senior professor of our retina unit professor pradeep venkatesh to this cme on anti vegfs now as all of you know anti vegfs have been a very big scientific breakthrough and a big boon for the retina surgeons and especially our patients who have definitely benefited from this it has revolutionized retina therapy but with all scientific breakthroughs there are some concerns and some areas where we sh where should be, they should be used and where they should not be used some areas of caution and i think today we'll discuss all of these and so that all of us can use them in a better way to help all our patients so without much ado i'll welcome uh, professor rajpal professor pradeep venkatesh and the panelists of the first session dr vinod who is also additional professor at rp center and dr dipinder singh who is also a very senior retina specialist practicing in delhi please dr dipinder and dr vinod and i also welcome the first speaker dr anirudh good morning everyone the topic of the first session for this workshop is introduction to anti vegf drugs formation of new vessels can be divided into vasculogenesis and angiogenesis so vasculogenesis is formation of new vessels de novo from the primitive mesodermal cells whereas angiogenesis is sprouting of new vessels from pre existing capillaries in uh, in the, in ocular angiogenesis abnormal neovascularization occurs in response to ischemia of the neuroretina which can lead to a preretinal uh, ne neovascularization which is the main pathogenesis of all the proliferative retinopathies whereas anywhere if there is a breach of the brooks membrane and related inflammation there is subretinal angiogenesis leading to choroidal neovascular membrane formation briefly discussing the discovery of the vegf molecule so it was in 1948 when michelson followed by ashton proposed an hypothetical metabolic factor named as factor x which induces new vessel formation in response to ischemia and further different research group labeled it as vascular permeability factor and vascular endothelial growth factor and subsequently on genomic studies it was found that these molecules were identical and had all the properties of the originally hypothesized factor x it was then in 1997 that the first anti vegf molecule was discovered and was fda approved in 2004 primarily for the treatment of colorectal cancers so vegf is a potent endothelial specific mitogen which in response to hypoxia leads to increased vascular permeability and angiogenesis in the eye it is synthesized by the retinal pigment epithelial cells and in conditions of hypoxia by cells such as muller cells endothelial cells and pericytes also secrete this molecule the vegf family of molecules consists of vegf a b c d and placental growth factor and it has mainly three receptors in the eye it is vegf a and primarily isoforms vegf a 121 and 165 which on binding to vegf receptor 2 leads to angiogenesis uh, the vegf receptor is a tyrosine kinase receptor and upon binding to the vegf molecule leads to endothelial cell survival migration and proliferation so in normal conditions vegf is a very important molecule which helps in embryogenesis of various body organs as well as for the development of the human retina and vessels in physiological conditions the rpe derived vegf is proposed as a survival factor which maintains the health of the chorio capillaries endothelium and it has been shown that it also has a neuroprotective and a neurotrophic role so in in normal condition it is a neurogenic molecule and helps in development of the retina whereas in abnormal condition it leads to increased vascular permeability and neovascularization 
So whenever there is abnormal VEGF production in response to ischemia, inflammation, or any oxidative stress, it can lead to vascular leakage. In the acute stages, primarily due to phosphorylation of the tight junction zonular occludens, and in chronic conditions due to formation of abnormal leaky vessels, which leads to macular edema. And, so, and the second pathogenetic mechanism is it, it can lead to neovascularization either at the preretinal level or at the subretinal level. So the proposed target strategies for the treat uh, for anti-VEGF molecules have been. Uh, primarily directed on the VEGF, VEGF receptor complex, although there have been few experimental molecules which involve small interfering RNA molecules which inhibit the mRNA, VEGF mRNA, uh, the, uh, acts at the level of the mRNA of the VEGF molecule as well as uh, its receptor. Also there have been proposed role of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in, uh, in the VEGF pathway. So the five commonly used molecules in the current era are bevacizumab, ranibizumab, aflibercept, uh, brolucizumab, and farisimab, and it acts on the following receptors. So bevacizumab is a is the was a full uh, monoclonal humanized antibody directed against VEGF A molecule. Then ranibizumab was just the antibody binding fragment of the same antibody. So it is a much smaller molecule. And, af uh, and subsequently, aflibercept is a fusion protein of VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. So it inhibits not only VEGF A, but also inhibits VEGF B and placental growth factor. The two new molecules are brolucizumab and farisimab. Brolucizumab is an even smaller mo a version of uh, ranibizumab FAB fragment. So it is just the single chain variable fragment of the antibody binding fragment of the full antibody. So it's a, it is the smallest used molecule and therefore has the most highest uh, molecular dosing per injection. And farisimab is again a bispecific monoclonal antibodies which has two binding sites against VEGF A and angiopoietin 2. Uh, this is, these are some of the commonly, uh, indi common indications of anti-VEGF drugs. So in the retina, it is used for mainly all proliferative retinopathies and neovascular AMD as well as other causes of CNVM. And it does have few indications for corneal and glaucoma pathology as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anurudh, for that wonderful introduction to the anti-VEGF drugs. As Dr. Rohan mentioned, it is something which, without which we cannot survive uh, nowadays in, uh, because almost all retinal disorders have one part or the other which is treated by anti-VEGF drugs. And Anurudh very nicely summarized what is the role of VEGF in uh, physiological conditions and what all anti-VEGF drugs can do to tackle when it happens in pathological conditions. So, any comments from the house? So, uh, we can go to the next talk and that would be um, by Professor Valpendian. Uh, he'll be talking about uh, uh, the field he's master in, uh, pharmacokinetics and compounding. So, Dr. Valpendian has been instrumental in providing us uh, uh, Bevacizumab helicots, uh, the vials uh, which he does in a very, very meticulous manner. Uh, the, the effect that we are still able to use Bevacizumab for the benefit of poor patient while most of other centers have stopped using Bevacizumab for the fears of compounding related, uh, related infections. So, uh, I would just like to welcome Professor Titeal, sir, our chief. He has joined us online. He is not in Delhi today, but he is also attending this CME. He has joined us online. Okay, we'll take the next talk. Thanks for inviting me for this talk. It's very, Anurud that made a platform for me about the anti-VEGF. So it's good for me to just glide upon it. So pharmacokinetics of anti-VEGF, something is very interesting, okay? So, the company who made bevacizumab made the ranibizumab two years later. The problem is one has been 
given to one uh, distribution company, another one is given to another one. So Genentech made it and given to two different pharma companies for marketing with an approval of specific. But underlying condition, underlying physiology, underlying pathology in which it is working on are all same. So we have a problem. Now when it comes to, uh, uh, when it comes to its action, I think Anurut said very nicely, you must remember VEGF is essential. When we look at the levels of uh, vitreous, we, I mean VEGF levels, there are, you know, you could see around 200 picomole of VEGF is there in the vitreous in normal. We are all having it. Now, at some times of diabetic retinopathy or AMD, the level goes up. Now you have to look into the plasma also. Is it only for eye or is going pan? The diabetic retinopathy, all we understand, there is an offshoot of a systemic problem where we have diabetes and it is getting into it. Now come back again, ischemia and VGF. So the ischemia which is produced in the eye, is it very specific for the eye, for the retina or it is a pan problem? So when I just look into it, see this beautiful uh, paper which came from uh, uh, I think KGMC which shows nicely control level from there you know when you just go no uh, adapted retinopathy and PDR and PDR the level is constantly rising. But at the same time the question which is not answered is that a person is well controlled diabetes still he is getting into uh, uh, PDR. The person who is already having a very I mean uncontrolled diabetes not having uh, diabetic retinopathy. So these questions making us to think beyond what we know as a treatment using anti-VHF. Okay, let me ask, just uh, <coughs> put you, when I try to explain the mechanism, see when you just look into the uh, pharmacokinetics that each molecule of this anti-VHF is capable of neutralizing some amount of VGF, whether 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 10 or 1 is to, see this is something that it may not be having great relevance. but it's just like you know I'm just trying to increase the binding affinity or I trying to make the more specificity but by and large when you just look into it so when you just see when the, this experiment is a beautiful experiment what they have done is they have taken a VGF and anti-VEGF together they have put into a well what do you see here and they assessed the release of VGF along with time from the bound form once if you complex both of them they are in bound form. Now, now they start understanding that how much is left, how much is coming up. So the ratio they were trying to calculate. So this study, when you just look into this graph, see at lower concentration you see that 100 percent VGF is coming up. So when you are keep on increasing anti-VGF agents, now slowly, slowly, slowly that, that is going low. The migration is going low. That, that shows that the binding definitely it is having some role to play in releasing the, in, in contenting the VGF which is present in the vitreous. Let us just try to extrapolate it. But <clears throat> when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the dosing, there are different, different dosing levels. One is 0.3 milligram, one is 1 point, uh, point 0.16 to 1.25. So the differing, the concentration what you are injecting, it is having something to do how much it is going to act on the amount of VGF which is present in the vitreous cavity. But I must tell you, when I just try to look into the pharmacokinetics of it, I can only compare this with an antacid. The drugs can have multiple types of action. It can act through the typical types of pharmaco pharmacology. It can stimulate, it can inhibit, it can go for complexing or it can, uh, it can go for you know, cytotoxic actions. So among all of them, there is something called neutralization. You, if somebody is suffering from peptic ulcer, you give antacid. So what is the role of antacid? It directly goes and neutralizes the acid which is in the stomach. But, but that is not the underlying problem. This is an exhibit of a problem. You are trying to deal it superficially. You are trying to suppress the hydrochloric acid. Therefore, the pharmacokinetic what you are looking into it in anti-VEGF is not something to deal exactly with the way how we deal with other type of agents where we suppose you are injecting a vancomycin inside or you are injecting something else. So they are all governed by a different pharmacokinetic parameters where the involvement of blood ocular barrier comes into picture. But when it comes to this, <coughs> this study when we did it some time back, 
you know, what we did is, where we incubated this, one of our PG did this work. Uh, I think uh, uh, Tulkar has done this with uh, Dr. Rohan. This, this study, when we did it, 24 hours later, we took the vitreous and we tried to study how much, uh, how much amount of bevacizumab which is left in the eye. So when we did it with the <coughs> affinity towards uh, VEGF when we did it, when you just look into it very closely, when this is 24 hour sampling, this is 48 hour sampling, after injected with bevacizumab, you see that that chain, bevacizumab is getting uh, uh, sort of a, a decomposition is happening or it is getting cleaved away by the proteases of the vitreous. So what is happening now? Now, suppose 300 picomole of VEGF is there in the eye. That could be because of systemic or maybe due to retinal ischemia which is specific to the eye, that ischemia, why is it forming specific to the eye, we really don't know. What is responsible for triggering that, we don't know. But metabolic syndrome, when we look into it, we consider that is somewhere drug insulin resistance is responsible for. Is this insulin resistance is causing this problem in the eye also, where the metabolically retina is very strong. It requires very high amount of glucose. So the glucose receptors, transporters are present there, is constantly supplying glucose. But the moment glucose supply is reduced, so now the argument comes, well, you have excess amount of glucose in the blood, why is it not going in? Now the new picture comes is that insulin resistance. Although it is there, everything is there, but the glucose is not going inside the cell. So there is an ischemia. That ischemia is now just looking forward for food. So it asks the blood vessels to grow. The mechanism gets activated. It could be angiotensin 2, hypoxia induced factor. Then it comes to VEGF. Or anyway, end result is it is making new railroads. That is what your vascularization inside the cells to get more supply. So that's a physiological process. So you understand that the amount of vitreous uh, VEGF which is present in the eye is having a purpose to play, but when it concerns of retinal angiogenesis, we have an issue. So similar condition we see somewhere else in the body where we try to work with uh, uh, PCOS. There we have the similar condition, but not leading to us in a very, very early stages of metabolic syndrome. When we look into the vitreous uh, bevacizumab levels over 48 hours, it has dropped to 40 percent. This is a calculated one. This shows vitreous levels are now you are using anti-VEGF molecule is just to neutralize your VEGF and that's all, but you are not dealing with the underlying problem which is responsible for it. So all the subsequent pharmacokinetics shows that this is active for two days of life, this is four days of life, that is immaterial. You cannot wipe out total uh, VEGF if you do it, again you are harming the process of physiological healing and neuroprotection which has been offered. Therefore, it is getting partition, disposition, getting excreted, most of the studies are run in rabbit, you must remember monoclonal antibodies are humanized and working it on rabbit may not be having the same complement factor for its clearance. Therefore, this may not be having direct relevance for any of the pharmacokinetic studies. That is why we could not do many of them. So, the next come to a small one or two slides of compounding. Well, after 2000, when it was started in 2005, the first injection of bevacizumab made, 2006, RP Center started using bevacizumab ampules. And this is the only one pharmacy in the world which could give bevacizumab in ampule, the technology what we have. So through which a compounding we are trying to do it, but 2004 we had a massive problem. I think some of you must be remembering about it. There was a counterfeit Avastin came into picture. And many hospitals in India suffered because of this and you know samples sent to us for analysis when we did it, we fingerprinted, yes, there are fake drugs and it is not only to India, it is throughout the world and the end of the marketing chain, we also suffered because of this. So. That is, that is what explains sometimes you get a sterile endophthalmitis or you just uh, sterile inflammation or you have a frank infectious endophthalmitis. But you cannot, you know, always it's a nightmare for you when you inject Avastin and you next day morning, you next uh, two days later, you feel the patient is down with endophthalmitis. But it's not purely because of that also. Any cluster endophthalmitis, we have the counterfeit drug also come into picture. Therefore, after doing this, we do a lot of sterility testing as well as we do the drug testing, whether the drug is there or not. That is why RPC pharmacy is able to handle it and that is why we are trying to do this. So when I just try to conclude it, the most important thing is how much 
anti vgf to be injected even there was a paper saying that 6.2 microgram of anti vgf is enough to you know stop the in the dr that shows quickly it is just erasing the higher concentration of vgf not necessary you just totally remove all vgf and try to do it and systemic vgf can definitely get into eye where you have nothing to do much so symptomatically you are treating and unless otherwise we do a comprehensive treatment the system system is very difficult to control so apart from that molecular weight you have net charge existing inflammation status and the you know broken blood retinal barrier all the things continuously change this so i strongly emphasize the need of proper compounding pharmacy to set up to handle sterile injection like bevacizumab otherwise it's always difficult i would rather discourage you doing it by yourself have a particular staff appointed with a good facility you will be able to do that thank you very much for giving this opportunity to your talk thank you so much uh, dr velu pandya and um, uh, i think uh, uh, we are grateful uh, to you for supporting rp center with the vaccine uh, i think it has done lot of help to all those needy patients uh and uh, we are grateful to rp center aims for supporting the cause lot of us are still using uh, uh, bevacizumab in uh, practice and it's uh, primarily because of the efforts made by uh, aims rp center to support that this is a drug which actually should not be withdrawn and i think it's a good drug the story is almost like a fairy tale uh, like uh, dr uh, vinod already pointed out Uh, this was a one very good example in medicine where finding a molecule uh, you know uh, could be converted into a treatment uh, which was helping patient so i think uh, with this if we have any other comment from uh, any uh, yeah, uh, just one yes. clarification yes. you mentioned about insulin receptors and yes. insulin resistance resistance yes okay which tissues do you expect the which tissue which tissue uh, do you expect the insulin receptors in the eye or uh, in the retina uh, uh, you uh, said uh. that possibly is also driving the uh, process so where exactly is it located uh what we understand is that as of now uh insulin resistance we see because in somewhere we see systemic levels of some studies they observed the systemic levels of vgfs are low but it is specifically operated upregulated in the eye in such a situation we are expecting that some ischemia which is getting caused in the you know rpe or you know we still we are not very clear about it because we see two types of tra the glucose transporters that are there in the eye where glut2 is predominantly present over there how the insulin resistance is happening which is releasing what what is causing the uh, ischemia to form you have enough amount of uh, uh, glucose is there but still ischemia why is it forming this question we really don't know probably in another year or two we will be able to explain that why so but we did a some studies earlier diabetes means when you induced a diabetes in an animal within 10 days of induction when 30 days it gets a completely full diabetic 30 days we could see lot of erg changes in the retina so that time we could see lot of transporters get are upregulated and downregulated especially slc type of transporters so really still we don't know which to pinpoint but it's much more a type of indian problem so we thought that you know we should de we should dissect it and work in a grassroot level to understand the diabetes whether it is environment related insulin resistance or it is uh, triggered by pure uh, the in the in environment related drug resistant is the one which is more appealing because 24% of women now indian population is getting into diabetes unlike about 40 years before so we try to look forward for you know these mechanisms to it there could there are so many environmental pollutants which are responsible for this insulin resistance or could be independent pathway to block ppar gamma or uh, we are this blocking pkc pathway akt pathway is possible so we try to work on that level no i'm sorry sorry i'm repeating again but i still get didn't get the question about whether you were actually able to identify insulin receptors yes, yes, yes. in which part of the retinal layers we yet to know about it because we know very well that it's happening but pinpointing that is becoming a more troublesome yeah, okay, because so uh, secondary mechanism inside the cell the moment the glucose goes through glut4 glut2 it's supposed to get trigger all the pathways or if it is going towards inside metabolic pathway somewhere metabolic pathway is hindered as a result the whole whole cascade is getting affected so we really don't know we are in a very very early stage to understand but we are trying to get all circumstantial evidence to say 
we know it is there ischemia is there we all of us know about it where it is happening why is it happening really we don't know and thank you thank you not have but i would still recommend to please follow the proper vrsi guidelines and the aios guidelines so that the drug doesn't get a bad name once yes. we start getting infections and we we'll start getting the legal hassles then it becomes a problem for everyone and it is up to us to use it in a proper manner to safeguard its use and to help the poor patients who cannot afford any other drug absolutely i agree with him yeah thank you, thank you. i think interesting uh, concept of like uh, proposing alternate mechanism of uh, uh, wegf uh, uh, drive not just by hypoxia by i think <coughs> insulin resistance so we'll move on to now uh, the next talk uh, dr devarun sharma he'll be speaking on his senior resident at rp center he'll be speaking on intravitreal injection technique and precautions Good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I will be talking about intravitreal injections, the technique and the precautions. So basically, my talk will be broadly divided into these three topics. I will be uh, discussing about the pre-operative considerations, the injection procedure, and the post-operative examination and the follow-up of the patients. So before I move on to the talk, I would like to mention these two articles uh, that give us an overview of how an intravitreal injection should be undertaken. This was the first of, uh, first article which came out uh, in 2004 in Retina, and it gave us the guidelines for intravitreal injection. And subsequently in 2018, this is the uh, article and the guidelines that we follow currently. And these are the AIOS guidelines that we follow for intravitreal injections. Now. Uh, coming to the pre-operative considerations, before giving an intravitreal injections, we have to look at certain things so that the patient and does not land up in any problem. The first and the foremost thing that we have to uh, do is to screen for any active infection in the eye because presence of any active in infection in the eye predisposes the patient to a devastating complication like endophthalmitis. So when a patient comes to the clinic for any intravitreal injection, we must look for the patency of the nasolacrimal duct. We must carefully look at the ocular adnexa and the eyelids to rule out any active infection. And then we have to look for the systemic condition of the patient. The Systemic conditions should be stabilized before the patient is undertaken for any intravitreal injection and hypertension and diabetes should be adequately controlled before giving any injection. Now, there, were, there is a debate regarding the use of topical antibiotics in uh, intravitreal injections. We r routinely advocate using uh, topical antibiotics about three days before intravitreal injections, but certain studies like the ESCRS guidelines did not find any significant difference in the rate of endophthalmitis while using the preoperative topical antibiotics. And the last thing that we have to do is to take a written informed consent. The patient should be clearly explained about all the risk factors and also the adverse events that may happen following an intravitreal injection. Now, there are certain specific clinical situations which we have to consider. If a patient with ocular hypertension or glaucoma comes to us, then intravitreal injections are not really uh, contraindications. And in such cases, a routine anterior chamber paracentesis is also not recommended. Secondly, if the patient is on any type of anticoagulation, there is minimal risk of giving an intravitreal injection and the patient can undergo uh, the procedure. And thirdly, uh, some patients may have an uh, uh, allergy to povidone iodine, which is uh, very rare. But if, if we encounter any such patient, then they can be treated with dilute chlorhexidine of 0.02%. Uh, now, uh, some, uh, there is a debate whether we should give uh, bilateral injections or not. Bilateral injections are usually recommended in certain specific circumstances like in ROP, but routinely, Injection of the other eye is usually recommended one week later after the first eye. Now, here you can see the instrumentation that we use for intravitreal injections. Here you can see the presence of 
the betadine, uh, the sterile BSS, you should have multiple amounts, uh, ample amount of gauze pieces, and you should have a sterile uh, towel, and you should have a 30 gauge needle with syringe, as you can see here. Now, coming to the procedure, the procedure should be preferably performed in an operation theater or a sterile room. After that, we have to confirm the eye both with the uh, patient as well as the referring doctor and then after confirming the eye we have to apply the local anesthetic agent to the patient now here as you can see for the application of povidone iodine to the eye 10% povidone iodine is used for the skin and the periocular area and 5% povidone iodine is used in the conjunctival sac so as you can see in this video the povidone iodine should be applied from the starting from the upper forehead to the mid chin region and it should be completely covering this area so we should give a proper povidone iodine wash to the eye and it has been seen that povidone iodine given for at least three minutes prior to intravitreal injection significantly reduces the chances of adverse events like endophthalmitis now after application of povidone iodine we have to properly drape the area and then we have to give three washes of povidone iodine and balanced salt solution as can be seen here and it should be remembered that povidone iodine should be the last agent that should be applied to the field before administration of intravitreal injection Now, this was a paper which showed that povidone iodine significantly reduces the conjunctival bacterial flora. And now coming to the intraoperative considerations, the needle which we use for intravitreal injection is the 30 gauge needle. It has a length of about 0.5 inches and the patient should be instructed to look away from the site of entry and the injection should be given in a step-like entry part by pulling the conjunctiva over the injection site. So these are the different sites of injections from the limbus according to the age, as you can see. Now, just showing a video for how we give a betadine wash to the patient. While giving the betadine wash, we have to make sure that the betadine is not, uh, not applied directly to the cornea, and the wash should be given from the inner side of the eye to the outer side, so that all the debris from the inner side are washed out. Now, coming to the technique of intravitreal injection, as you can see here, the preferably it is preferred that the patient is dilated and under the magnification of the microscope, the calipers are adjusted according to the uh, status of the phacic or pseudophacic status of the patient. After that, it is the injections are usually given in the inferotemporal quadrant as it is the most accessible and the most uh, exposed part. After marking the area, uh, the injection is given in a step-like pattern. As you can see here, first the needle is uh, inserted in a perpendicular manner and it is slightly tilted obliquely so that it enters the eye in a step-like pattern. And after uh, observing the tip of the needle, we have to inject the intravitreal injection as can be seen. So now finally coming to the post-operative care, uh, the bandage after intravitreal injection is usually removed after four hours and topical antibiotics are usually given for about five days and post-op IOP monitoring is very important for uh, to rule out any uh, significant spike of IOP and the patient should be advised to avoid eye washing for about 24 hours and the first follow-up of the patient should be about three days after the injection followed by the interval which is dictated by the clinical scenario and the most important thing that should be emphasized to the patient is that they should immediately rep uh, uh, report to the casualty or the clinic in case of any pain, photophobia or redness or decrease in vision and and an emergency contact number should be provided in such cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Devarun, for nicely hi highlighting all the precautions we must take while administrating intravital injections. Uh, I think uh, uh, due to ever-increasing indications and uh, mm, 
the popularity and availability of these uh, intravitreal anti vegf agents in fact they have uh, become the most common intravitreal uh, most common intraocular procedure over and above the cataract surgery all over the world so to, uh, to i think they it is very important that we take all these necessary precautions so two uh, things which i have observed in my scenario is very are very important over and above these is that you must always take out the air bubble outside of your needle okay so because that does two things one your patient is always very fussy about the air bubble the next day though most of the times this air bubble is going to go away get absorbed in one or two days but this patient will be symptomatic but more important is that you end up injecting lesser amount of drug if you include air bubble in your syringe so these are the two very important factor you must always take into account anything else i think uh, very well presented uh, dr devarun uh, we do it little differently uh, we tend to uh, displace conjunctiva towards the limbus so when you mark 4 uh, mm or 3 mm at that mark you can hold the conjunctiva with colibri or limbs and displace it towards limbus and first step is uh, angled and when you are finally entering the eyeball then make it perpendicular and of course clear lens size you have to be careful that you don't push uh, hit the lens second thing is uh, we don't uh, give pre operative antibiotics for uh, any of our injections for last uh, ever since uh, last 15 years and post operatively we avoid quinolones because we don't want resistance to quinolones so we just give a broad spectrum chloramphenicol as a protocol because it's a prophylaxis it is post exposure prophylaxis we are giving it's not we are not treating any infection and it's very cornea friendly antibiotic and third thing i can uh, share with fellows and srs is it's always good especially in a patients with having borderline iop or glaucoma and wherever you are injecting sometimes you inject double dose of a vest in in some certain cases good to check the light perception with the microscope light then and there only and if some patient is suddenly saying i am not able to see light then you immediately do the paracentesis so don't ask for indirect or any torch your microscope light is very good uh, i think in checking the light perception yeah, yeah. just yeah. this one more small point you said rop you inject up one the second injection after one week So no sir in rop simultaneous i have bilateral can be given yeah. sir so yeah, it, has given it has to be given simultaneously ha, sir, it is like an option no i mean slide my slide you went through very quickly what is the distance of yes, uh, uh, injection from the limbus Can we put the slides again, please? Just for a second. You can speak. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, for one to six months of age, the distance from the limbus is about 1.5 mm. From six months to one year, it is about 2 mm. From one to two years of age, it is about 2.5 mm. And from seven years onwards, uh, it is like an adult. patient and so the for fakeic we give it for 3 mm for pseudo fakeic it is 3.5 mm and for fakeic it is 4 mm from the limbus yeah uh, one, one other recommendation is that the patient should be there for around uh, for half an hour or so and you're expected to measure the intraocular pressure if you have access to nct or your digital uh, pressure itself and like uh, depender was saying look for light perception on the microscope but better than that would be to at least look for finger counting vision before you send your patient away okay one of the thing that happens is that we are giving so many injections like uh, dr pandian was saying it's a cluster injections that we are giving so we're not actually sticking to protocol in each of our patients but in practice you're going to have enough time so these are recommendations that need to be actually documented that finger counting vision basic vision was there and you may have pressures going up beyond 13 in a few of your cases okay so you have to be cautious there and that's the reason that if you go back they would uh, they, these are the other points that would be there in your international guidelines okay and the other point that i'd like to uh, emphasize is on the dilatation there is always uh, a, a debate about whether you should dilate or not dilate the uh, lucentis guidelines very clearly say when they introduce the drug that the pupil should be dilated it improves the safety of your procedure particularly for fakeic patients so i think when you're beginning your injections try and do not 
uh, ignore that uh, about, ignore the pupillary dilation component we have seen lens drops happening at the best of situations so it's rare these complications but if you want to i mean go to zero complications you must follow all the guidelines okay dr parijat what is your opinion should you dilate should you not dilate mic the professor parijat yeah so in, in rop we don't want to dilate because uh, if you start try to start seeing the needle tip then there's a higher chance you'll end up hitting the lens so you want to stick to the direction because the lens is a little large in preterm baby so you do not want to dilate and better stick to the direction and the procedure which you want to concentrate on if it's gone in obviously it's gone inside the eye so that is a little different in no it is not recommended it or is it not is so we don't want to dilate in the uh, in the rop eyes because if you try to start because the needle is already when something a very small part of inside we're not going the full needle in but if you start you know pushing it too much to one side and and you actually start seeing the needle there's Nain a high chance you might end up hitting the needle. Then the question is whether you should see the needle or not. No, we don't want to see the needle. I think okay. in even even the guidelines are not uh, to dilate. Yeah. Even yeah. in adults, okay. we don't don't are we are not dilating just to see the needle. Especially in fake eyes, sometimes you see only drug. Main reason is if you have have to examine uh, optic nerve head. Uh, that yeah, was the right. that was the teaching that if you like patient is still not uh, perceiving light and you have to examine the optic nerve head. and second thing is sometimes this happens uh, you know by error in our system patient comes to you undilated it's highly uncomfortable for any patient adult patient at least to lie under microscope light without dilatation <laughs> comfort level increases uh, tremendously once they are dilated so it is better i uh, need to dilate because we have seen uh, it is not rare to have a high bp and having a serious complication if they do occur every after 6 month they are coming from private or the from air so that is important to see at least if you can see the fundus after one hour that you make sure that everything is fine because eye is so complex it's very difficult thank you excuse me uh, i want to ask one question any role of steroids or nsaid is post operatively or only antibiotic we prefer Uh, there has not been much studies regarding the role of any steroids or NSAIDs post surgery, so we routinely do not recommend such conditions. Okay, next. Okay, thank you, Devarun. Uh, I think being being the practical part of it, uh, this uh, your topic draw the most uh, discussion. Anyway, so we'll move to the next topic, and Dr. Nishad Hussain, who is an additional professor here at RP Center in Ocular Microbiology, she'll be speaking on microbiological perspective and infection control in such eyes. Dr. Nishad, thank you very much. A very good morning to one and all present here. so in uh, microbiology perspective and infection control i'll be speaking about the various sources of infection during the procedure how we can prevent the occurrence of infection from those sources and in case an infection occurs what all we have to do so uh, during the procedure infection can get transmitted from environment instruments medicines or washes disinfectants patient as well as from healthcare worker when we want to prevent the infection from the environment there are three things which are very important that the procedure should take place in a room which is having a supply of hepa filtered air the optimum temperature and humidity of the room should be maintained and all the surfaces of the room should be properly disinfected and if these three things are taken care of on a routine basis fogging of the rooms is not required but it may be required in some special circumstances like in case of an outbreak or if some renovation work has taken place etc quality control of these procedures is done by uh, frequent maintenance of the filters and maintaining a log of surface disinfection the procedure as well as the frequency of disinfection should be proper and microbiologically we can check these things by using the settle plates for the quality of air and we can take the culture of surface swabs to see whether the disinfection is proper or not the instruments or drapes etc should be sterilized for using in the procedure and the quality control is done by using the chemical and biological indicators of the run and also we can open random articles to take the swabs for microbiological culture 
and before use intactness of the packaging and seal of the article should be checked and in some uh, sterilization procedures for example uh, in autoclave we should check the date of sterilization also for example an autoclave article if it is not used also if it is packaged also after 72 hours it should be re autoclaved before using it for patient care this is an example of a chemical indicator we are able to see before uh, the run of the autoclave the lines are white so if they turn black after the procedure this means the run has been successful this tape is stuck on the top of the article which needs to be autoclaved and uh, this is a modification of the chemical indicator this is a bovidic card which is inserted in the depths of the article so if there is a uniform change in color then we understand that inside the depths of the article the steam has penetrated uniformly and the run is successful and these are the biological indicators which contain highly heat resistant spores and we see whether after the run the spores have been killed or not medicines washes etc most of them come in packaged forms and seal and date of expiry should be checked and they should also be physically examined for any visible contamination or turbidity also manufacturers instructions should be strictly followed for dilution usage and storage and we are also doing cultures of random batches of even packaged medicines and washes all the in-house preparations we are releasing for patient care only after ensuring that they are sterile we are doing cultures of each batch before releasing them for patient care scrubs and disinfectants they also come in package form so all these things checking seal physical examination following manufacturers instructions should be done for them as well as whenever a new disinfectant is introduced for patient care the components as well as the percentages of the components should be checked before we actually use them for our patients patient factors have been uh, discussed already by devarun so comorbid conditions as well as any medications should be properly looked for and adequately adequate control of the comorbid conditions as well as stoppage of the indicated drugs should be done infection in the vicinity or in continuation of the eye has to be treated and part preparation has to be adequate for healthcare care workers it is important that we maintain a proper procedure room etiquette hand hygiene should be proper and a proper discipline of hand hygiene should be maintained i will just give an example that hands prepared for a particular procedure should be used for that procedure only and in case of any urgency if we are doing something else with our prepared hands we should re-prepare our hands for the procedure also as again uh, very clearly stated by the barun all SOPs have to be followed strictly now in case with all the precautions also if an infection occurs then what we have to do we have to properly investigate the infection so as to find out the possible source of infection in order to stop the occurrence of further cases from the source and also whatever errors have been identified they should be rectified so that such occurrences do not occur in future so the first and most important thing which we do in such investigations are that we review all the reports of infection prevention and control in the concern period of the environment we review all the reports of air quality and surface disinfection for instruments we check the logs of chemical and biological indicators as well as the reports of cultures for medicines and washes again we check the culture reports and we also note the lot numbers and expiry dates of the package products which were used for patients we see whether any comorbidities were overlooked by mistake we also do some fresh investigations including repeat cultures from the batch which were used for the procedure and disinfectants we check for any contamination and also for effectiveness for from patients we take the vitreous sample so that the pathogen can be identified quickly for starting the targeted therapy for effectiveness of disinfectants i will take a minute to explain that the disinfectants are expected to remove the transient flora uh, from the resident flora from the hands and the skin in a transient manner so that at the time of procedure there is no 
uh, organism which can actually invade into the sterile site. So the samples of the skin from hands or the skin of the patient, they are taken before the treatment and they are cultured. Also, after the treatment of the skin, the samples are taken and the results are compared. For example, if this is what we get before the treatment of the skin and we get a scenario like this after treatment with the disinfectant. This means the disinfectant was effective. If you see a condition like this, this means the disinfectant was not effective in treating the skin and taking care of the resident flora of the patient or the healthcare worker. So whatever errors are identified, they need to be controlled and rectified for future. For example, uh, in one of our investigations, we found that a batch of povidone iodine was not performing in an effective manner. So the whole batch was called off from all, patient, uh, from all areas of the center. And the patients who underwent procedure using those disinfectants, they were also recalled and followed for possible symptoms of infection so that they could be managed in time. In our center, all procedures related infections are notified to the Infection Surveillance and Monitoring Committee and a documentation of the occurrence of infection, all the investigations and follow-up and the control steps is done for help for the future. And this is the flow chart which we are maintaining in all patient care areas. It used to be, it, it, it needs to be followed in case of any post-procedure infection. And these are the forms which need to be filled. Form A, it includes the presenting condition of the patient, the details of the procedure, and all the reviewed investigations, as well as a follow-up form which needs to be filled in daily for the progress of the patient, how uh, the patient is dwelling with the management given, and what are the fresh reports, what are the uh, investigations being done, and the reports of those investigations. At our center, the rate of post-procedure infections is very, com very less, and it is also coming down with the interventions we are doing. So we very uh, optimistically state that active surveillance, prompt reporting and follow-up, and adherence to infection control measures is helpful in bringing down the numbers of post-procedure infections. I thank you all for your patient hearing, and I also thank the members of microbiology team and Infection Surveillance and Monitoring Committee for their good work. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Now in a hospital setting, all the samples should be tested. Here, here. Like uh, iodine and all these, this should be... Uh, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Only if uh, something new is coming no, in. No, no, no. Whenever in a hospital setting, should we test all the things? Not DSS, required, sir. I Not required. We only need to so see... So that we should be able to detect like iodine which we were... Sir, it detect. happened, we uh, tested it after the procedure occurred. Uh, no, yes. should we test before? No, not required, sir. Achha. Another question, conjunctivitis mm. these mm. days. Haan ji, sir. Haan. So, should you inject, should you not inject? Sir, conjunctivitis cases we should not inject because should although the inject. outbreak is viral one, but when in any inflamed... How any long you should wait? Sir, uh, till the resolution of the symptoms. Dr. Parijat, if there is a APROP, huh, Dr. Talwar, Dr. Talwar, huh, Dr. Talwar, Dr. Talwar, huh, bolo. If you, uh, you, put the, you said you put for three minutes. Betadine, yes, Debarun, yeah. Uh, three minutes, once only uh, after opening the conjunctival sac. I think we are repeating it. Uh, we are repeating it, sir. No, what I'm asking is, mm -hmm. what is the total time? Total mm -hmm. exposure time, mm -hmm. and what is the exposure time for the skin? What's the exposure time for the so, uh, I think uh, Debra, because Debra, Debra Devarun, Devarun ha Debra had taken Debra. this, uh. yeah, the procedure. Okay. But I will. T I. Devarun, bolo. Uh. What do you think? The <laughs> reason I'm asking yes, is sir? sometimes what happens is you mm -hmm. put the you put the beta mm -hmm. and first of all three minutes. I'm surprised if you put for three minutes, you've not got epithelial defects, then I'm surprised. Mm. Because even with one minute, if you repeat it a second time, the incidence of epithelial defects is very high. Okay. So this is one issue. Right. The second thing is that if you put betadine, mm -hmm. and now you're washing it, and you find that there is some discharge over there. Now, will you, would you abandon the procedure? 
will you put the beta in again? Mm -hmm. And how do you decide whether to do the procedure or abandon the procedure? So, in my opinion, if there is any discharge, Rohan, I'm yeah. Doctor Rohan. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So, Devarun had already explained the procedure. So, what we are doing is we try to avoid putting it directly on the cornea. You can put it once on the cornea, but like you said, don't put it repeatedly. And even if you put it on the cornea, just wash it with the saline, just a two drops on the cornea, not the rest of the conjunctiva. So at least the betadine stays in the conjunctival sac. Yes, we definitely need to avoid an epithelial defect because next day, that is a very painful thing and the patients complain a lot. And then you always think, is it an infection or something has happened and you need to call the patient back. So if you be careful, don't put too much betadine on the cornea, you can avoid it. Three minutes, we do it. Yes, yes. Yeah, we put it on the sac, one or two drops will Definitely go on the cornea, but just wash it off quickly no, with saline. That exposure is there for three minutes. It's too much. Nee, so we are not putting it directly like on the top of the cornea. Why I'm asking you this? Yes. Because so I modified the procedure. So put the first mic. the first drop when the patient enters the OT. Before he enters the before he lies down on the bed, we put the first drop. So now the eyes closed again. One drop. And one minute later, you put the second drop just before. You start the scrub, you start the cleaning of the, the lid. Mm -hmm. So that ensures that you get another minute. So the second drop comes, again, one drop, which goes into the conjunctival sac, but after that the cleaning is done. Now you put the speculum, you leave for another one minute. That's for the third one. Why? Because with the open speculum, the cornea is drying also. Mm -hmm. So it's more liable to get into this uh, problem. And obviously, as you said, you put enough to just fill the conjunctival sac. You're not putting directly onto the cornea, uh, though you may put a one drop on that. Now, this is one aspect. Still with this, there is a risk that you may get. So this is the minimum, I think, that you need to do. But the problem comes when you wash and you find that there's a mucoid discharge, which is now staining with the betadine. So you can see it's actually staining with the betadine. Now, this comes in two forms. Mm -hmm. One is there's a little bit of collection at the medial canthus, mm -hmm. right? This is probably not such a big issue. But sometimes when you're removing it, you find that there's a whole layer layering the entire inferior phonics. Now what you do? What I do is to repeat okay. the betadine for another 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And the rationale is that the, beta, that the mucoid uh, material actually prevents the action of betadine. So effectively, that area is not getting an effect of betadine. So I give it another 30 seconds. Now we just want to know what, how do others do it. Thank you. Sir, I think what I routinely tell my residents is that when they start cleaning and dripping, they put a single drop or two, open the lid, put there. Yeah. By the time we are done cleaning and draping, I think uh, one, it, one minute has gone by. More than one minute has yeah. gone so by. So now, sir. after if you've given, if you've given the lid, also, well, you're supposed to give three, but even if you've given one and a half, two minutes, then you actually got almost three minutes. Yes. Now, when you put the beta dean on the with the speculum, you need don't need to give three minutes. You need sir, to give just one minute. Yes. Uh, no, so you're not giving it there? We, will, we are huh. giving it there, sir. When you, when you start cleaning draping, I think it takes around two to three minutes. Yeah, for before the speculum. Draping. That's huh. before the speculum. We, when we start cleaning, sir, at that time we just open the lid and put one drop in the yeah. conjunctal sac. And then we finish our cleaning and draping. And by the time we put our spe speculum, it's already two to three minutes. So you don't put the beta in again? I d during surgery, I don't put. No, no, we're not talking about surgery. I'm talking about intravitreal injections. Intravitreal injection, I think uh, most of the injections are done by senior residents. Yes, but I'm asking the procedure because... Because, we sir, I think Devarun explained, he said that we give three washes with betadine, uh, fluid, betadine, fluid, bet uh, saline, betadine, saline, betadine, and again saline, betadine. I think... I didn't uh, understand that. I, add, uh, I didn't understand that. I think uh, Dr. Talwar, sir, yeah, uh, I think we do almost exactly like you, and we d uh, we don't do washing in injection cases like cataracts. Yeah. I think uh, the third installation, the first is done in the uh, pre-op room. Yeah. Second is uh, I think when patient just before lie lies down, down. and uh, a third is we just put a, a drop of betadine at the proposed site of injection. Okay. That's what we do. We don't uh, flush the uh, cul-de-sac with whole betadine. 
and if I find mucus there, I think at the medial canthus, I just take it off and put another uh, round of betadine. Then we do full installation in the cul-de-sac. Otherwise, we just touch the proposed site of injection with, you know, a bud soaked in betadine. Yeah. So this is what I was trying to point out, yeah. that if you see this mucus, you need to repeat the betadine. Yeah. It's not enough to just say ki mene wo nikal diya. The second thing you will notice now, you are an academic institution, you will mm. find this more easily. In in the rainy season, this increases. Increases, the yes. The incidence yes. of this mucus secretion increases. Increases. And it's minimum in the winter season. So it, so that's why it's it's important to keep this in mind that there is a relationship with the seasons also. So according to that, you have to. Thank you. You are right, sir. Seasonal variation is very common. That is, that is why Dr. Talwar, I instruct them when to not to give. Suddenly they will get take it today. Like I had a mind, okay, these days we will decrease the uh, intravitreal because of the, these reasons. Yeah, so okay. I used to do that with Ozodex. Uh, uh, but there was a period when I would not give it in the rainy season because it's a more bigger, um, uh, bigger incision. It's not going to close within the next 24 hours. So I would be a little more careful about using Ozodex in the rainy season. So let us uh, welcome formally Dr. Talwar. He has left us 20 years back and he has come back. He would have been at my position at present. Talia? <laughs> nee, he, he is a very, uh, you know, you can listen, he is the, one of the, you know, intelligent person who has taught us, me and Prati Venkates, he is our guru. So we are happy to be here with Dr. Talwar. He is coming after 20 years. Thank you. Sir, we would also welcome Professor Chityal, sir. Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Over to you, sir. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm audible there? Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes. Yeah, good morning. Uh, indeed, uh, it's, uh, uh, I could listen to all the discussions. Uh, that is what uh, we wanted from uh, this time of workshop. I think uh, on behalf of uh, myself and the entire RPC family, I'd like to welcome all of you for this uh, uh, very interactive workshop on uh, anti vegf which is i think the in thing for a medical practice especially in a ophthalmology where uh, i think everybody should know the basic aspects of uh, anti vegf and people who have come today physically and people who have joined us today online uh, they are all most welcome to put their questions queries so that there can be more discussions i am more than happy to see that so many people have joined especially with the new approach of uh, RP Center workshops. This year onwards, we are invited or RPC alumni uh, faculty who have done so well uh, across the country, across the world also, and they're a pioneer in their field and uh, very happy to have them here today with us, especially Dr. Dinesh Talwar, Dr. Sarita Barry, Dr. Dipender, Dr. Ruchir, Dr. Sumit, Dr. Amber, Dr. Uh, Nawajis, they have all come uh, for today's workshop. I'm uh, from my heart. I like to thank them for accepting our invitation, as well as the faculty uh, of uh, RP Center Retina Group, headed by Dr. Rajpal, Dr. Pradeep Bankites, Dr. Parija Chandra, Dr. Binod, Dr. Rohan, Dr. Soria, and the new people like uh, uh, Dr. Saurabh and Dr. Deves. They've done wonderful work to organize this workshop. And we're happy to see that our uh, ocular pharmacology, Dr. Vail Pandian and Dr. N uh, uh, from Microbiology, we have Dr. Nishad. They have been a part of this workshop. So this makes a very comprehensive uh, approach to a, a looks like a very simple way to discuss anti which has so many other gamuts to look into indication, contraindication, how to do it, when not to do it, and uh, uh, case discussion. And happy to see Dr. Dinesh there will definitely make uh, this is very, very interactive and people will enjoy the discussions. Again, uh, I hope that uh, people who are joined gain a lot of things from this workshop. And I'm pretty sure we are going to change the entire concepts of future workshops also to make them a particular specific uh, content to be discussed rather than an entire gamut of uh, one particular area. Thank you again. Uh, uh, sorry, I could not be there physically uh, because of some uh, commitment uh, there. 
and hope that uh, I'll see you very soon uh, physically and uh, interact with, with you all. Wish you all the best and have a very nice discussion. Thank you again uh, for organizing this work, the Retina team, and all the all our SRs and JRs being there. Thank you and welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. So just to conclude Dr. Nishat's uh, uh, talk, Dr. Nishat, thank you very much for your insights into microbiological aspects of it. So I've been given task of uh, talking about biosimilar drugs. And uh, you know that uh, biosimilars are the ones uh, which are the top of the town nowadays. We've been using for quite some time now. And uh, I'll be throwing some light on the subject. So uh, biologicals, as we say them, or biologics like uh, ranibizumab and bevacizumab, uh, biologicals basically are any medical medicinal product which contain biologic biotechnology-driven proteins as active substances. Now uh, you will realize that if you see through the whole of the world's prescriptions, biologicals contain only two percent of the total prescriptions but 37 percent of the total drug spending all over the world is contributed by the biologicals so they're very very expensive drugs though their development may not differ much from the small molecules which we commonly used in our day-to-day -day practice now biotechnological products which are comparable to the reference product reference product is the one which is the original molecule for example ranibizumab by uh, the original company is the, the termed as reference product or the uh, parent molecule. Uh, biological uh, similars are basically products which are non-inferior to the reference product in quality, non-clinical and clinical evaluation. They demonstrate similar pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, safety and also the efficacy is very, very similar to the innovator biological and there is no clinically meaningful difference in terms of safety and efficacy so what they actually are they are not the same molecule but only a minor alteration in the structure whereby a amino acid or two are changed and they work very similar to the innovator molecule typically biosimilars require less time and less resources than biologicals to develop uh, if you see in terms of timeline it takes roughly two-thirds the time of that innovator molecules while the cost is further reduced. Why this cost is reduced in the development biosimilar is because all biosimilar companies need to do is that they need to conduct preclinical studies where sh they show that they are very, very similar to the innovator molecule. But when it comes to clinical trials, most of the uh, uh, most of the uh, authorities all over the world allow smaller studies with fewer participants and shorter follow-up where all the companies have to show is that their molecule is non-inferior to the innovator biological. So that way huge investment is not needed in the clinical trials and that is the reason why biosimilars are cheaper. Another important aspect of biosimilar is that once they show that they are non-inferior to the innovator in one particular uh, 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 condition, then it automatically, automatically they are granted uh, permissions to be used in other indications. For example, if you have seen most of the biosimilars, they have conducted trials in AMD. And once they have shown their similarity to the innovator molecule, they are approved automatically in other indications as well. So just to give you a, a rough uh, uh, scenario how a biosimilar is developed, initially ident we identify the structure, physiochemical properties, biological and functional properties. Then analytical similarity is done. First it is, it is confirmed in non-clinical scenarios and subsequently it is done in clinical scenarios. Now how come bio, uh, biosimilars came into picture? Now most of the is biologicals which we have Several of them, their patents expired in 2015. So the first biosimilars which were approved uh, in US were in 2015. Now interestingly, the same uh, kind of molecules, that is biosimilars, were approved in, by European Union way back in 2016. And that is when the European Medical Agency first laid down the guidelines for the development of biosimilars and their approval. Now it is further of interest that 
first DGCI approved biosimilar was uh, came out in year 2000 and interestingly uh, again at that time there was no guidelines we just happened to approve this drug which did wonderfully well and DGCI subsequently in 2015 approved several of the uh, biosimilars one of which was uh, ranibizumab similar that is razumab produced by Intas pharmaceuticals now uh, biosimilars in ophthalmology are predominantly to the anti-VEGF drugs and that's why we are talking about them right now uh, so main anti-VEGF drugs uh, uh, towards which we have biosimilars are ranibizumab uh, whose patent expired in USA in 2020 and in Europe in 2022 and similarly bevacizumab, bevacizumab and aflibercept uh, uh, patents are coming to uh, an end and that is when we are going to have aflibercept biosimilars as well one drug which is again to, of interest to uveitis specialist is adalimumab and we know that again biosimilars are available in the market and again of the interest <coughs> ranzumab <coughs> by Intas Pharma was the first ranibizumab biosimilar which was ever approved in the world subsequently further have been approved a phase 3 dial trial was done for ranibizumab and uh, it got approval for AMD and subsequent studies got its approval for uh, further indications there were some immuno reports of immunogenicity in way back in 2015-16 uh, the supplies were cut from the ranibizumab uh, and they did some modification and productions restarted uh, probably a few months later and again uh, since then we have had no issues with the use currently there are several uh, ranibizumab biosimilars they have been approved in various parts of world including Europe and USA and there are several others which are in the trials and will be likely approved uh, very soon Efli bio, biosimilar again most of these trials are in phase 3 stage uh, some of them have completed but as of now uh, none of them have got approval but very soon I think they will be coming to market and then we'll have cheaper alternative to Efli as well biosimilar to bevacizumab again are already available in Indian market and abroad and I think several of us are, are already using that so similar is the condition with Humula now coming to our experience uh, we have experience with intas ranibizumab and uh, we have had around 1500 injections over last 18 months and in our experience it works, works almost same as uh, the innovator molecule and in our scenario the cost is roughly around two third of that that of innovator molecule in fact we uh, are cu currently conducting one phase three trial on the same drug for its approval in european market and again uh, the results have been very very similar to ranibizumab unfortunately we haven't had experience with other biologic uh, similar biosimilars of ranibizumab uh, so to conclude biosimilars are a significant change in the existing landscape of uh, uh, anti vegf drugs and what i think they offer the most is that they reduce the cost of the anti vegf therapy and make affordable uh, make it affordable for the masses but the problem is that anti vegf market is fast becoming crowded and it is very very difficult to choose which one to take and which one to drop but overall it is likely to benefit beneficial for both industry as well as patient and biggest uh, beneficiary being patient because the cost of the drug and the treatment comes down and all the people who are not aff able to afford innovator molecules are affo able to afford the therapy as well and this particularly hold uh, true for the country like ours where people can't afford and the institute like ours where most of the pay poor patients end up turning. Uh, thank you thank you very much for your kind attention and yeah, uh, Dr. Pandian there's a question for you is, is it possible for us to evolve a molecule now that's out of patent can you work on something I think it'd be nice if you could Yes, you're right, absolutely. I think we promoted one of such biosimilar in the experimental studies. Now this guy is doing that uh, the st clinical studies in Korea because he was unable to do it in India sometime. So he took the molecule to Korea, even he approached us also for phase one. Since uh, you know we don't have uh, such a type of infrastructure to phase one is little bit troublesome in India, so he took it to Korea to do that. I think uh, we should now 
start giving such a type of interface also to give phase one uh, compliance. So that would help us you know, to develop this kind of molecule homegrown ones yeah, into, so into clinic. Accept. I think Aflibo said next year, I think he just said that it's going out of patent. I think it's a good yes, thing yes, yes. that you can take. Yes, yes, now. yes. Yeah. And the most important one is that um, the formulation factors, you know, somebody makes it uh, which is suitable for I, there comes a little bit of trouble. So that is where uh, even the Indian uh, biosimilar of Brandivizumab had a problem which caused inflammation and things like that. So that is something that that technique may not be prevalent with all others. So a word of caution is always important, you know, when you just try to make such a type of thing to clinicals. Sure. What is the problem that uh, occurs uh, which you're talking about in biosimilars in the preparation that makes it that makes it not so straightforward like a chemical preparation? Sir, uh, can I answer this question? Yes, yeah, sir. Actually, what happens is being a, if it is a small molecule. Like, uh, like uh, you know, it could be like an antibiotic or uh, in those cases we have no much of problem directly the analytical techniques can explore it. Here the thing is very complicated because first of all it's protein is nature and uh, now the, it is having a binding sites for the particular antigen for which it goes and binds. Now analysis when it comes out to be it's all the more problem. For example even if the drug is there in the any antibody related technique when detected but that's not exactly going to function in the way it's supposed to be. So the analytical techniques like the way how it has been evolved for all others cannot be applicable for this. For example, I kept this about two years. Sometime, you know, a power went off in the refrigerator for three, four days. What went wrong? Can it work again? No guarantee can be given. No, what I this. want to know is how, what is it that the innovator has hmm that you would not have access to. Yes, 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 yes. This is a very important one. Basically that biologicals, preservation of biological is having, a, as we understand, a primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary structures of a protein are very important. When we stabilize it for its stability. Therefore, innovator always puts enough efforts to stabilize the structure while on shelf storage when we are keeping it in the refrigerator. That determines two years it will be, of, uh, it will be having expiry date. That technique is something that the biosimilars need to, need to come up with to match the innovator standard. The same thing happened in latinoprost too. The latinoprost originally it was purged back in the so, uh, inert atmosphere where Indian companies failed. As a result, we started seeing that you know the, uh, the overages are being added. Sometimes it's getting completely deteriorated. So this is a technique that some companies are having that kind of thing, not out of everybody. The reason I'm asking you is because they actually uh, later on said that it's not because of, it was not because of changes uh, needed for stabilization with the uh, excipients, but the endotoxin level. So w I actually have a doubt that it was the endotoxin level which was the cause. I actually think the problem was with the excipients only. It's possible, sir. It's a, they so really don't you, know about so, it. So I was just wondering whether it's possible, you, sir. Um, when you said that it's not, a, uh, it's something specific to the uh, huh. stability. Are you talking about some excipient which was changed, sir? What happened is, moment when you bring out any biosimilar from any bacteria-derived culture, first thing the, what the company will do is endotoxin levels. Without that, it cannot go to the next stage at all. That is the first of the prerequisite for the API active pharmaceutical ingredient. And when you say this because of this I had a problem at the later stage, I won't believe it. If so, their manufacturing itself is wrong. Yeah. So that's what uh, exactly. I, 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 I uh, think they've been trying to sell it. Thank saying you. We will discuss uh, with Dr. Exactly, Vaipan and what are the difficulty you are facing and we will thank sir, you. Dr. I just Vinod. make ha. one point I forgot to include in my presentation. Uh, that uh, if you see innovator uh, Bevasuzumab, it comes with inlet that uh, it is not recommended for ophthalmic use. So it is always a challenge to use uh, bevacizumab clinically. But uh, I think several of the biosimilars, what they are trying to do is they are trying to make uh, bevacizumab for ophthalmic use. And I think there are already studies underway in US market at least. Phase two, phase three trials are on for ophthalmic bevacizumab. And I think few companies in India have also applied for phase one studies where we'll, they'll be uh, testing the safety of uh, the ophthalmic bevacizumab in uh, clinical eyes and subsequently if those studies do well we there might be a time i think another two three years where we might have 
बायोसिमिलर ऑफ बेवासुजमाब अवेलेबल फॉर ऑफ्थालमिक यूज एक्चुअली इट्स ओनली इन द इंडियन वर्जन ऑफ बेवासुजमाब दैट दिस इज रिटन दैट इज नॉट फॉर आई यूज इट्स नॉट रिटन इन द यूरोपियन एंड द अमेरिकन वर्जन सो फॉर देम दैट्स व्हाइ कंपाउंडिंग फार्मेसीज वर्क for us they can't work like that okay. but if the innovators uh, i mean if the biosimilar bio uh, bevacizumab does not write this particular line we can use it for off label use so this is all that needs to be removed thank you dr vinod now i invite next panel professor sarita berry thank you dr deepinder and professor parijat chandra to be on a dash Again, uh, Professor Sarita Veri is from RP Center, and uh, we we welcome her. Talia, to ni chahiye bhai. Itne sust aadmi ho hamare. At least, ha. Aaj bol rahi hai na. She is the head of department, Lady Harding Medical College, and she is be examiner and will be examiner in future. <laughs> तो फर्स्ट टॉक इज योर सो आई थिंक हाँ सो फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी फॉर दिस टॉक टू द होल ऑफ द रेटना यूनिट ऑफ आर पी सेंटर एंड डॉक्टर शौर्या एज वेल हु कॉल मी आप टेलीफोनिकली एंड इंश्योर दैट आई वॉज हेयर so today i'll be talking on anti vegf clinical usage retinal vein occlusions my talk will cover pathophysiology evolution of the treatment in rvos management protocols and some case scenarios uh, this is a small animation saying about the pathophysiology of rvos the where the vein gets occluded the proximal vein gets dilated and tortuous the capillaries get engorged the capillaries get engorged and the stasis takes place there is bursting of the capillary network causing hemorrhage there will be edema because of the back pressure and because of the stasis there will be hypoxia leading to leading to release of vegf which increases the permeability hence again increasing the edema and exudates this is the all the story of anti vegfs and how it acts and will be going through this presentation so the vegf is released by the hypoxic retina has already been said in the previous talks and this causes the blood brain uh, blood retinal barrier break up and the macular edema so in the beginning i would like to say that because of this macular edema there is cystic spaces in the interretinal fluid which is disruptive to the retinal architecture and gives uh, the anatomy as well as the physiology of the vision is disturbed so early treatment in which this macular edema can be can be removed and a normal anatomy and physiology this is the basis for treatment of retinal venous occlusions macular edema which is the most common cause of diminution of vision in rvos retinal vein occlusions so there is a variation in intraocular vascular endothelial growth factors uh, when it is released because of the vascular occlusions which could be a different in the extent of severity and also the mechanism available to compensate this vascular blockage and the variable rates of drug clearance which we'll be discussing in the treatment in 1995 the bivos it uh, the bivos uh, bivos was the first one to say that ffa or uh, that ffa to be done at 3 to 6 months 3 to 6 months it was a observation period and only after 3 to 6 months it said that grid laser can be done to to uh, to stabilize the vision but not to improve it and prp for neovascularization the score study said that in uh, trams in alon 1 mg was of a similar efficacy to grid laser but these steroid intravitreal steroids had associated adverse effects like cataract and steroid induced glaucoma the sustained release dexamethasone implant which we all know as azurdex also had Uh, these side effects though it had significantly increased gain in vision so now from stabilizing the vision we had come to increasing the vision for brvos then came the famous screws horizon and retain trial which actually was a benchmark and put the stage for anti vegf to be the first choice of treatment for retinal venous occlusions it was a long trial long follow up and it proved successfully that anti vegfs was the choice 
for RBOs. That was for Renibizumab. Renibizumab became the first choice. Uh, in this, I may also say that Bevacizumab also parallelly continued as an offline drug anti-VEGF. Vibrant study proved that if Libacept was also equally good uh, for for uh, RBOs, uh, instead of it compared it with the laser. But there's no head-to-head -head, uh, study for ILEA, that is Iflibacept and Ranibizumab. So now both of them are considered equally for the treatment of RV, RVOs. Brolocizumab was discontinued for RVOs because of the vasculitis, which was noted after the fourth injection, but still people are giving it off-label because it has been FDA approved for other, other diabetic and uh, macular edema as well as ARMD. But for, it has not still been proven for RVOs. There are still trials going on with Fasizumab and it will soon be available by Genetic and Roche in India will be marketing it by the name of Webismo. So once these trial results are out, we will have another anti-VEGF uh, for RVOs. So once the uh, anti-VEGFs are given, so we have patients who are responders who will come back to their normal anatomy within three monthly doses of the anti-VEGF. This normal uh, CMT done by OCT compared to the other eye, which is normal or around 250 microns. And if there's only 10%, if it is more than 10% or more reduction from the baseline, they're called partial resp responders. And if it is less than 10%, it becomes non-responders. So patients who are partial or non-responders to anti fare worse uh, after six months or 12 months, uh, and they need more frequent injections as well. So this was conjectured that if a higher dose, 2 milligram dose is given, which could significantly improve. The related study said that it does decrease the central foveal thickness, but does not increase the visual acuity. This was uh, on the basis that higher levels of anti vegfs could be uh, tackled by a higher dose of anti vegf This is still going on and not proven by any of the studies. This is an um, analogy in which how macular edema occurs in RBOs. Uh, the VEGFs, they open the tap and the macular edema, the edema comes in, the sets in, so disturbing the anatomy and physiology. So the anti-VEGF will close this tap and the edema will then get uh, absorbed and the normal anatomy is maintained. So the whole management dis uh, is centered around this and also as the block take place, the collaterals will open up and another outflow method will open up which we conjecture that after six months to 24 months, an alternate pathway will develop and during that time, the anatomy should be maintained by giving anti-VEGFs. The show study said that after achieving a dry macula by OCT, a stable vision, a PRN or a monthly dosing achieved similar results. So this is the most accepted and recommended method of frequency of injecting. Get the dry, a dry macula and then inject PRN. There were a few researchers who have published that early intervention with laser therapy after giving uh, any anti-VEGF could also show an improvement in visual acuity and anatomy. But other related study, he said that no long-term benefits were seen with this type of uh, uh, addition of laser over the anti-VEGFs. Signer and Maturi, they said that combination therapy of steroids along with anti-VEGFs would give excellent results. So this still is not very much proven. So getting with all these studies and trials, our management of CRVO, BRVO, as the patient comes to start early with monthly loading doses of VEGF, we give Razumab because this is freely available. By the government, it's given free for our poor patients. Then visual acuity is checked, IOP and OCT is monthly done for three, uh, for three months. And if it's a complete responder or a partial responder. In a partial responder, we add an anti -VEG. Either we change the anti -VEG which the patient will now have to buy, or we add IVTA or a posterior subtenant steroid. And we usually get a very good result. And for these patients who are dry now, we reassess with OCTA or FFA for CNP areas. And we do not keep following them up for development of new vascularization. We laser them because we are not sure whether these patients are going to keep following us for again and again. So a few case scenarios, a 45-year-old male with supratemporal BRVO presenting with 660 vision, IOP24 started on anti-glaucoma drugs. And on first, uh, the OCT were picture was like this. On the second injection became better, 618 vision, IOP controlled. And on the third, it was totally dry. We did a FFA and we showed 
uh, perivascular leakage and lot of CNP areas which was confirmed by OCTA and we lasered this patient and the patient is still on a long follow up two years now 6-9 vision. Another case where uh, giving three injections uh, the patient did not uh, did not respond so we added tramsinolone you can see the tramsinolone in the vitreous and can also be picked up on the OCT and this patient in a few days of giving the injection came back to near normal. Another patient with similar story with IVTA so we have had very good results with IVTA IVR combination. So the complications uh, uh, could be intravitreal injection related, uh, mild pain, floaters, subconjunctal infection, endophthalmitis, ret ret metagenous, ret uh, retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage or ocular uh, complications related to anti like hemorrhagic macular infarction, retinal artery ischemia, tractional retinal detachment especially in where new vascularization has set in, systemic complications like thromboembolic phenomena, myocardial infarction, cerebral, cerebrovascular accidents. So contraindications are a recent history of MI. CVAs or thromboembolic phenomena. And to summarize, anti VEGF drugs have revolutionized the management of blinding condition when we can now improve the vision to near normal. And uh, irinibizumab and ifilibacept used early are effective treatments. Monthly dosing of three injections uh, or till the response and then PRN is a preferred choice of frequency of treatment. All anti VEGF injections can suppress the neovascularization of RVOs which may happen later. So they need to be followed up for perfusion later. They may come with neovascularization and they need to be studied before they are told they are all right now. Take home message, management gu uh, guidelines simple to remember ATP, visual acuity, CMT and CNP. So if this is your guide, you will definitely succeed. Initial initiation of therapy is essential for maximizing and maintaining gains of visual acuity. Anti VEGFs are the mainstay of treatment for partial or no responders. Add intravital steroids or change the class of anti VEGFs. Do not forget to rule out neovascularization in the long follow up. More RCTs are required for early switching of agents to non responders rather than waiting for three monthly doses. Combination therapy of anti VEGFs with steroids, combination therapy of anti VEGFs plus sectoral laser or, or scatter laser. Perfusion status after response to anti vagus status. Thank you so much for your patient listening. And I acknowledge Dr. Rahul, who is my senior resident, who has helped me in these slides, and Dr. Nitika, who helped me in making the last minute changes. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Berry, for this excellent presentation and uh, presenting different scenarios how anti vagus and combo with uh, laser and with uh, uh, steroids work very well. Uh, Dr. Pradeep, any comments you would like to make on uh, this? Yeah, thanks, ma'am, for sharing all these longitudinal follow up with your uh, cases. A few things I'd like to highlight when we talk about uh, branch retinal vein occlusion. Some things of concern is their inclusion criteria starts off with saying that the age at inclusion is more than 18 years. While most of us know that most BRVOs or uh, vein occlusions are much later, that's one thing that I really fail to understand. And unlike the uh, study that we had with laser, what this study did was they treated almost 65%, I, I'm, I'll probably talk about it during my presentation, to 65% of the patients they included were within the first three months. While the B BBOS study had patients included after the first three months, so there's no head-to-head -head comparison there. And in their own write-up, they say that while they were waiting from day zero to the time of injection, there was a percentage of cases that in improved spontaneously by more than 10 letters. They don't give you what percentage. So for me, the worry is when you give a conclusion that you treat early, definition of early is not clear. Now the present situation is the moment you see BRVO, everybody and particularly it goes down to the young youngsters that's what worries me the most nobody wants to wait and they go ahead with the injection and many of them they don't give you a sub classification of what types of brvo we they had in their study and very clearly you know that there is a component of tributary vein occlusion and if you see the natural history of tributary vein occlusion almost 90 percent resolved spontaneously with six nine visual recovery so that's not mentioned at all so that's why I don't think we should blindly implement these uh, studies and less than 6 by 60 vision they had less than 10 patients in each of the groups that they had so whether you can use those less than 10 patients and then say that patients are coming to you with less than 6 by 60 can you transpose these results to those it's again questionable so I do not want to push for overuse of anti VEGFs. I think there needs to be a time given to see what is happening during the natural process of resolution and typically, I do not give injections immediately. 
I give them a period of four week follow-ups. If it is going down in the natural process, I defer the injection again. Only if it goes up during my wait period, only then I would consider an injection. So for me, it's no injection at the first presentation. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. That is our opinion. Dr. Talwar will also uh, would like to agree I, with I, us. I'd also like to just uh, put in a point uh, here, Dr. Uh, Venkatesh. It's a very well said that um, maybe we like to wait. But here, in case the vision is less than 6, 6, six less than 612, and the CMT is showing a large edema, more than 350, we like to inject early. Like, usually our patients do not come immediately as the VRV or CRV has occurred. They have already a history of two weeks, three weeks of diminution of vision. So that is the time we should not we should not delay after checking the blood pressure, KFT, and a few CBC and uh, sugars. That will take another three, four days. We like to inject. Otherwise, the patient will just go away, follow up late. So that is why the little uh, urgency of treating early. Okay. Dr. Talwar. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, though. Why is it that the VRVO study waited three months? Because in the natural course of events, and there's a natural history study in the BRVO study, you will see that more than 30, 40% 30 percent of patients will actually become okay in three months. I think the figure was closer to 50%. But anyway, there's a large number of patients who will resolve on their own. So therefore, it doesn't make sense to treat right when they come. The second thing, are you curing the disease? No. You are not curing the disease. The disease is getting cured by recanalization of the vein, which happens on its own. What you are doing is causing a temporary improvement in the macular edema. And when do you need to give injections all the time? When it doesn't recanalize. So it's only those patients who don't recanalize where chronic treatment is needed. So in fact, when you say, uh, you know, most of my patients go away with one injection, what you are really saying is it wasn't needed effectively. So I agree with yes, you. Yes, I agree. When we were not having any anti right. previously, so, so our the, so patient used to be improved. Yeah. So the first thing is, uh, I agree with Pradeep um, completely. If a patient comes to me within the first month, and if the vision is better than 612, I don't treat. I will follow up on a weekly basis and tell him, if you deteriorate, I will treat you. But these days, patients so, are worried. Eh, they will not go to you. They will go to next. That is why I they are ready. No, no. I am telling you that is the situation now these days <laughs> yes. because so many people are there, yes. and we have seen. If I have said no, somebody else will see yes. Which so is fine. Uh, fine, but 40 to 45 percent. Dr. Talwar is right. We have seen practically all these things. What is the uh, laser? Ka jab In karte fact, the thi? study from uh, there's a study from uh, Mulana Zad, uh. which actually showed and is by Darius Shroff, uh. which showed 80% resolved on their own uh. without treatment. I, right. But I'm saying maybe, okay, let's say that's a little on the higher side, but I'd still say 50% of the patients would resolve. But the second aspect which Sarita said, if the patient's vision is less than 612 and the edema is significant, then I say, okay, let's go ahead, because that's the time when the patient gets really worried. So, and there you are bringing down the, uh, the chance of this. Yes, uh, this that is the time. So that's the, Treat early. the second thing. They don't need a loading dose. Most of the patients you will find will go away with one injection. A few will be there which will have partial response. You have to give a second injection. If they resolve, I will not normally uh, give a loading dose. I will not give a second injection. That's true. We have also will, seen that patients will, resolve quite early. Okay. O only if, but if I see the recurrence coming again and again, like this first month they didn't need, second month again they need it. If that's happening two, three times, that's the time to do a fluorescein angiography to see whether the capillary non-perfusion is very severe. And if that is so, that's the, pay, that's the, that's the time I would consider doing the laser. So, so, angiography at honey, three uh, months. Good. Uh, the topic the is to anti VEGF. So, we, yeah, we, we that is why the CS talked about anti VEGF. See you comparison in many of these studies is sham, not laser, because the laser also works. And that laser is not quadrantic laser. That laser is a modified grid laser. Unfortunately, no studies are being done to ensure, to check what is the relationship between the two. So, the last treatment, if you've got a very chronic edema, you could consider doing a, a modified grid too. That that helps in many of the patients. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So now I'd like to invite uh, Professor Rajpal to talk about diabetic retinopathy. Sir, please. Sir has extensive experience in treating diabetic retinopathy. 
and he's head of veterinary services at RP Center. I am thank you to Chief RP Center who has given me opportunity to give this talk, and I am happy that many of our colleagues are here. So I will be talking about the clinical use of anti vasopp in diabetic retinopathy. And uh, these days, <coughs> anti vasopp is one of the modality of treatment uh, in diabetic retinopathy. But outset, I would like to say it is not the anti vasopp we, we, we are not ignoring the uh, steroid and laser also. So this has already been talked about the mechanism of uh, upregulation of vasopp. And the major objective aims is to reduce macroedema, like one of the cause of decreased vision is diabetic macroedema. And it reduces neovascularization. And this is the uh, uh, modality which improves the vision and also reduces the diabetic severity score. In current management, we have to know when to initiate treatment, which anti to use, and uh, what are the various treatment protocol conditions that may alter response considering biomarkers, systemic and ocular, and when to stop, and role of combination therapy, and visual and atmial results of various RCTs. So these are the conditions where anti vasopp is being used these days. PDR with DME, PDR with no DME, we are not using, but certain studies are. Coexisting cataract, neovascular glaucoma, post-operative DME, role of pre-operative anti -vasopp and the edema after vitrectomy, DME persisting after vitrectomy. These are the various anti which has been already described. And various therapeutic options are observations, laser, anti and intravitreal steroids. So systemic control is very important, which has been uh, uh, documented by various studies. We must control the systemic factors in these cases. And we must do certain uh, test in like ocular imaging, fundus photography, OCT, angiography. and these days before starting a therapy, there is a role of OC, uh, various biomarkers like uh, ISO junctions and macular thickness, depending how much the macular thickness, presence of NST and the hyperreflected uh, and the outer retinal tubulation and most important drill that is disorganized retinal inner layer and the whether there is the presence of VMT or not. Before starting all these biomarkers should be tested, uh, should be done on the OCT. Like this is a VMT case where there is a traction and cystoid here we might do the surgery before uh, uh, not an anti is the treatment in these cases. So other biomarker, corridor thickness, and OCTA is coming in a big way. So fluorescent geography, what we will know? We will know whether it's a focal leak or not, because a lot of study doesn't talk about the focal leak. Here is the Dr. Talwar. We will discuss later on. If there is a focal leak is there, focal treatment, focal laser, we used to do. Now these days, very less laser is being done. And if the, if the edema is because of the leakage, uh, away from the 715 micron, then in certain cases we can do the focal laser and edema can be absorbed. But in some study you can give anti vegf and if there is a focal uh, edema persist, then you can do the focal laser. So laser is not out, but uh, majority of the people are giving uh, <coughs> anti vegf OCT is one of the, now this is a uh, uh, one of the case where we have given the anti vegf and there is a uh, decrease in the CMT as you can see. 
and as you know biomarker also decide whether to be give the which anti vegf to be given whether we should give directly the steroid or the anti vegf because of the there is only the thickness is there macular thickness is there if there is not cystoid spaces and no other uh, things that will show us the the results are better with the steroid as compared to anti vegf so this is a flow diagram if vision is greater than 6 by 9 and near vision is greater than n8 let me tell you dr talwar is the only one who has propagated the near vision none of the study has said so i have taken this slide from the dr talwar and we also agree with these things if the vision is great this thing vision is greater than 69 and near vision is greater than n8 and conservative management is very important if vision is less than 6 by 9 and the near vision is less than n8 then anti vegf should be given so here he has taken we are taking near vision as a one of the criteria which none of the study has taken and if the vision is less than 6 by 9 we must treat with the anti vegf let me tell you systemic control is very important before starting all these study and if the one of the study says if the vision is less than 624 the ilia should be given but at two year the results are same so this is a flow diagram before starting any treatment systemic comorbid conditions should be taken into consideration if there is a systemic condition like history of mi or cvs or cvd or neurological then we must not give anti vegf because uh, in the many of the studies this has seen the complication of systemic involvement so this is one if the patient distance with this i have already discussed so what are the various options some people give topical steroid uh, topical nifepenic but control of systemic factor is very important now this is another thing i have already discussed observation in such cases whether vision is good we don't give we observe and all the the protocol we has already set and we also emphasize the near vision should be taken into consideration as far as the as uh, in addition to distant vision so this is one thing uh, oct center involved non center involved center involving dma is a primary treatment with anti vegf so these are the certain terminology you should know whether after giving anti vegf whether the the patient is improving and improvement criteria are oct central subfield thickness decreased by greater than 10% or visual acuity letter score increased by 5% 5 uh, letter this is 5 letter and worsening is already oct subfield greater than 10 field and visual acuity letter score decreased by greater than 5 and stability so another thing is what regime we should follow this is important we will discuss later on but these are the in fixed dose regime there is a advance simple minimum monitoring but this advantage is risk of over treatment in convenient pronata advance individual treatment lesser intervention disorder under treatment variable outcome and treat and extend advantage is individual treatment disorder risk of over treatment and limited long term evidence from last trial so we are using pronata <coughs> let me tell you our of patients are not having good visual equity but if patient comes with less than 6 12 then we give monthly injection that's the various study said we should give 3 month 3 uh, injection every month and then do the depending on the thickness and the visual equity we should treat the patient so give monthly injection till normalization of the foveal contour that's the thickness greater than 300 micron and the visual equity greater than 612 fixed regime is better than the treat and extent but systemic side effects found to be more therefore majority of people we also do pronata monotherapy versus combination certain situations where do uh, the laser is required what do we expect this is a restores results more than 25 patient did not need any injection at months 3 and four in restored those who did not need injection at three or four month had a better response to treatment and mean injection is 4.3 in a year let me tell you diabetic macular edema is a finite disease 
it is not like ARMD, which I got from the Dr. Dinesh Salwar. In fact, I have reviewed all the study where I have seen majority of the time injection in the first year is 8 to 10. And if you do laser, that goes down to 7. And second year, around 5 to 7. And in the third year, 3 to 4. So after 3 years, disease, uh, you need not inject. Another thing with the injections is you must know that there should not be any traction because crunch phenomena is there. We miss some time. We only see the OCT macular thickness. We don't see the peripheral area. And our patients are having a poor compliance. They may not come regularly. So compliance is very important in these cases. So in refractory DME, rule out extenuating circumstances like uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled diabetes, and nephropathy. Look for peripheral ischemia. Rule out inadequate treatment and review the fundus of OCT. Persistent recurrence DM, 30 to 40 per DME patient are refractive to anti -vagif. Now what to do? Now we have a, uh, many anti treatments, switch to another anti <coughs> but we are giving steroids. So newer anti, uh, newer anti are coming, we can try those, but uh, second line of treatment is steroid these days, intravitreal steroid. And combination therapy has been tried in various studies. So this is one study protocol as where in, P, uh, in PDR cases, PRP is still the treatment of choice. I'm not saying ki you should not do the PRP. This is one study where they have compared the with the anti -VEGF. So it is non-inferior, lesser peripheral visual field sensitivity loss, fewer vitrexamine, lower incident or DME with renegia, PRP rarely given failure, although there are five years so no increased benefits. So once there is a PDR with macular edema, then you can give the anti -vagif. But PDR without macular edema, we don't treatment. So this is an invasive procedure, endophthalmitis, risk of endophthalmitis, other complications are there, and require multiple injection and multiple follow-up, more economic burdens. Neovascular glaucoma is another condition, vitreous hemorrhage. And we are giving pre-operative anti -vagif, 3 to 7 days. Some people give 6 to 14 days. Improve post-operative best corrective visual activity. Decrease the incident recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. And significant reduce duration of surgery. And reduce intraoperative bleeding. This is the one thing, uh, one of the important things which has uh, anti vegf has given. And lately, the various study, Panorama or protocol, we are using in severe NPDR. And we don't recommend these things. One of the things they say is the decrease in the diabetic severity score, you know, the, the reversal of the diabetic retinopathy, which has to be discussed, which has to be documented with various further cl clinical trial. So in real world scenario, <coughs> DCRNet has reversed diabetic <laughs> management. We take a look at the lesson learned from the distant net. But uh, we have to manage our own logarithm. Patients are from a different socioeconomic status and our patients are come late. So we have to plan according to them. The compliance not good. So in case of PDR or the vitreous hemorrhage, some people give, but we must be uh, careful before giving anti so that they should be able to come. One condition which is left is cataract with macloedema. So everybody know you should treat the macloedema first uh, or you can give at the table or post-operative. But most important is some people give pre-operative or if the media is clear, you treat the macloedema DME first and then do the FACO or if the media is not clear, at the same time you can give anti vegf or OG drugs. I have not discussed the various study because of the shortage of time. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Rajpal for uh, bringing together all the various uh, things which we have in diabetic retinopathy. It's a huge topic and you've covered in 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions for Dr. Rajpal? Now Dr. Talwar, focal laser. Focal laser, you, are, you must Hello. emphasize the uh, many study doesn't, you say in restore. In restore mic the way. Uh, question, excuse uh, me, sir. Uh, uh, so lots of cataract surgeons and general ophthalmologists are giving are also giving anti vegf injections. My question is, if someone doesn't have an OCT, can we start anti vegf injections just on the basis of clinical fundus examination and visual equity checkup? Doctor Talwar, mic the way. 
डॉक्टर प्रदीप बताओ तो आई वुड एडवाइज अगेंस्ट डूइंग दैट ओके बट आई थिंक यू नीड टू लाइसन विद अदर्स एंड एट लीस्ट हैव अ बेसलाइन ओ सी टी स्कैन ओके बिकॉज देर अदर एस्पेक्ट्स टू केयर नाउ एंड आई थिंक आई वुड नॉट एडवाइज एन इंजेक्शन विदाउट यू नीड सम क्वान्टिटेटिव मेजर एंड अल्टीमेटली विजुअल एक्टिविटी मे नॉट बी द ओनली मेजर so you'll have to see what the initial response to your injections is and i think oct is probably the most sensitive method so you can't rely on your fundus by microscopy uh, your visual acuity is an indirect indicator yes but i don't know if legally it would be considered all right presently to inject without having a baseline uh, oct i'll give you an anecdote for the person who asked this question my bhabhi received an anti vegf avastin with cataract surgery without any macular edema she died of an mi the next day i'm just telling you that you never know when what you're doing unnecessarily can cause a problem and that's something that's going to be on your head all the time so if you know there is macular edema yes you can say man clinically or i'm not saying you have to diagnose the macular edema only on oct okay you do a slit lamp biomicroscopy if you can see significant macular edema and the vision is is down and that vision loss is disproportionate to the amount of cataract then you have an indication but if that is so i would say first give anti vegf to decrease the macular edema and then go ahead and do your cataract surgery No, no. Without, without doing. Uh, I'm saying, I'm, no. I'm saying you've not done an OCT, but you're seeing significant macular edema. Then you treat the macular edema. I can tell you the another anecdote where I had patients who had a cataract and who had macular edema. I said, we'll give you an injection and then take you up for cataract for cataract surgery. And the. I'm asking cataract surgeon. Uh, I mean, without any cataract surgery, he doesn't have an OCT with him. but he is he's no uh, there's no indication for that i think that is very clear yeah, no no indication. if you cannot document the macular documentation no, is very important be. now dr talwar has uh, raised a very important question be careful in when, when whenever you are treating a diabetic as a cataract or injection or even a prp so with our clinical experience the, uh, after prp also patient can get postural attack and we have seen the serious consequences these patient who come to us for injections they are systematically unstable so control for 2 to 3 months is very important directly inject you must investigate systemic also cardiovascular system also so we have seen all these thing after prp mi after injection mi and uh, in fixed dose regime the if you compare there the systemic complication were more as, uh, um, uh, as compared to where we have uh, people have done pronata ha huh, dr talwa incidentally in diabetics the problem is mi could be a, a previous history of mi could be important we do know that if you had an mi within the last 3 uh, months the incidence of a repeat mi with an anti vegf is much more that's what the sailor study showed but it also showed that you can decrease that incidence by bringing the dose down to 0.3 mg so first step in a in a person who's had a recent mi i would avoid anything diabetes is not a uh, diabetic macular edema is not such a devastating disease that you can't wait 3 months for treatment so first step is wait second step after that if i need to give i may say all right let me give uh, ozodex if there's no history of glaucoma or if uh, or uh, ocular hypertension and the third thing if i still need to give i would start off with 0.3 mg of ranibizumab avastin i would not give in this situation this is one of the situations where i would not use avastin so the early detection of diabetes is very important and these are 10% of diabetic 10 to 20% are not knowing on the when we do various studies this has seen that undetected diabetes are more and the sequences are more so the, those are the right thank you thank you sir ha bol acha thank you yeah thank dr. you so now i'd like to invite uh, uh, dr dinesh talwar to uh, talk on uh, coronary vascularization he is a very senior veterinary surgeon in delhi at uh, center for site apollo hospitals and uh, teacher to many of us and he has extensive experience in talking about cnv welcome sir please uh, 
good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I must uh, thank Dr. Rajpal, Dr. Pradeep, the other faculty members of uh, RP Center for inviting me to my alma mater. It's been a long time since I came into this uh, LT and either listened or gave any uh, talk. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, happy that you are here. Thank you. Taliya bhai ek baar. 20 saal baad wapsi hui hai. Chalo. We want he should continue to come. And Thank you. Uh, now let's come to anti-VEGFs in choroidal neovascularization. How would I use? This is a disclaimer. This becomes important in today's uh, world where you are connected. Um, uh, it's important that what I'm saying, and I've said this from the time when I was a consultant over here, everything that any consultant says or anybody says is subject to verification. So I'm giving you what I thought is the gist of whatever I do and what I uh, want to practice. However, you must check whatever somebody tells you and confirm that that is validated or not. And if it's not validated, either you should ask the, the person who told you that information, ask him the rationale or try it out with caution. So, so just one one comment on that, okay, but the problem with validation nowadays is almost all of it is validated by the pharma companies yeah. and so one has to be more cautious, go back to the previous studies when there was no financial involvement there and see what those studies said and compare with what these sponsored studies are saying. Yeah, so validation does not mean just picking up the abstract. Remember, the, fine, the best way to validate, even from a study which is sponsored, is to see the fine, the fine print. Go through the actual text and you will find that the things will stand out. Where there is a problem and where is, there is not. Where something is being hidden, assume there is a problem. This is my financial disclosure. Now, exudative ARMD uh, will be the basic, uh, we'll use that as the basic uh, um, parameter, but all types of CNVM come under this. CNVMs, due to ARMD at least, can be uh, classic, minimally classic, occult, and the occult ones also could be late leakage from an unknown source, fibrovascular RP detachments or serous RP detachments. So you can understand it's not one disease. And one of the, one of the problems that is happening now is, all studies combine all these types of disease into one and say, hey, go ahead and just treat with an anti -VEGF. So please be careful. They, different patients behave differently. Now, the good thing was that the Marena and Anchor showed us that sustained treatment with monthly treatment, uh, ranibizumab, can help to bring a change in the visual equity for the better. So you have better visual outcomes. In fact, that was the first time in, in our literature that we found that we are not talking, you know, we used to tell patients, oh, we can't help you, but you will deteriorate more slowly. This was with Visodyne. And this, for the first time, brought us to a situation that say, hey, wait, we can improve you. Now, that's a huge change in a mindset, and it completely changed the way we treat our patients. The problem is this monthly treatment can be extremely extent, uh, in, intensive and exhausting for the patient. But it's not that everyone needs monthly treatment. The sustained study showed us that various patients need different amounts of injections. So there are patients who just need three injections in an year, and there are others who may need monthly injections. So you can't treat everyone in one particular style. Luckily for us, now we have lots of drugs available. We have ranibizumab both as the uh, innovator drug and its uh, biosimilars. We have bevacizumab, we have aflibercept, and we have brolicizumab, and I forgot to write about faricizumab. The optimal treatment for a patient depends on the efficacy, safety, ease of use for patient and doctor, and the intervals between treatments. So what is the importance of efficacy and safety. Would you say safety is more important or efficacy? Just to answer this myself, the most efficacious treatment for AMD, exudative AMD, ever devised was macular laser. Destroy the lesion completely using subphobia, even if it's subphobial. The end result, six-line loss of vision immediately, but the lesion goes away. 
So safety, zero. Efficacy, perfect. Would you do that? No. That's why we have the alternatives. First principle, safety. And long back, somebody said, physician, do no harm. So whatever treatment you do, if, it's, if the risk is high, you're not to do it. Now, what are the factors that influence visual outcomes in, these, in this disease? And we have to manage those intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and sub-RPE fluid. Studies have shown, and this is a post hoc analysis of the view, that intraretinal cysts, if they are present, those patients have a poorer visual return as compared to visual, visual outcome compared to those who do not have intraretinal cysts. So, obviously, this is if you if you have a patient who didn't have intraretinal cysts or very few, you know this patient has a better prognosis. The second important thing, when you're treating your patient, if the patient does not develop once you've treated the patient, if the recurrence of the intraretinal cysts occurs late, the visual prognosis is better. So what do we want? We want that the delay should occur in the recurrence of these cysts, because the longer they take to come back, the better the patient will do. So what are we trying to do? The longer we can keep this lesion dry, the better the visual outcome. So our, our, our techniques for management must be designed to keep the lesion dry for as long as possible. The third thing that came out from the Harrier study, the Hawk and Harrier study did a analysis of patients who had greater central subfield thickness variability, the what we call fluctuation, and saw that those who had maximum fluctuation, which is this third group over here, they had the least visual outcome. So if you if you allow too much visual uh, too much fluctuation in the fluid, the, the visual results will drop. And those patients who had minimal fluctuation had the maximum visual outcome. So what do we want? Minimum fluctuation in the in the fluid that the patient gets. So this is the other important thing. The third thing is that if you talk about fluid, then there was another study which, did, which was done which compared those who had high amounts of fluid with low amounts of fluid, and they said that in virtually every group, whether it's intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, uh, pigment epithelial detachment, wherever the fluid is more, the visual outcomes are not so good compared to those who have less fluid. So this you know when you see the patient, are you going to get good fluid, good response or not? The basically treatment protocols include many, but the most important ones are PRN and treat and extend. The important lesson we got from the various uh, studies on uh, PRN was that monthly follow-ups are better if you're going to do PRN, and there are very stringent guidelines for retreatment, including very small decrease in vision, any fluid, any increase in fluid, any macular hemorrhage. So a fundus checkup is also important at each visit, and if you see a new macular hemorrhage, the patient needs treatment. In terms of treat, treat and extend the important techniques, the, the, the difference is that you treat when it dries, then you keep on extending the follow-up uh, the uh, interval between the treatments so that you can finally take the patient to maybe 12 weeks or 16 weeks interval between treatments. The Altair study was more, uh, uh, used the more aggressive uh, uh, criteria for extension. They would shorten the interval if there was even persistent fluid. They would maintain the interval if the fluid was decreasing and extend the treatment only when there was a dry lesion. To my mind, a treat and extend is means is more proactive, more injections, possibly a good option for patients who are either one-eyed, where you don't want to take chances, or who are stable but not dry, unlike the conventional treat and extend, which is done when the patient becomes dry. Wait and extend or monitor and extend is probably the best option for two-eyed patients in whom the lesion becomes dry, especially in our setup, where we can't afford to have uh, a, a waste of money uh, when the patient doesn't need the injection. Which drug is optimal? Now, nobody keeps this in mind, but b if, you, if, you, if you see the response, type 2 CNVMs, even ranibizumab is extremely effective. For type 1 CNVMs, aflibercept is better than ranibizumab any day. But if you overall see the treatments, overall monthly bevacizumab is almost as good as monthly ranibizumab 
from the CAT trial this information comes, but the macula dries less quickly and less often. Brolicizumab is more effective for drying fluid uh, as compared to the other drugs. What about safety? We were talking about safety. Ranivizumab and aflibercept are equally safe. Bevacizumab, our problems have been of cluster endophthalmitis, not related per se to the drug, but due to other logistic issues. Brolicizumab carries a 1 in 200 risk of intraocular inflammation and a 1 in 400 risk of inflammatory vascular disorders, which is in addition to the general risk of an intravitreal injection. That's the additional risk. But if you've got a systemic problem, I already mentioned that ranivizumab 0 0.35, uh, 0 0.3 milligrams uh, is the safest in a recent stroke or a recent MI. Now, how do I actually manage my patients? If I, you give the, here AMD you give, or in any coroidal neovascularization, you generally do give uh, a loading dose, except in myopes. And once the lesion becomes dry, you have a choice of either treat and extend, where you ex increase the intervals between the uh, treatment and increase up to 12 weeks with ranibizumab or 16 weeks with aflibercept, or you do monthly follow-ups, and if recurrence occurs, you do a PRN treatment. And this, over time, you can gauge the intervals and decide to give inter injections just before the time of recurrence. In patients who are requiring PRN treatment with ranibizumab on a less than eight weekly basis, consider PRN aflibercept. If, on the other hand, at three months the lesion is not dry, you continue and for another three months. If it dries, go back to the first um, uh, algorithm. If it doesn't dry, this is the group which I believe requires a treat and extend regime, and you can extend the duration between treatments to 12 to even 16 weeks. And if the patient is not responding to ranibizumab, you can even give a trial of aflibercept. Now, when do you switch your drugs? If your injection frequency with ranibizumab is less than seven weeks for a recurrence, switch to aflibercept. If, this, if the injection frequency with aflibercept is less than seven weeks for a recurrence, switch to either brolicizumab or ferricizumab when it becomes available. Again, similarly, if you have a stable lesion which is not and it's requiring monthly ranibizumab, try aflibercept. And if you, again, a stable lesion and you're needing aflibercept too frequently, again, try brolicizumab or ferricimab. And switch between brolicizumab and aflibercept. If you, after a brolicizumab injection, I get in a persistent fluid at four weeks, I don't repeat brolicizumab four weekly. I would wait for another four weeks, and during that time, I would give an aflibercept injection. Now, you know, the issue is often raised. Do you treat a patient with a scar? Now, this patient came with a, this patient is not a, a AMD. This patient is actually a idiopathic CNVM. Patient has counting finger, which he was 20 years old, counting fingers at three meters. This kind of lesion is there. Should you treat? Now, this is what the initial picture was like. And I decided to give him a chance. The patient, over time, came to finally, and this was 615 at that time, and he finally came to 612. So just because there's a scar, and you, you can see the reason probably is that the fovea got spared uh, in the central area. So even if, this, if, if the patient has a scar, I would give a chance to this patient, see the response. If I'm getting an improvement, I would continue. If I don't get an improvement, I will stop the treatment. The other group, both these patients have a scar, but they have 624 vision. And if you don't treat them, it comes like this and the vision will start deteriorating. Patient says, when I get the injection, vision improves. The, probably the scotoma becomes smaller and more well-defined. The patient's able to see better. The, this patient was one-eyed. Both the eyes have a similar picture. So the 624 vision, 636 vision, is exceedingly important in this patient. So the patient was maintained with injections despite having obvious scars. But because all our uh, prescriptions, you know, they are CGHS patients, they go to Savdarjang or to you people. So I had to write down each time, this is patient has useful vision, has this cyst, improves, and maintains vision with this. That is why I'm prescribing. Otherwise, they'll say, this is all for commercial gain. Now, the good thing, this is the last set of slides. The, there are studies which have done a long-term analysis of aflibercept, ranibizumab, and bevacizumab over a long period. And imagine what you found. 
no difference in visual acuity outcomes or number of injections between the agents used. So ultimately, we're, and in, if you t look at the OCT analysis, decreased fluid both ways, no difference between the agents used. Number of injections, not too much of a difference. What was different? The difference was that the eyes that gained more than two lines had more injections. So the ultimate thing is, the more the number of injections, the more the time the injections were continued, the better the visual outcome. And this is another study showed that just with the ranibizumab, the pay, they got more than 40% of patients over seven years maintaining better than 612 vision. And more than 64%, two thirds of patients maintaining more than 618 vision. So the important thing is giving the injection on time no tolerance for fluid, specifically not for intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid only if it is not going away, not that I'm deliberately going to leave it. And sub-RP fluid does not respond to ranibizumab or uh, aflibercept, so don't run after it. When you're giving PRN treatment, aggressive treatment is the key. Monthly follow-up is essential till the lesion heals and then three monthly long, uh, lifelong. Greater the number of injections, more intensive and longer the follow-up, better the visual outcome. Most patients who lose vision lose it when they don't come for an extended follow-up. High index of treatment, for a suspicion for retreatment will help you to treat your patients better. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude by saying eternal vigil is the price you have for maintaining vision in patients with CNBM. And if you take, if you take that care of your patients, Believe me, I have patients who are surviving 10 years, 8 years, 12 years with their vision maintained most of the times, only because I don't let them go away. I keep stressing the need for regular follow-ups. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I want to also dedicate this uh, lecture, yes. since I've come over here to RP Center. My uh, uh, guru was Professor Tiwari. Many of you may not have seen him. but. Uh, He's, he was probably the finest teachers to make you grow. You know, it is the mm. role of the teacher is not to teach factual information. It is to give you an opportunity to grow. And the opportunities that he gave us, and that includes me and m many of the people yes, who worked yes, with me, yes. including Pradeep, I don't think we could have got them otherwise. Mm. And I think that played a big role in ensuring in where we are today. So I want yeah. to thank him today for all that he did for me. And my, um, um, I, it is from RP Center and from him that I got whatever I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalwar, for an excellent presentation. And uh, I think many things are quite clear now. Any questions? Dr. Talwar, a question is just one time OCT, once you have done the OCT and you have CNVM diagnosed, okay? And after that, every monthly you give injections, okay? So how long you should continue to give that I, I, you have already said? I'll tell you what I tell same. my patients. Uh -huh. When the patient comes for the first time and he asks this question, um, tak injection lagenge? I said, I will tell them, I said, when I live, I will take it. And when I die, I will take it from someone else. Okay? See, you don't want to tell him, until you die, it is better to say, tak, <laughs> right? Thank Chalo, you, thank, you, thank you. Sir. You can discuss later on with Dr. Talwar. We have got the opportunity. He has got very wide experience in vitro retina. Chalo, next. Now I invite Dr. Parijat Chandra for antivagist in ROP. Dr. Parijat Chandra is, is the master in ROP and we all know that we refer all our difficult cases and we discuss all our difficult cases and he, he is the pinnacle where we rely upon. So today he's going to give us more knowledge on antivagist in ROP. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind words. Um, yeah. So I'll be talking about anti vegf drugs in ROP. Uh, so we used to do no laser like this in aggressive ROP in zone one, and we used to feel very happy about it. And so five years back, if you'd have shown this photograph, I'd been very happy that you know someone did a very nice laser and uh, the disease regressed. So you understand there's only like 10, 20 percent of retina left here, and there are a lot of problems here right now. He's got a limited visual field with tubular vision. There's poor macular perfusion, there's a risk of high myopia. So we can no longer feel happy about it when we do a laser like this. And when I see a laser like this happening, I feel very disappointed now when I see such a case who's been managed by Maharagdun. 
मैं प्राइमरी ले जाऊं सो एंटीबजेस नो डाउट हैज इमर्ज एट द फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ ट्रीटमेंट इन जोन वन आरओपी ओवर द इयर्स वन बिकॉज इट लीड्स टू रैपिड आरओपी रिग्रेशन इट लीड्स टू रिटर्नल रीवेस्कुलराइजेशन व्हिच इज वन ऑफ द मेजर पॉइंट्स व्हिच अलाउज फॉर बेटर विजुअल ग्रोथ अ बेटर फोवल स्ट्रक्चर एंड हैज लेसर रिफ्रैक्टिव चेंजेस देन इफ यू डू अ जोन वन लेजर and obviously if you compare with laser it's a much faster procedure much easier procedure to do it causes much less pain and a more stable baby so right now having a stable baby is a much more bigger problem because it's a very painful kind of procedure so the rainbow trial definitely showed uh, a significant benefit of uh, ranizumab compared to laser in different groups which led to its approval in the european union uh, as the first and only licensed pharmacological treatment uh, for rop so this was first instance the regulatory approval happened Uh, for the use of ranizumab subsequently just recently fd has given approval to ilia as the first pharmacological treatment in preterm babies from their side so that was from the european union this is from the us fda so this changes a lot of things now uh, because it gives uh, first time the approval from the us fda for a treatment modality for rop and it was you know supported by the firefly and the butterfly eye studies uh, although non inferiority of this could not be demonstrated in this trial So let's look at some of the current usage scenarios where you would want to use anti-VEGF. So this is a case of uh, aggressive ROP. You see the extensive neovascularization happening at the pupillary margin. So you really can't do any other procedure behind this if you want to do laser or surgery or even examine the situation properly. It's difficult to do. So anti-VEGF works very nicely in this. So you give an injection, and in three days, this is what it looks like. All the neovascularization has disappeared, and now you can, you know. very clearly examine the funders do laser do surgery or whatever we want to do so this kind of thing was never possible without anti vegfs and now it's become possible because of this kind of usage this is another very common scenario which you know used to trouble a lot of us uh, a lot of newcomers used to come also for the treatment of rop you see this is a case of aggressive rop and you see just this a bunch of loops there you can see the maxilla also is not vascularized so people who want to do primary laser you know where should you laser in this where is the junction so everyone does not have an fluorescent angiography to you know uh, do this so injection takes a lot of problem out of the situation you just give it and forget about it because all this is going to grow and get revascularized the macula is going to re revascularized so it deals with a lot of problems which laser had where to laser how much to laser what to do with the macula how much area to leave all that problems are dealt with if you give a primary injection it continues to grow This is a very common situation which happens is when a zone one posterior ROP where even the macula is not vascularized. So what you see here, I'm just trying to outline this. That is all the retina that is there. So now, if that is the retina which is there, if you uh, go for a primary laser approach, how much will you laser? Where will you laser? Right? It's very difficult to deal with cases like this. So what has really happened if you give an injection in this eye? So this is what happens in next four weeks. So this kind of thing again was not possible with laser alone. and there was actually no other treatment beside anti vegf which could make this miracle kind of thing happen so people who go in for injection and immediately go for laser again don't do laser immediately you know wait for it to grow that is why we primary injected in this what was the urgency to inject if you know didn't want it to grow so you wait for it let it grow as much as it can grow before it reactivates or vascularizes to the zone 3 and then you see what's going to happen So another case I'm showing here. This case came to in zone one posterior. You see, it's already in stage four A, and you know there's some hemorrhage sitting there around. There's, not, there's no retina elsewhere which you can see, and so this was referred to us for surgery. So we injected this eye, and this is what happened the next six weeks. So you see, so a lot of advantages happen here. All the new vascularization melted away. The PVD lifted, which you see the white stalk marked by the arrow. So the whole thing went away, and the retina revascularized. So you can get away with just a single injection here, and you don't need surgery. in every case because surgery is not going to fix the problem which you see on the top left photo the, the injection will you know fix it to quite some extent this another case scenario which you see you know advancing rop with extensive new vascularization so this case already you see is going to stage 4 is already been lasered but continues to progress despite uh, uh, laser so what do you do in this case so earlier you know we used to do just surgery in these cases and you know what usually will happen is that uh, you'll have an intraoperative bleeding you'll have a post operative bleeding this thing might just contract over itself many people like to give a primary injection again in this case again you know there's a high risk of crunch which will happen and you know this will just again contract over itself so what really works is if you combine an surgery with an injection and this kind of clean outcome will happen which you know we could never get with surgery alone 
so this kind of clean out although it can bleed and all those things can happen but eventually you'll it'll clear and you can have this kind of clean outcome because it combines both the effects of surgery which helps to relieve traction take off the uh, uh, load in the vitreous and the new vasculation is taken care of by the anti vegf and it works very fast in these case scenarios there are some newer indications of anti vegf we are uh, shifting more uh, to use it in cases of uh, rop which are not conventionally zone 1 rop or aggressive rop so you get a case like this and you know now this case either you like see so you know that is going to progress to some extent in that area despite laser because laser needs time to work and if you combine it with anti vegf then you know it's going to go away in a more predictable manner so i'm not saying give anti vegf in every case of zone 2 i'm just saying in some particular cases where you feel that it's going to threshold disease or a more severe scenario it can work as an adjunct with laser and help to regress it faster because laser might take time so next time you get a case like this now this case has a very high tendency is going to progress to stage 4a even despite laser Uh, probably someone would like to do a barrage laser also in this but again the response is unpredictable because laser takes time and anti vegf works very fast so if you uh, you know given anti vegf in this in combo with laser this might you know work fast so you can try it in your next case uh, in a combination with laser so this some scenarios are not to inject so this case came to us he was already lasered he had already was going to stage 4 uh, rop and he was advised for you know surgical uh, intervention in this case because that will work best in this case but the referring surgeon decided to go in for an injection and you know it continued to go into crunch and you know it went to stage 4b in the next two weeks so what i'm just trying to say is a case which is meant for laser should be lasered for injection is injection but don't lose the early surgical advantage just because uh, you want to inject because it doesn't work in every case there are very selected case scenarios where injections will work well and the cases which are meant for surgery have to be done surgery first so which drug to use lot of drugs are available in the market so right now we are using uh, ranizumab because it has regulatory approval and many people like to use uh, uh, bevacizumab as well um, we are using rasumab right now which is a biosimilar which is available in hospital supply so we've been using it for a long time now mostly half dose is being used people have used uh, one fourth dose one tenth dose all of these doses work but somehow the re um, the response might be a little lower or it might reactivate faster that is what uh, the literature says how many injections one injection works very well it continues to grow and then you can go ahead and do laser if the peripheral vascular retina is left So we like to inject in a sterile environment in the OT microscope magnification in a controlled uh, monitoring by the anesthetist or the pediatrician. That is how we like to do it. So the uh, it ensures sterility and shows the magnification we need. We would like to inject bilateral in the same sitting. Obviously, it would like two separate procedure. You have to uh, you know uh, use uh, separate gloves and clean rep again and beta din again and all that. So right now the problem we get a lot of cases now coming like this with cataract with end of cell mitis a lot of these cases are happening because people are giving in the ICU uh, without proper uh, sterility without proper magnification and uh, you know in a moving baby and all these problems can happen so we need to look out for that so peripheral avascular retina is something it grows like this and a lot of area is left avascular now if you don't do something about it then you know it's going to you know come back in a very uh, angry manner so uh, the best method right now is to do laser once it's grown to a significant degree uh, so but what is the the troubling problem right now is you can't just give inject and go away because the disease is going to come back in 4 to 8 weeks time and sometimes even at 10 weeks 12 weeks so you have to maintain the follow up obviously aflibercept and bevacizumab have a longer duration so the reactivations do occur but they might occur at a later time ranizumab the reactivations occur much faster so you have to maintain a high index of suspicion plus disease will come back new vasculation will come back the ridge will come back so usually people deal with laser but i'll just show you some scenarios just last one or two slides um, when do you want to give a repeat injection so sometimes the reactivation occurs you know very strongly at 4 weeks or 6 weeks or sometimes you know uh, the wow factor which happens with the injection does not happen so you injected and nothing much happened and now you are wondering you know the drug is not working maybe it's not the drug is not working the injection didn't go inside just two drops so the technique is not correct it's just you inject you put in a swab stick with a lot of pressure the drug goes in drug comes out into the swab stick you know so uh, maybe the fellow is not loaded properly and the air is there or some those kind of problems so the wow factor has not happened mostly the drug has you know 90% chance not gone in properly but sometimes you know if it reactivates then you need a faster action so you can reinject you see the blue arrow i'm trying to show the again the loops and everything are there and it's coming back in stage 2 3 in different areas hemorrhage is happening so again laser takes time again you don't know where to laser so you might need to do it a lot of these cases are coming right now which are already lasered injected and you know after 8 weeks again it starts to reactivate so in these cases again we try to switch the drug and we if you have given uh, ranizumab already person has given two times ranizumab you know it's better to switch to avastin and then avastin works very well and then the disease will finally go away 
some person sent over says four injections of ranizumab. It kept on happening every time, like clockwork at six weeks. We switched to Avastia and it's not come back for like three months, four months as of follow. So this is what works like that. And just the last two scenarios, if you have poor regrowth at uh, with a large power at 12 weeks, maybe you know uh, you want to inject again at six to eight weeks and maybe it'll grow a little more if it's not growing. But again, if you want to laser, that's also good enough. And this the last situation, if you've got a poor regrowth and it reactivates again, maybe you want to, instead of doing laser, maybe you want to inject again, maybe you can see it. So a lot of literature is saying that you inject again, it might grow further a little. So you can give that chance or if you can laser also, that's also fine enough if you want to do that. And just in the end, a huge shout out to the JSSK Government of India program, which allows us to provide this injection free of cost to these babies uh, less than one year of age and because of which we have to support these injections in these babies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Parijat. Uh, Thank you. As Dr. Parijat remembers, uh, we must remember Professor R.V. Ajat. He started this ROP and uh, Dr. Talwar, I see, he has worked hard and with me, we were there in the initially to start the thing. Another thing is when I taken over as a ROP, I introduced the anti -vegef. It took me very difficult to convince people to give anti -vegef. So another contribution of RP Center is Rainbow Trial, one of the international trial where I was the principal investigator, you know, to start uh, anything. Otherwise, we used to send people outside for anti -vegef. So you have to work hard to convince the people to do uh, any new research, which Dr. Talwar is always there. So doctor, I have seen Dr. Talwar is still doing a ROP. He's, I don't know how, uh, and it's very difficult because ROP patients are, you know, they, how they will behave. Now the question was if uh, uh, there is a bilateral conjunctivitis, bilateral conjunctivitis, and AP ROP. Second, I will inject because of my experience, two patients in which one patient conjunctivitis left and became blind. Another patient, I was there, I said, no, inject in one eye at least to say, because Dr. Garg used to say viral conjunctivitis never cause a uh, thing. We don't propagate, but the situation where three, four days, because I have seen when I took over as a second, uh, uh, second time in a ROP, I have seen a lot of things, a lot of clinical experience required. You have to have an expert opinion like Parijat Chandra. You have to learn for six to one year. So giving this talk doesn't mean you should start ROP practice. No, I am the, now I have concluded, don't start ROP practice without having an experience. Because three, four cases, like one case conjunctivitis, other has gone to TRD, he has become blind. Another thing is somebody has given anti -VEGF. he was not having a vitro-retina setup, AP ROP, crunch phenomena. Third case, I took over as thing, I injected, I say, after two days we will do the surgery and by entered it was already crunch phenomena was there so I was saved so don't try to do ROP in a practice you will land up because so many litigation is there but young generation are not cupping we are not teaching young generation ROP and that is the fault because when I took over I learned lot of things so ROP is a such thing Sarita Bair is one of them who is trying hard but still she has to uh, send the patient the gap between sending and this thing causes the traction and patients. We have seen so many patients coming from outside giving injection stage 5. So don't try to do ROP in a private practice. Dinesh Talwar may be the thing, one of the things. So that is why we are, we are seeing every time 5-6 patients stage 5. So if you have to do ROP, you have to have a first time for 6 month experience with the Parijat Chandra or with me. I thank my senior resident, 90% of the laser PRP is done by them. 90% they are doing their hard work and they are following we are following and we are following regularly it took so much of hard work for us it is a very very stressful situation let me tell you so after 60 years if you have a, anything don't do Parijat is still young he is doing but he must he is training people but but outside people should not do any ROP this is my recommendation because one case will lead because the variety of cases our senior resident is doing it's tremendous. They know the experience and outside they don't have experience in all these things. If they have to do the ROP, they must get training under Parijat Chandra for the at least one year. Thank you. So, so I think Dr. Parijat Chandra should start a fellowship for ROP. <laughs> no, no. I, I said center of excellence. We must start because ROP surgery has so many things. Even plain vitreous hemorrhage, you will have a RD. So we have the uh, ROP surgery is not very, you will have a sometime, so many problem is there. Unless you learn with a guru, 
So that is why he learned with Dr. Ajad. I learned with Dr. Ajad. So I remember Dr. Ajad. If Dr. Ajad has not given both of us the opportunity, we would not have been spaceless. We are spaceless. We are proud that Dr. Ajad has started. If somebody has not started the ROP, like Sarita Veri has started, Lady Harding, we'd, uh, Dr. Ajad would not have started. We would not be having this talk. Like other medical colleges where ROP has not. Even the retina has not been started. So we must thank Parijat Chandra Sarita Beri for doing the ROP. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much. So now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Dipinder Singh. Dr. Dipinder Singh is a senior veterinary consultant uh, in Delhi and has extensive experience uh, in talking about uh, anti vegfs and their usage. So I welcome Dr. Dipinder Singh. So we will give certificate. Anybody comes for six month or one year practitioner, we will give definitely there's a need of ROP. As you can talk later on, there is a need of ROP. People are becoming friend of mine. Being a doctor was not referred within a week. He got stage five, so it is it becomes very difficult. Parijat, ah, yes. Bachche ko dekhi doctor ka bachcha late aaya kyunki doctor. I mean, it is nothing. People are not aware of the ROP. Ke paanch se din mein stage five mein ho jata kya sumit? Thik hai, chalo. Thank you. Doctor Dipender was an alumnus from this place. He was a senior resident in unit two and a very close friend. And we welcome you, Doctor Dipender, to speak on the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Parijat, and I thank uh, Professor Titiyal, uh, Professor Rajpal, and Professor Pradeep Venkatesh for giving us this opportunity. And I'm standing on this podium after almost 21 years. Last time I was here, I was here to present my thesis. So, <laughs> and I fully agree with uh, Dr. Rajpal, sir. Whenever we think of ROP, we start, you know, tapping our neck. So it's a very physically and uh, emotionally draining uh, work. I think uh, kudos to all senior residents, I think, uh, and uh, teachers who are uh, putting them into right path. Uh, so I think uh, my topic is uh, pre-operative anti-VEGF injections. Uh, I think if I see in our practice, there are f four major indications where we would give an anti-VEGF injection before any surgery. So DME and cataract, Professor Rajpal sir has already covered very well. So I'll not be touching that. If 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 uh, you ask me, uh, the the majority of learning and majority of experience we had was from uh, PDR surgeries. So I'll be focused mainly on that. But there are other scenarios also where we can use anti-VEGF injections, like we c if we are operating a patient with neovascular glaucoma, or if you are planning to intervene in uh, cases like VHL angiomas or telangiectasias or uh, this vasoproliferative tumors. Uh, if, if which it can be a late sequelae of ROP also, you can also use anti vegf in those cases. But I think like just like Dr. Parijat has shown magic of vanishing new vascularization, I think this was the first case report which was actually a photo essay in archives and which has shown almost vanishing NVD within eight days of uh, anti vegf And all of us were really excited to see that. Uh, you know, uh, we have never seen that kind of dramatic response with lasers. And then in Academy 2006 meeting, this uh, this uh, guy Robert uh, Avery he presented this pre-operative Avastin before uh, PDR surgeries, and he said that uh, it's a very good uh, advantage. You know, uh, it reduces the bleeding in surgery, and and we all uh, actually uh, grasped it. And meanwhile, we were busy managing PDR without injections. And this was a school teacher. I think I, he had good PRP at this stage and then as usual many of them will again come back with subhyoid hemorrhage uh, and we operated with silicon oil result was not very good uh, there was some tearing which happened close to fovea and he could regain only 6 by 60 and it was at that time when his other eye started deteriorating with new vascularization uh, worsening at posterior pole uh, so it was around in January 20, 2007 that this was the first case where I used uh, injection before surgery. And sur surprisingly, the surgical uh, intervention was very easy and uh, there was very less intraoperative bleeding and he actually got a very good surgical outcome. I'll not say it, I'll not attribute it completely to anti vegf because kind of proliferations in both eyes are not comparable. But I think he maintains 6-6 six, six vision, he, he's coming even now and you see uh, how well it regresses, but that, uh, uh, new, uh, attack of that proliferative disease on posterior pole could have been tackled, uh, could not have been tackled so well if we didn't have anti vegf So now, why do we uh, want to use anti vegf before PDR surgery? As all of us started using it, we realized that it actually regresses the new vessels 
it reduces the chances of bleeding during uh, surgery it makes your dissections also easier by contracting all those membranes and it also reduces your operating times your chances of having hydrogenic breaks also go down and if you have an coexisting dme also it will take care of that also now as you all the literature was then flooded with lot of reports on using uh, anti vegf before pdr surgeries uh, after this first report came in retina 2006 and when you have lot of case reports you will have lot of meta analysis so first one was in 2015 the next one was 2020 and then the next one was 2021 i'll briefly discuss about this one which was done more uh, methodological uh, methodologically but if i have to summarize i think most reviews concluded that if you give pre operative anti vegf before pdr surgeries it will reduces the chances of intra operative bleeding you get lesser chances of hydrogenic breaks and all other advantages which i have already discussed only thing the which which still keeps troubling us with the surgeons is post vitrectomy rebleeds there was very low evidence which was supporting that it may reduce the uh, chances of post vitrectomy rebleeds and uh, this is just one of our patient now you see this uh, that kind of very aggressive new vascularization although it is predominantly seen nasally but if you can see it is encroaching macular area here so these are the patients i think we would have very really tough time operating them without anti vegf now you give anti vegf and your surgery becomes well out of all the studies i think this study actually stands apart that's why i have included this in my presentation uh, after initial use of uh, anti vegf before pdr surgeries the interest was what should be the ideal time of giving the injection before surgery so these guys from uh, middle east uh, what they did was uh, they gave a vestin before uh, diabetic vitrectomy and operated them at different intervals and at the time of surgery they took out the specimen and they analyzed uh, two things one is cd34 which they con considered as the expression of new vascularization and marker of endothelial cells and second thing which they analyzed was smooth muscle actin and collagen which they took as a marker of contractile tissue and i think their results were very interesting that cd34 expression was reduced significantly by day 5 while contractile uh, uh, markers they became less by the day 10 so this gave us a very good uh, you know uh, um, uh, very good information on the surgical window which is available ab available to all of us so uh, all of us who are using anti vegf before proliferative diseases we realize it does two things it will regress the new vessels and it will induce some contraction so uh, based on this their study and then more sub i think subsequent studies have also supported their belief that you have best time when you have to operate is between 7 to 10 days and all these meta analyses which are coming up recently they are uh, actually now trying to find out that what should be the ideal time between injection and the surgery and this one actually and now they are trying to quantify the outcome measures like should you only consider visual equity or you should actually measure the duration of surgery the recurrent vitreous hemorrhage the uh, silicon oil use which might indirectly indicate intraoperative breaks or intraoperative bleeding so now if you see for almost 3 uh, out of 5 criteria the best timing they found was 6 to 14 days and i i saw that being uh, highlighted in professor rajpal sir's presentation also uh, that 6 to 14 days i think there is their uh, conclusion that probably that may be the best time but coming back to current perspective what are we doing in our practice so what we are doing is actually we tend to titrate because we are not doing studies we are in a clinical practice so we can always customize so we normally have two set of patients one set of patients who are at very high risk of crunch phenomena or worsening traction there we tend to keep a very short interval 2 to 4 days or 2 to 3 days and then other subset of patients who are not at that high risk there we keep it as a 5 to 10 days but the important message i like to convey to all young surgeons is ensure that everything is being prepared right from uh, checkups and insurances and documentation before scheduling these kind of cases and fix both the dates injection as well as surgery together and that is what we do if uh, they are not getting ready we postpone both the dates and the another important practical issue which we face is you give them injection and then call them on surgery and on day of surgery their blood sugar shoots up 
so we counsel them and tell them that don't panic it's not important to have absolutely be best control on the day of surgery it's the long term control which matters and we also have our team ready who can give them neutralizing dose of insulin to take care of their blood sugar so that surgery doesn't get cancelled uh, after giving the injection so now if i show you two different type of patients now here there is too much of new vascularization but again predominantly on the nasal side and here we have macular new vascular complex and another one here but if you do scan for the patient on the right side you will see there is not much traction on macula so both these cases i think you can safely wait till 7 days after giving the injection now you might ask me why not operate early because to reduce the risk of bleeding i think the longer anti vegf stays before surgery you know better advantage you have so that that is what i think most of these meta analysis have found that if you want to maximize the benefit of anti vegf wait for 7 8 days but on the other hand a patient like this which is already detaching contracting retina i may not like to wait for 7 8 days and we actually operated him within 48 hours of injection and i think post op uh, patient doing quite well now this is another category of patients which we are operating they don't have uh, new vascularization all around in retina it is only focused on disc and very close to fovea <laughs> now again good vision and if you see the oct the foveal traction dragging these are the patients also you know which can have a localized crunch kind of thing their visual acuity and macula can detach fast again we have to operate them early uh, the gap between injection and surgery has to be just 2 to 3 days and uh, again uh, patients like this very aggressive neovascular front on right eye and this again sub hyoid hemorrhage again here also we can wait 5 6 days operated i'll just i think i'll not avoid showing the surgery but this is the patient i think after uh, giving injection and uh, doing surgery and this patient i just wanted to share that very aggressive new vascularization this is how it changes whole i think aggressive new vascular front gets fibrous within 4 to 5 days and after all our dissections i just like to show you the picture at the last there is hardly any you know hemorrhage so that is the advantage uh, which anti vegf brought to our surgeries uh, in general if you ask me current perspective is we tend to use pre operative anti vegf for all our pdr surgeries except if it is a very well lasered pdr which has which is now being operated for macular issues like vmts or erms or if, if they, we are operating them for non clearing vitreous hemorrhage or on the other side there is a patient who has already received multiple anti vegf injections for dme so it's not a treatment naive patient again will not give pre operative anti vegf and also the patients who are presenting very late who have predominantly fibrous kind of uh, proliferation uh, who are in psychiatrical phase of pdr there also we don't give pre operative anti vegf uh, so apart from all the advantages which i have shown in earlier slides the another big advantage of using anti vegf before pdr surgery is now we are we are able to operate these cases quite early and earlier we operate before traction destroys the macula our functional and structural outcome is getting better now the cases like this uh, treatment naive cases presenting with pre macular sub hyoid hemorrhages we are actually straight away operating them and the reason is if you see there is a big new vascular front here here this patient we did uh, oct angio i am not showing it in interest of time they'll see lot of macular new vascular complexes so you can do prp then you know this hemorrhage might disappear in 4 5 months but they will lose macula because of chronic traction and this has been possible only because of uh, pre operative anti vegf and even when sometimes this looks uh fibrous and atrophic even you have to look at the blood vessels if blood vessels are not and attenuated they it will still bleed so even in this kind of patient sometimes we give pre operative anti vegf you have to look at the blood vessels and the vascularity of the fibrovascular sheet i think new vascularization secondary to rvo you all know so i think in general 
uh, we started injecting anti vegf in oil field eyes in 2007 in this scenario where you, we were operating NVG. And a lot of reports have shown that you can give full dose of uh, bevacizumab in silicon oil filled eyes. Uh, clearance is delayed because it enters into oil and then uh, gets li uh, liberated slowly. But you all know about it that it works like a wonder. I think, you, I think this was a couple of weeks back only. PDR who presented with NVG and vitreous hemorrhage. So pre-op injection, surgery, and you see uh, new vascularization regresses. So if I have to conclude, I'll say it has improved our surgical outcomes. And uh, we'll, next phase will be interesting in trying newer, more potent anti vegf for conditions like telangiectasia or angiomas because they are less responsive to our regular anti vegf So that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dakinda. It's been a wonderful lecture, and your pictures were very, very impressive. So I think you have cleared all the doubts which anybody had for anti and surgery. Any any questions? Then we can go on to our next speaker. Dr. Pradeep Venkatesh, he needs no introduction. He's a very senior faculty in the retina of RP Center, and he's one of the very meticulous surgeons. Dr. Pradeep will speak on the cost of retinal pharmaco pharmacotherapy. That is extremely important because the cost is really high and many of the insurances don't cover. So he will tell us how to get out of it. Yeah, an introduction I'd like to add was ma'am was my senior resident and I still remember the rounds that we used to have. Uh, I think what 1B, 1A I think. Yeah, so I've learned a lot from ma'am and uh, so it's nice to have her here today. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. How many senior residents are Talia? We have learned a lot of things about Dr. Sarita Berry and we were happy. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for this. Today, she is head of uh, Lady Harding Medical College. I really won't be talking about uh, the financial aspect. Uh, I won't be covering how much each drug costs uh, in this presentation. So I'd like to tell you about a few things on what the actual nature of uh, macular disease is and what does actually cost mean. And I'll try to uh, add a few stories in to tell you that it's not essentially what we see day to day. And then what are the implications of the cost that I'm going to tell you about and is there any solutions to this? So if you talk about macular disease, most of them should be or almost all of them should actually be treated as uh, akin to a chronic systemic disease, meaning that cure is impossible. And obviously there's going to be a cumulative financial burden. So most of the presentations and I too uh, was a victim of that initial miracle that the anti vegf drugs were creating. But what actually matters is the long-term outcomes in all of these macular diseases. The rush essentially was it because most of the reports said that within day seven, you have a dramatic improvement in visual acuity and a dramatic anatomical change. And also, they wishy-washily put some statements saying that intraretinal hemorrhages cause toxicity to neural cells, but absolutely no citation to support that. And going by the years of uh, retina that we have seen before anti-VEGF, I've seen uh, multiple cases where intraretinal hemorrhages have actually caused no toxicity. So the two-year results, I think we've already discussed, they said that there's not much of a change, whatever regimen you use, and these are all prominent trials. And then they said the difference would just be 2.4 letters at two years, okay, with the simple bevacizumab versus the ranibizumab that was compared. The five-year results again said there's no obvious difference in the visual acuity and one-third of them, despite seven years of treatment, lost more than 15 letters. So it's important for us to identify these one-third of patients, meaning you're treating them, you're wasting a lot of resources over here, so it's important to identify this one-third. And when Sir was mentioning that classic or occult, but these studies, one study showed that there actually does not much of a change which form of uh, choroidal neovascular membrane it is. 
But look, look at the eight-year results. Okay, they've given them 50 injections. You can look at the financial burden that's going in over there. Only 35% maintained 15-letter improvement. So again, we need to identify those two-thirds of patients who are not able to maintain good vision. Again, somewhere we are faltering. We need to identify those category of patients. This is a more recent meta-analysis, very clearly says that only a small proportion of patients actually maintain or recover good vision in diabetic macular edema. And I re-emphasize here what Dr. Talwar sir, told us, it's not an emergency to treat diabetic macular edema. So don't push your patients, telling them that you're gonna go blind without an injection. It happens and we do get patients uh, coming up with these statements. Now in the long term, what happens to uh, the anatomical outcomes, okay, there is persisting DME in 40% of patients who are diabetic. There's 61% of them who actually have some intraretinal fluid and the 30% who still have some subretinal fluid. These are long-term results of AMD management. And you see what's happening to the macula. You have almost one in five or one in four of them developing some degree of macular atrophy, which mimics a geographic atrophy over here. Now, when you talk about geographic atrophy, what could also be happening is that you're excessively suppressing in the uh, early, uh, early part of a symposium or workshop, Dr. Pandian told you what happens with pan wedge inhibition, and this pan wedge inhibition is probably driving the geographic atrophy over here, so we need to be cautious and understand that it could be drug-induced. Nobody calls it drug-induced but it is possibly drug-induced neural toxicity that's happening. You're destroying the nullar cells, you're destroying the astroglial cells, and that's what is possibly leading to geographic atrophy. Now, what is cost? This is from the Webster's Dictionary. Cost, you actually what you pay for some service or something you purchase, but it also means what is the penalty that you incur when you're actually trying to achieve a goal. So I'll try to cover <coughs> both over here. And when we talk about uh, the cost, when we deal with individual patients, in the last four weeks, I happened to interact with two of my teachers, and the first interaction was, I was surprised, he was forming a survey form, and in one of the survey questions, he had written, who benefits the most from an intravitreal injection, and one of the choices he had mentioned was doctor. So I thought it was a mistake, and I happened to ask him, so, uh, why is this doctor there? I, and I was not aware of it, frankly. I may be very naive, but I was not aware that this was happening. So he said what actually happens is the MRP on the, on the uh, whatever, cover is 21,000. The company gives it to the hospital or the physician, physician business people for 7,000. They sell it to the patient again at 21,000 and then add an extra cost of six to 7,000 for the procedure itself. So you can see what's happening over here. We're obviously exploiting our patients. This gives us a sense of deja vu. The IUL story was very similar. When I was a resident, we had only imported IULs. These issues were going on, but the issue is very worse over here. It's, there's no end to what you're going to explore, how you're going to exploit your patients. And this repeats every four to six, uh, four to eight weeks. And this is a very, this is of concern. And the, uh, after a few weeks, I happened to meet one of my best mentors. And then uh, he told me this last statement over here before I was, uh, I mean, leaving, he, he asked me to treat every patient as an opportunity to serve. So we have two different paths that we can take, but I mean, like we have no regulations, we have no proper guidelines, it's ultimately to each his own, and as youngsters, you have to choose which path you want to go. I mean, it may seem preachy, it may seem that I'm talking about morals, but ultimately I think healthcare involves more uh, morality and I think that's where we need to be cautious which path we're going to choose. What happens with unregulated profiteering? I'm, I'm using the word profiteering but because I'm, I think that's what is happening out, okay? So we tend to, I mean, you know, not satisfied. There's no end to earning money. So I think you go on and on. This was one of my own patients. He walks in with his wife, holding his wife's hand and he says he spent lakhs and he doesn't have any more money and so that he's come to RP Center now. Now, this is where I feel if the physician has already exploited this uh, elderly couple, he should probably be more considerate and carry on treatment with whatever. I mean, I'm sure he has the resources, but that never happens. They are at that point, they let them go, okay? So this is something that should not be happening. These are stats, more recent stats about, we seem to be aping what's happening in uh, USA. And even in developed countries, America has 
the worst kind of healthcare expenditure. Okay, the red uh, uh, bar that you're seeing there is the American expenditure compared to all other developed countries. And healthcare costs actually drives what is happening. And if you, if there are more recent statistics, they say 41% of the American public actually have healthcare related debt. Okay, and it, it varies, of, of course, but almost 41% of their population, it's not like there's a rich country and then uh, what we are doing over here is right, but I don't know how they manage their debt, but our patients are more uh, are different. Two other terms I'd like to introduce over here. This is introduced, Lancet, it's frequently covered by the WHO called the catastrophic health expenditure and the impoverizing health expenditure that's happening. The first category is when patients spend more than 30% of their family earnings on getting themselves treated. And the second category is where they're already poor. And these poor people actually, do, they sell whatever they have to take health care, okay? And if they push further, the dark uh, part of uh, the second circle that you're seeing, they will not come to you for follow-up. What Dr. Talwar was mentioning, you're going to lose them for follow-up. So there's a large category, they accept blindness because they no longer have money to take care of themselves. And this is a reality and we must address this also. What about the penalty? Like I said, there's something that we're also incurring other than just the financial burden. So there are I mean, four categories that I'd like to categorize it and skill, we're losing skill. Our thinking is not what it should have been. I mean, when that money factor is taken away, are we applying ourselves very well? And is it actually inhibiting further progress? What's the effect on skill acquisition? Uh, I'm sure that any of the residents over here in training would not have much of an answer to what the questions that I put up over there. And essentially, I, I fear that laser would also re reach an existential crisis like skeletal buckling is essentially because the companies are pushing these medications uh, so strongly. And to just highlight what I'm saying, this was a review article published in IJO in 2016. And I was aghast to see this photograph or this picture was uh, picture given there as an example of focal laser. And I'm sorry to tell you that this cannot be considered a good focal laser. You see the amount of scarring that you're introduced into the macular area, and this is definitely not a good laser. And if a review article can do this, I, I mean, I only see what importance is being given to how to train the younger generation to do a good laser. Now, these were images of 2003 when we did not have anti vegf this was the father of one of our uh, colleagues, faculty in another department. This took us multiple sessions to treat. Now it's completely cleared. And you may just wonder if there are actually laser scars. I'll, uh, I'll, can I take a few more minutes? Uh, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Yeah, so see these fine scars, you can not see it on the fundus image. Okay, and actually a good macular laser is one where the scars are not easily visible. Another patient over here, now this patient, the usual tendency is you're seeing macular edema, you're seeing proliferation to go ahead and inject. But look at the location of the proliferation, so close to the arcade. And in this situation, if you inject an anti-VEGF, you will convert a medical case into a surgical case. And here again, no anti-VEGF was given. You do your laser and then not, not only the proliferation, but you also see the macular edema regressing. Okay, so you need to individualize, like again what Dr. Talwar was mentioning, don't randomly inject in these cases. It's again very sad uh, when, when we have discussions, at the moment you see macular edema, we just say, it's going anti vegf they, they will just give him, I mean you choose from whatever you want, there's no discussion on whether it's a transudative edema, it's an exudative edema, it's a combination of both. It's important to distinguish because transudative edema, patients with nef uh, nephropathy, patients with cardiac ailment, they tend to have dependent edema which is largely transudative. So in these situations, you get the systemic situation under control and it tends to resolve. So you should not randomly inject without actually analyzing what kind of an edema you're dealing with. Now, here again, I'm just uh, managing one patient now. This patient unfortunately was managed uh, by one of our own residents, trained residents. For the past two years, he's been given intravitreal injections for proliferative diabetic retinopathy. He's not been lasered even once. Now he's come back, come to us with vitreous hemorrhage in both eyes. Like that's why I say that you've learned something, 
but there is so much that is when you uh, that you earn giving an injection you fail to carry forward and protect your patient and that's something that should not be happening i discussed this in the morning so i'll skip this on the natural pro, uh, natural history of branch vein occlusion and again when you see obvious sclerosis vessel at the macular area there's macular ischemia these patients no amount of injections going to help them so please please don't tell them every four weekly injection and this is what i was saying in the uh, brower study there's no citation at all they just say surface hemorrhages intraretinal hemorrhages cause toxicity but i would like to see a citation there's no citation at all and see what they say but the extent and timing of permanent vision loss from edema is unknown but they clearly recommend early injection when they clearly are saying they never they don't know what timeline it can cause permanent damage how can you even say that you go ahead and inject early now these are spontaneous resolutions you could see 2003 some of my patients that we followed up and they've resolved spontaneously okay this is later on this is in the initial another patient again okay 2003 spontaneous resolution now this is a typical tributary vein occlusion and like i men mentioned 90% will resolve without any kind of a treatment but the present guidelines would say go ahead and inject what about loss of critical thinking now i said look at the inclusion criteria what happened to the fellow i we are all talking about drcr.net but not a single report will tell you what happened to the fellow i 70% of diabetic macular edema is symmetric they have significant edema in the other eye and what happens to the other eye i do not know one of the co-authors of the article published happened to be uh, in the boardroom with chief uh, a few years ago i happened to be seated next to him and then i asked him what happened to the fellow i why is there no data on the fellow i the only answer that i got it was not a part of their protocol now we keep them on a high pedestal and you cannot expect them to tell you that they did not want to know what is happening to the fellow eye in a condition that is so symmetric and that could and because the reason i want fellow eye is what if the fellow eye how did they treat the fellow eye was it the same injection did it resolve in the natural course of the condition but we have no answers to that and almost all the authors will give you some financial disclosure but does it actually absolve them of any study bias okay they're just telling you there's more bias likely to be there so just declaring a financial disclosure actually means nothing uh, again emphasized there's less than 6 by 60 there less than 10 cases in each of these groups so extending the results to less than 6 by 60 again will not not have much of a value the person that is looking at his watch so I, i'll just rush through the last last few slides and, and other the funny thing that you see is in the sham group the sham group has the maximum amount of iritis now why should a sham injection patient have iridocyclitis or iritis so something is not gelling over here and once you have something coming out like this you should also question the other data that's coming out of a study and this is from the bravo study now i i mentioned that that there's a possibility that excessive vegf suppression is actually causing neurotoxicity this is something that i would like to assert there are uh, i mean reports earlier reports but nobody likes to highlight this possibility now you're looking at vegf inhibition vegf inhibition uh, i'll be happy if somebody picks up something other than vegf inhibition in all these hexagons that have okay so there is something called pre vegf i mean uh, there's it's not discussed but one thing that i'm very interested in can there be pre vegf inhibition the reason we need pre vegf inhibition is that is only when you can actually have a more protracted effect of any drug and we say pre vegf we i mean it was uh, i think dr pandian mentioned about the hypoxia inhibition factor and the nitric oxis, oxide synthetase now why are companies not focusing over here the moment you hit the pre vegf pathway i think all the anti vegf drugs will not have much of a value so that's something that the youngsters i would like them to uh, consider is to work on pre vgf inhibition these are my last few slides now why isn't bevacizumab why can't our dcgi take a stand and say we approve how much more evidence do we actually need the only thing that's happening with avistin is the fact that we're giving them as clusters the injections are being given as clusters so we are having cluster infections a cluster endophthalmitis so you stop giving avistin as uh, in clusters so you're going to stop the cluster endophthalmitis that's one of the biggest reasons i think there is so much of a problem with uh, with 
Okay, this is from a more uh, recent study, okay, from the RO 2018. See what they say. They studied 7 lakh. They had 7 lakh injections of bevacizumab, around 2 lakh with uh, Lucentis and 1.8 lakh injections with Aflibercept. And what they found was with uh, Avestin, it was 0.03%. With uh, Lucentis, it was 0.4%, 0.04%. And with Aflibercept, it was 0.03%. Zero three eight percent. So they very clearly said that the odds of endophthalmitis is lower with Avestin. Okay, of course these were all pre-filled syringes. So Avestin is not a bad drug. It's only that the companies do not want it to be sanctioned for use because then all their earnings and apparently the pharma companies are earning profits almost twenty-five to thirty percent every year and obviously they're doing it in this manner so i'm not very convinced that in the long term if we are actually benefiting patients by repeatedly treating them with uh, uh, with these costly drugs and uh, it's also suppressing our look into other aspects of uh, patient care yeah thank you all so much and i think i took a lot of time <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thank uh, you, thank Pradeep. you. This uh, type of lecture is required for the residents. So I here remind me of uh, Professor L.P. Agarwal, who took the first lecture. We, Dr. Talwar, was there. We have into humanity and ethics. Dr. Talwar may not be remember. And our first lecture was on Gita. And we took a strike. We did 15 days strike. We will not study humanity. So that was the. So that was the Dr. L.P. Agarwal, who thought of the future. Okay, what will happen in the future generation? So now the MCI has introduced slowly the ethics, humanity, all these things. Unless you change, now director also using the word consciousness. Because I am going in a meeting. He said, you decide your consciousness. So how consciousness can be built up? We will take some other lecture. Once your consciousness is built up, you will not do mistake. Because so many things are happening here. So consciousness, how to build up that requires another set of teaching and learning. It cannot be in the medical college, which you will learn. Because many of the people, many people are trying. The Professor Bijlani, you may not be remembering, from physiology professor. Dr. Mahajan from RP Center, you may not have remembered. They have left the institute because the institute people, uh, some of them were ready to change their consciousness, all these things. So Dr. Talwar, anything Dr. Talwar? Because you have gone for my, well, I mean, some other reason, I'm saying. Sorry, no, ah. so, so how do you think a practitioner and uh, yeah, staying so here? So, see, the thing is, I showed you in the last slide, all the three drugs work. Yes. The importance is not the drug, but the, the need of giving the drug on time. Now, what happens if economics results in a patient not being able to take the drug, then it, whichever the drug, it will fail. So, in fact, one of, I told you one of, my, uh, one of the things that I tell the patient is that you're going to need this treat for AMD, is that you're going to need this on a regular basis. But I also tell them that the monthly, the yearly cost of the treatment, you have to calculate. Because if, if, if you are not to cal calculate the cost of one injection, in fact, the first thing I tell them is that if, I, if you can in afford only one injection, then you can put that money into a waste paper basket. It's as good as that. Because it's not going to give you any sustained effect. So only if you can afford the treatment for an year, that means you know, you, you know whatever you are earning, you can afford the yearly cost of the treatment. Then only you should go for it. That's number one. The number two, then I say we check whether this cost if it's not affordable for you, then you have to go wherever it's avail uh, avail available at an affordable cost. So, for example, in Ames, you can get uh, Avastin for 1500 Now, I can't give it. First, I don't give Avastin because of the risk of cluster endophthalmitis. So, I will send that patient. Now, this is where uh, you need to have your conscience there. Not that you say, I will injection, I will see what will if the patient cannot afford your treatment, send him somewhere where he can get affordable treatment. Similarly, you talk of Ozodex versus Tramsalone. I think Sarita was talking about why more Tramsalone. Tramsalone works, works. but it higher works. risk. Now, you have to balance the risk with the benefit. A person who says, I can't afford 40,000 rupees for an Ozodex, let him go for Tramsalone, but then the follow-up will need to be a little more intensive to intensive. make sure you don't lose the patient to glaucoma. 
So you, it is in today's world, what I say in all my lectures is, no patient should be deprived of the treatment. But the treatment has to be tailored to that patient. patient. A patient who that says, is why I, I word you tailor made approach. So says, many things has to be considered. Yeah. So now like patient, I remember once upon a time uh, for IOL, he has to sell his home. So residents say, "Kate, arey bi koi bi IOL lagalo." But we were at that time, ne, ki let's lay na. Wo bichara gari baad mein apni jhuggi bech ke leke aaya. So that is why you have to be very sympathetic. That will come uh, when you will interact with Doctor Talwar or uh, Pradeep or Parija. I mean, sympathetic, like-minded people, thinking people, and. So, for example, aflibercept Next. may be the best drug for a particular kind of patient. A patient with vision less than, say, 618, 624, a, a thickness, a, a macular thickness of more than 400 micron, yes. But there, if the patient cannot afford it, that's not the alternative. The alternative is adding either bevacizumab or ranibizumab to laser. You'll get the same decrease in macular thickness. So the point is, you have lots of things available. You have to tailor your treatment to the patient and to the patient's pocket also. So both the things need to be taken care of. The second thing is, we have got used to accepting studies without seeing uh, what do they really say. Yes, example, that's why I have not mentioned of the many of these studies. What was talking about BRVO study. Yeah. The BRVO study, the natural history showed if you take the patients after three months, not before three months, after three months, still one third of them will respond spontaneously without treatment. I agree. Now that means, what about the number of patients who would have responded within the first three months? Mm. So that is why I said that 80% figure means at least 50% of your patients needed no treatment. Now it would it be fair to say I gave a ranibizumab, spent the patient spent 25,000, 30,000 bucks and say you became okay. Did he become okay? Or did he only make you financially okay? And that's the whole issue. If the patient, don't push a patient into doing something that is unnecessary. For, for the same thing for diabetic macular edema. Diabetic macular edema and ARMD are not the same condition. They are two different, different conditions. Completely different. different conditions. But what is happening? The mindset is anti VEGF, anti VEGF, anti VEGF. No. Anti-VEGF for AMD is not anti-VEGF for DME, which is not anti-VEGF for BRVO. BRVO. Again, we combine BRVO and CRV. I'm shocked to see all lectures given in most of these conferences are BRVO and CRV is put as one RV. One art. But RVO is completely different, different when you're talking of BRVO and when you're talking of CRVO. They have completely different approach to management. CRVO will make the guy blind. BRVO will virtually never make a patient blind. So why should you be aggressive in treating BRVO? So these are the things which we don't talk about. Unfortunately, Cheche minute, Athat minute ki talks me, these things no, can't we be will not discuss. Okay. Okay, so um, now we will move on to uh, Dr. Shaurya Azad. He will be talking about uh, when not to give. This is also a very important component of when not to give anti VEGF. He is an uh, associate professor in uh, ophthalmology in our unit. And so please, uh, Shaurya. Okay, thank you, sir. So while we're speaking of when not to give, I think all of you have got a uh, quite clear indication of when to give the injections. And so I'll be dividing my presentation into two, basically the same indications, but such certain scenarios in which you probably might not get a good response as some of the speakers have spoken. And the second one would be the indications which, um, uh, like patients who have been advised anti vegfs outside elsewhere, by either have taken anti but they are not exactly an indication and it is based on OCT findings that one might have seen at that point of time. So as we were discussing vein occlusions, we see a BRVO, we see macular edema, but what is important is to see what is the perfusion of the macula. If we are seeing that there is any distortion of the FAZ, any irregularity of the FAZ as well as increase in the size of the FAZ, then there is signs that there is macular macular ischemia and then these will not be good responders to anti vegf so probably anti vegf may not work likewise uh, as uh, talwar sir was also speaking that sometimes adding laser with anti vegf is beneficial so if you're having history of multiple injections 
and the edema is coming back again and again then in certain situations you probably want to do an FFA to look for all these peripheral CNP areas which need to be knocked off so that you get decrease in the leakage and better uh, visual outcomes likewise as again CRV and BRV both are different and especially a non perfused CRVO again macular ischemia which is more pronounced when you see an OCTA and in such cases again they are poor responders for any anti vegf therapy the edema might go down but it will not translate into visual gain again in cases of uh, diabetes uh, i would say that uh, macular ischemia is very much uh, diagnosable on uh, clinically so you can see in this picture there are there are sclerosed vessels there is a featureless retina in the center and uh, these are uh, clinical indicators that you might be having macular ischemia you don't need to go in with an FFA also in such cases the visual acuity will not be corresponding to the fundus changes and such cases are again not going to respond to anti vegf therapy uh, since the advent of OCT we are having different signs on OCT and uh, and as you can see that some of these layers that are there the uh, disorganization of these retinal inner layers if they are seen cleanly as you can see in the uh, upper right hand corner then they have got a good prognosis and ones in which you get a disorganized retinal inner layers these are pro poor prognosis again these will not be a good candidate for anti vegf therapy then in some cases you might see these uh, uh, exudates trickling down to the subretinal space and they kind, kind of settle at the fovea and even though if there is some amount of edema and leakage on FFA they are bad candidates for getting anti vegf and since we know that diabetes is just not a retinopathy it's also vitropathy all these changes that even uh, Rajpal sir was saying that VMT taught highlight ERMs are more suited and response to a surgical intervention than an anti vegf therapy moving on to CNV in cases where you're getting multiple injections and you still see these vessels on OCTA and what you need to look is on the OCT that there are some cystic spaces but they aren't cystic spaces they are areas of loss of tissue and along with outer retinal tubulations probably they do not give very good prognosis and injections may not work in such situations so if you have a case where you have a tall PED again there is you, you know, run a high risk of having an RPE tear and these are having you know larger linear dimension taller and of longer duration and they are at high risk of getting these RP tears which carries a poor prognosis if you have drusons which have now become confluent over a period of time and there are drusonoid detachments but they do not have any CNV beneath it they can be observed closely but uh, still they are not uh, going to be treated with anti vegf in a myopic patient if you see this small bleed that is just uh, in you know in, uh, temporal to the uh, just beneath the fovea and if you see on the OCT you again see this bleed which is there in the uh, fine thin bleed that is there on the OCT and if you see this uh, OCTA there are no vessels so again this is just a bleed that might be there in the myo and you don't need to do anything for this patient some vascular disorders uh, again if you're having decrease in vision in a patient which is having complaining of headache and you are seeing this flame shaped hem ridges and a macular star then you're thinking about something like a hypertensive retinopathy so do check the BP and send the patient to the physician this is a just another case of uh, diabetic retinopathy in which the patient presented with uh, in, um, uh, not good systemic control and just by systemic control and good BP you can see that there is the edema has resolved again if you see a case in which you are seeing a neurosensory detachment and a PED and when you do an FFA you see this ink blot leak again you are dealing with the case of uh, CSR and if there are no CNVs then there is no requirement of giving any anti vegf uh, in this case if you are seeing a grayish reflect just temporal to the fovea and you are seeing on OCT uh, loss of tissue and you are getting some staining that is there on the FFA well this is not an indication for treatment as there is no CNV on the OCTA and uh, this is just a MACTEL which is having uh, some amount of staining, late staining. Some inflammatory condition if the patient has undergone a cataract surgery, has got a, uh, edema that is coming around about after a month or six weeks and you can see on the FFA there is a petaloid pattern with a hot disc then it is because of the inflammation it's not going to respond to your anti-VEGF it is 
well, you can give topical NSAIDs. Again, if you are getting a young patient who is having this sort of an OCTA and one might think of giving an anti vegf but you should look at the anterior segment and the anterior uh, retrodental cells, it might be a case of intermediate uveitis and probably steroids is the way to go here. Similar again cases, multiple NSDs, pooling you are seeing, you are seeing these uh, NSDs on the OCT as well with this fibrin subretinally, then again these are a uh, case of a BKH and this will respond to steroids. Degenerative disorders like uh, a young patient having this uh, uh, spoke wheel pattern on the uh, clinically and having on OCT these pillar like columns, then this is a uh, case of uh, retinoschisis and not exactly any macular edema, so not a good uh, case to give. Uh, there, there's no indication to give actually anti vegf Again, similarly, a uh, case with RP having a cystoid macular edema will not be indicated to give an anti vegf And again, a patient who's having this uh, vitelliform material which is hyperfluorescent on FFA and you can see it on the OCT as well and there's no CNV on OCTA, then it is just a form of adult onset vitelliform dystrophy and then it doesn't require any anti vegf therapy. So to conclude, it is better to identify specific scenarios where the anti vegf may work and we should not treat the OCT, but we should treat the pathology. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we would like to thank our guest speakers and present them up with a plaque of our appreciation. I would request uh, Professor Pradeep to give a plaque to Professor Sarita Berry, please. Professor Rajpal to please present a plaque to uh, Dr. Dinesh Talwar. Mm -hmm. Dr. Rajpal, uh, Dr. Talwar please. Mm -hmm. Dr. Parijat, please can you do the honors for Dr. Dipinder? Thank you very much, everyone. We will not take a break because we have already exceeded too much time. The running tea is on on the seventh floor. In case anyone desires, you can go and have tea. But we will go on and move with the next session. It is on challenging cases and for which I invite Professor Talwar and myself for the... Uh, no, no, sir, please sit. And I invite the speakers. The first case... First case is by Dr. Shir. Okay, I think like many people have moved out, so okay, let's take a five minute break. But please come back in five minutes. We are already quite short of time. Yeah. Quickly have a cup of tea and maybe a washroom break.
Yes, he was our ex senior resident and now is faculty at Pondicherry. So we welcome you, Shreyas. Please go ahead. Slides, please. Can we have the slides? After uh, having very good uh, discussion since morning, we'll have uh, short case presentations. So uh, now I'll be presenting a case of a 69-year-old lady who presented with blurring of vision in the left eye for the past two months. She was recently diagnosed uh, with diabetes mellitus, however, it was she was uh, systemically well controlled. There were no other comorbidities. Her best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6 by 9 and in the left eye 6 by 36. Anterior segment examination was within normal limits. Fundus examination in the right eye was normal. However, left eye showed uh, presence of uh, these periphobial hard x rays with retinal thickening. Both eye there was no evidence of diabetic retinopathy. So now we were wondering where these hard x rays uh, came from. So on, uh, again on careful examination, what we could notice is that uh, the retinal uh, thickening was extending along the papillomacular bundle. So further uh, examination showed that there was presence of this uh, suspicious orange red lesion uh, superior temporal to the disc. So, OCT also confirmed the presence of retinal thickening along this area. So, further OCT revealed that there was presence of uh, subfovial and uh, intraretinal uh, serosanguinous fluid along with uh, schisis at uh, multiple uh, levels. The scan corresponding to the suspicious lesion so showed the presence of an oval structure which was extending from RNFL to the outer nuclear layer with hyperreflective uh, wall and presence of uh, variably reflective internal contents. So, fluorescein angiography was further carried out uh, which uh, showed the uh, presence of a peripapillary hyperfluorescent lesion with uh, minimal leak. So, a diagnosis of uh, left eye exudative retinal capillary macroneurism was made. So, this patient we uh, gave uh, intravitreal avastin injection, however response was poor at 3 weeks. So, we further counseled the patient to receive uh, further anti vegf injections for which the patient did not agree. So, we decided to carry out uh, focal laser treatment of this aneurysmal lesion. So, at uh, 6 weeks post laser, there was uh, uh, clinically resolution of edema with organization of hard x rays and on OCT we could see that uh, there was complete resolution of the exudative aneurysmal lesion with significant decrease of both intraretinal and subretinal fluid. So, what are these anomalous exudative complexes? So, they are known by various names like retinal capillary macroneurysms, whatever you call exudative vascular anomalous complexes, <coughs> the uh, tell caps and macro micro aneurysms. They are usually isolated large vascular aneurysmal lesions of unknown origin. So, basically we can see here, they do not have any connection with uh, major retinal vessels, hence the term capillary macro aneurysms. So, they are initially considered perifovial. Uh, and hence the term uh, PVAC was used and they were also considered idiopathic not associated with uh, any other systemic or ocular diseases. So what uh, was later found that they can occur in other locations other than the peripheral area. So and uh, they can occur in uh, patients with other retinal vascular diseases like diabetic retinopathy and vascular occlusions. So we have a small case series of uh, such patients. What we found that in uh, Many of our patients, we just did observation where we attributed that uh, this uh, RCMs were not contributing to macular edema. In some of the patients <laughs> where actually it was contributing to edema, we the anti of treatment did not work that very well. And hence, in these cases, focal laser did really very good. So, we went on to the literature. Literature also says that uh, both uh, anti of agents and uh, focal treatment can be given. However, anti of treatments need to be given repeatedly and focal laser does best in these patients. So, this was a collection of uh, various case reports by one of these uh, authors where they showed that in most of these cases the anti of did not do well and when they did focal laser there was um, a nice anatomical resolution. So, to summarize these retinal capillary macroisms can be picked up with good clinical observation and also on OCT. They may be exudative or non exudative non-exudative lesions can be observed. Clinically, they appear as red lesions with surrounding uh, retinal hemorrhages. FFA may show hyperfluorescence with minimal leak or sometimes they can be hypofluorescence when there is block due to retinal hemorrhages. 
OCT will show a presence of an oval structure with uh, hyper reflective wall and variably reflective contents. The, there is no standard treatment for uh, these aneurysms because we do not have any large uh, uh, case series. So, whatever the literature says, if anti VEGF injection is used, multiple injections might be needed. This option can be considered in uh, lesions which are very close to the phobia. Otherwise, they respond very well to focal laser. Thank you. Thank you, Shreyas. Uh, very interesting case. Can you just put your fundus photo back? So, just for the audience, uh, whenever you see a unilateral case like this, even if it's a diabetic patient, it, diabetic retinopathy is not the only diagnosis and you must consider other alternatives, especially if it is a unilateral. And like he has showed you, this is Slide a uh, diagnosis to be looked for, anomalous venous vascular complexes and uh, by the size it's larger than 100 microns so it has been labeled as a macro aneurysm technically and like he said uh, these are best treated by laser but the main problem occurs if it is very very periphobial where you cannot do the focal laser unfortunately response to anti vegfs although he has described studies giving multiple ones is not very good so alternatives tried in such cases may be you can try a focal sub threshold laser or earlier PDT has also been described, but uh, probably if it is just mild edema, better left alone and we cannot, yes. cannot do much. But whenever you can laser, that is the treatment Best of option. choice. Had this patient been a younger patient and maybe a little less hard exudates, not a complete star like that, only in a focal area, another DD which I would have thought of would have been a paraphobial telangiectasia type 1. Anything else? Uh, actually, uh, when you see them in diabetics, now they are not, now this these kind of lesions are actually being classified as um, as telangiectatic uh, capillaries. Tel they are no longer called uh, macro aneurysms. Um, to actually to differentiate them from um, from patients who have uh, large uh, like micro aneurysms. Uh, if you call them macro macro aneurysms, it becomes a retinal macro aneurysm. So nobody, so that's a different category altogether. So, th so when you have this combination of this kind of lesion, and when you on an OCT, when you see uh, the lesion with a um, with a hyper uh, reflective wall with inner um, inner area of hyper reflectivity with variable hyper reflectivity. Actually, what happens is. Uh, it's actually filled with fibrin material in the diabetics now specifically it's actually best found on ICG the best way to categorize it is on ICG on on what happens is that on uh, fluorescein angiography you they will all look like uh, they will all look like the micro uh, like hyperfluorescent points but when you do the ICG this area will the micro aneurysms will wash out in the late phase. These will stain in the late phase because of the fibrin material. So that is a classic way of diagnosing them. And an alternative method is, uh, uh, you had one or two other uh, OCTs which had a, yes. no, which had, there's one which had a very nice uh, wall and all. This you, one yeah, this one is, see now if you see inside, it's not just hyperfluorescence, uh, hyperfluorescent, nah, wait, 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 this, one, this one also is very good. Uh, is hypofluorescent uh, with some hyperfluorescent material. That hyperfluorescent material is usually fibrin material. And that is why on, on ICG it stains uh, in the late phase. And uh, this is one combination. You can do an ICG and you can do uh, OCT to confirm. The other thing which has been tried, people have tried infrared reflectance. Infrared reflectance also shows the lesion up. Uh, and if you there you will see the central area will be hyperfluorescent and the surrounding area will be hypofluorescent so if you see that along with this OCT picture you know you're dealing with a telangiectatic vessel they are now called telangiectatic telangiectatic vessels in uh, diabetic macular edema and the treatment is of choice is uh, a focal macular laser when it's not in a diabetic macular edema you will actually call them PVAC so basically that is what you have yes, sir. For the senior residents, uh, a 65-year-old lady with such some hard exudates at the posterior pole, can you tell me any other differentials which would come to your mind? So PCV you have to think of and then there is something called peripapillary pachychoroid. So that also you can have, it's like a pachychoroid with a CSC like a picture but you start getting these hard exudates 
uh, in the peripathy. Yeah, but when you see this, this is only as far as the photograph is concerned. But the moment you do the OCT, this is a retinal change. A PCV is a sub-retinal change. So you know that you're not dealing with the same condition. So you will differentiate it. So e even on a color photograph, if you see, if it's looking more red, then it's not likely. Then it's a retinal. If, it's, if it is a little deep kind of um, color, then you know it's coming from the choroid. So then you know you're dealing with PCV. So that's the other thing. And this can be uh, asymptomatic. Just uh, one week back, I picked up a patient who had on one eye um, an occult CNVM and the other eye had this. So uh, you can have that as an incidental finding. Patient is 6'6", six, six, no, no, uh, no changes, nothing uh, available, no, no heart exudates, just yeah. the lesion. So that can happen also. Chalo. Thank you. Next. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, there is a question. Sir, we actually tried in, we don't have any much experience, we tried in one of our patients, even steroids didn't work that well. Okay. Yeah, I'll just add one uh, comment over here. These are all mature blood vessels. Okay, yes. so anti vegfs will never act on mature with the pericyte covered is still intact. So there's no point trying repeated anti -VEGF. It's known that they're not going to act. Yeah? I welcome Kaushik. Kaushik, he uh, was also a senior resident with us and now is working in Calcutta. And again, a prolific vitreoretinal surgeon now. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, all our teachers and uh, junior students and senior students. This is a pleasure to uh, present here. Actually, it, it has been a long time since we presented here. I think it is uh, around uh, uh, eight years, eight years, eight nine years. Thank you for inviting me. So I will discuss a patient with intraocular inflammation. Uh, this was a 72-year-old female who had controlled systemic hypertension and hypothyroidism. She had history of four intravital injections in the right eye. And uh, uh, she had dimness of vision in both eyes. Bisquieted visual acuity was 6 by 60 in the right eye and 6 12 in the left eye. Intraocular pressures were uh, normal and in there was nucleus sclerosis. So she, when she visited, there was the, uh, this was uh, the findings. Ra in the right eye, there was sclerosis vessel, which is not very prominent, and there was subretinal bleed here. Uh, these are fluorescent uh, FFF images, which show that there is, was an old uh, BRVO with capillary non-perfusion area. There was no new vascularization, and there was CNVM. So this patient uh, on OCT, there was chronic fluid in the right eye, and uh, there was uh, subretinal uh, sub fluid in the left eye. So this patient received multiple injections and uh, then she also developed full thickness macular hole for which she uh, had cataract surgery first and then PPV with island peeling and SF6 injection. Then again the CNPM recurred and we, uh, she received multiple anti vgv injections. It was after the last PGNX injection on 28th September 2022, she developed this kind of picture. This was the pre-injection uh, pre picture is on the left side. and. On the right side, this was post-injection picture. The central, there are multiple uh, artifacts because of the, uh, there was in the fundus camera. So there was, uh, the left eye had uh, worsened to 618 from uh, pre-injection 69. There was an, uh, CBR AC cells rea AC reaction, but there was no hypobion, vitreous cells were uh, seen, and there was severe vitreitis, but we could not uh, see any <coughs> evident vasculitis or uh, hemorrhages. Patient denied uh, fluorescein angiogram. So, a presumptive diagnosis of prolocision uh, related intraocular in, uh, inflammation was um, uh, diagnosed and we uh, treated her with uh, topical prednisolone frequently, topical atro uh, atropine and IVMP 3 doses 1 gram and then prednisolone 1, 1 milligram per kg per day for 14 days. The response took time to uh, come, uh, but she eventually improved up to 6-12 after one week and after three weeks she was 6-9 and we are avoiding patient next since then. My questions to the esteemed panelist will be how to avoid such kind of uh, reaction in patients and how severe can it be and what are the other management options other than tropical steroid and uh, IVMP or oral steroid and how should we recommend, uh, how should we follow up a patient who are getting uh, uh, and are there any adjustments which are needed for intravitreal injection in vitrectomy Okay, I'll answer your last question first. 
Okay, uh, about anti VEGFs in uh, uh, vitrectomized eyes because actually there are a lot of myths about this. If you go into the literature, you'll find that the uh, this uh, conclusion that uh, the effectiveness of anti VEGFs in vitrectomized eyes is less came from studies on the uh, clearance of VEGF, not the clearance of anti VEGF. And what they found was that VEGF cleared out faster and they extrapolated that because VEGF cleared out faster and anti-VEGF with the same size more or less, therefore anti-VEGF would also clear off faster. Unfortunately, it's not true or fortunately it's not true. So, so that subsequent studies showed actually this is not, it doesn't happen like that. Now actually you have a better chance then because the VEGF is going to go off faster the anti vegf does not go off faster somehow the anti vegf clearance is not different in vitrectomized and non vitrectomized eyes and if i had not actually reviewed this entire literature i would be roaming around with the same um, you know the same um, myth in my mind so so this is number 1 so it doesn't and incidentally practically speaking I have not felt that I am needing to give the anti VEGF at 15 days just because it's a vitrectomized eye. It doesn't happen. It lasts for this more or less the same uh, duration. If it's not acting, it's because it's the disease is like that, not because that patient is vitrectomized. So this is one. So this is your last. Yes, and the, is there the second a thing is what? Dose ka koi change karna hai ki? No, no change, no change of dose is required in vitrectomized eyes. But if you have a patient who's a fake ache, then Ozodex is contraindicated. Or even if the patient has an iris fixated IOL, then also Ozodex is contraindicated. So this is the, the in, in uh, vitrectomized eyes with silicone oil. Okay. Uh, ideally, um, I would not give more than one third the dose. Now the reason I can tell, now why am I saying this? We've actually done studies of the volume of the retro silicone oil space in eyes which have silicone oil, in which are uh, uh, VR surgery eyes with silicone oil. We were actually, it was not done for this purpose, it was done because we were uh, uh, evaluating the concentration of uh, ciprofloxacillin in the retro silicone oil space and we did it as part of that. So we used to pick up the, uh, all the fluid from the retro silicone oil space. And I can tell you, and all these cases were done by me personally, and I can tell you that usually the amount of fluid is 0.7 ml or so. Okay. Sometimes it can be more if it's underfill, it can go up to 1.2, but usually it's 0 0.7, 0 0.8 ml. So that's approximately one fourth of the dose. You want to go a little higher, we know that uh, the Harbor trial showed us two milligrams is also safe. So agar tumne, um, instead of giving point uh, the the whole uh, dose you give one third you are very safe because one fourth is what is actually the space which is left over there and one third tak jane mein koi major issue nahi hai. So effectively in a silicon oil filled eye you need to reduce the dose, the, the amount and incidentally people keep saying how can we make it 0 0.3. You know you have 0 0.5 in 0 0.05. All you need to do is take 0 0.3 for taking 0.3, you need to take 0 0.03 ml. You want to take, you want to go down further. You take 0 0.02 ml, and you are taking 2 milligram. So you can take with the same concentration. Though for for the studies which were done, they made 0.3 milligram in 0 0.05 and all. But we don't. It doesn't matter. Practically, in your clinical uh, practice, you can just decrease the dose by that. So that's the other thing. So you don't need to decrease the dose as a routine in a vitrectomized eye, only in a silicone oil filled eye. The third thing is about brolicizumab follow-up. I am scared of brolicizumab because you never know when it may come up as a, this thing, a reaction. But remember, it's not that it comes up after the first reaction. It can come up after the second or third reaction. And it doesn't come up on the first two, three days. It usually comes up somewhere later beyond the first week with 10 days 15 days so you need to keep a watch on these patients so so anyway for all my anti vegfs i see them day 1 day 7 and 4 weeks in this case i i normally try to tell the patient come once at 2 weeks also
if he can. If he can't, then I tell, tell him if, if you see any increase in floaters. Now, not that if you see any decrease in vision, because vision change may be a later uh, symptom. Even if you see any increase in floaters, please come and show. So this is how to avoid. How to avoid inflammation in paralysis? Of no, you can't. You have to pray. You learn how to pray better. <laughs> Hello, next, next, the next. I think a nice case because this is what we are worried about with this drug and what he has shown us has raised, it just raises more questions than answers because when it will happen, he has given so many injections and suddenly it happened after this fifth or sixth pagenex, I think. Pradeep I think. can answer something on this so the, he's given a lot of injections. Yeah, I think Dr. Pradeep, Pradeep will, sorry, will give you time because you have a talk uh, on this discussion this on topic this topic itself. Ah, the only thing next. one I want to say is, was it necessary to give a pulse steroid in such an elderly patient or maybe just an oral steroid could have managed? Otherwise, this is the management, systemic steroids as well as topical steroids. So we Shall go ahead with the next, next case. Dr. Ayushi, please. The one I know. I think Good afternoon, uh, other uh, faculty, you. esteemed panelists and uh, delegates. So this is a case of a 70-year-old gentleman. He had presented with diminution of vision in both the eyes, which was progressive uh, reduction in vision for the past two years. And it was more in the left eye than the right eye. And it was associated with metamorphopsia. There was no history of pain or redness in the patient and it was not associated with any similar complaints in the past. And there was a history of anti-VEGF ILA injection two weeks prior to the presentation uh, with us. So patient had best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 18 in the right eye and 1 by 16 in the left eye. Pupus very active, anterior segment was within normal limits. Uh, on fundus examination of the right eye, there was a uh, media was clear with a cup disc ratio of 0.4 is to 1. There was a hypopigmented raised lesion at the macula suggestive of a neurosensory detachment with pigmentary changes present nasal to it. In the left eye, the patient had a hyperpigmented lesion at the macula, so there is some shadow because of cataract, and but there was associated subretinal fibrosis in the patient, suggestive of old CNVM. We went ahead to do an OCT. OCT revealed uh, uh, fibrovascular uh, pigment epithelial detachment with subretinal fluid with some drusen uh, deposits. The uh, choroidal thickness appeared to be normal. In the left eye, the patient had a scarred CNVM membrane. So we went ahead with a FFA and ICGA for the patient. There was some early hyperfluorescence in the choroidal phase in the FFA. And on ICGA, mid to late phase, there was a focal leakage present as marked by the blue arrow and with uh, packy vessels seen on ICGA in the peripapillary area so with late leakage on FFA in, this, in the same area. So FFA ICG of the left eye showed a very well-defined uh, neovascular membrane present in the nasal aspect with leakage suggestive of mature CNVM membrane. So when, but we could not identify such a membrane in the, could not identify such a membrane in the right eye. So we did a OCTA. So we did a OCTA for the right eye, but we could not identify any neovascular membrane in the outer retina. This is just projection from this deep capillary plexus and no membrane was identified in the OCTA. So differentials for our patient was age-related macular degeneration, neovascular AMD. So suggestive features were age of the patient, presence of drusen, absence of uh, presence of response with anti-VEGF, CNVM in the other eye, but there was lack of leakage or presence of identifiable CNVM in this eye and could be peripapillary pachycoroid disease and the presence of pachy vessel, early hyperfluorescence on FFA, leakage on ICGA. But again, there was no evidence of thickened choroid on um, OCT or localized thickening of choroid even. Chronic CSC could also be one of the diagnoses, but there was no specific leakage on FFA. So we followed up the patient from that day, did not intervene. So on three weeks follow-up, the patient had an increase in size of the fibrovascular PED with presence of SRF. So intravitreal aflibicept was repeated for the patient. And this is when the patient followed up again after five weeks, the patient was again given an intravitreal aflibicept. Although the vision was maintained, there was still the, the presence of fibrovascular PED and SRF persisted. So uh, in January, the patient was injected with intravitreal brolucizumab. So on three weeks follow-up, after this, there was a significant reduction in the size of the pigment epithelial det detachment and the macular thickness. Uh, the patient was followed up and uh, one month, sorry, two months follow up post brolycizumab injection, the patient has a uh, maintained uh, structural outcome. So patient was again followed up and on four months follow up, the patient was had a recurrence of the in, uh, 
fibrovascular PED thickness. So patient was injected with brolucizumab again. Vision in all these cases did not vary that much. The more, there was more of a structural improvement that we had seen. So this is the latest follow-up for the patient. So, so now we are uh, injecting brolucizumab every 12 weeks, so 10 weeks. So we have a 70-year-old one-eyed patient. He is uh, requiring aplibercept four to five weeks and they were scarring the left eye. So we switched to brolucizumab, which provided a favorable interval in treatment. And also there is a, a angle of choroidal hyperpermeability that we're seeing in the patient. So switch with brolucizumab works because of its smaller um, uh, molecular weight. So higher molar dosage is injected into the, into the eye. There is high intraret Studies have shown a higher intraretinal, subretinal, sub-RP fluid reduction as well as anatomical outcome in terms of on OCT as, as well as increase in injection interval. Choroidal hyperpermeability is again an important thing that it is seen in, as hyperfluorescence in mid to late phase of ICGA. Also associated with punctate leakages that can be seen. We should differentiate it from drusen and um, Paki vessels are also seen with choroidal hyperpermeability. So there are certain studies that have shown presence of hyperpermeable choroid in different types of CNVM with AMD, PCV, RAP other types of CNVM and it is seen in a quite a large percentage of cases. Uh, CNVM can also exist with this hyperpermeability. Brolucizumab, although anti-VEGFs have shown to be less, uh, uh, anti-VEGF response is shown to be poorer in cases of hyperpermeable choro choroid in studies with PCV, but brolucizumab because of its higher binding capacity, smaller size, deeper penetration could have a small, stronger action. Um, there are certain studies which show the reduction in uh, subfoveal choroidal thickness reduction in brolucizumab cases. So questions for the panel is first of all, what is the most likely diagnosis that uh, everyone thinks of? Should hyperpermeable choroid be an indication for anti-VEGF therapy alone? And what is the preferred anti-VEGF and regimen of treatment? Thank you. Uh, let me just put this in perspective. Actually, why we are presenting this? So this is a one sort of one-eyed patient. Left eye is lost to a choroidal neovascular membrane. Right eye has a fibrovascular PED and subretinal fluid, where we cannot demonstrate a choroidal neovascular membrane by most of the modalities. The only thing which we are actually seeing is a stippled hyperfluorescence on fluorescein angiography because of RP disturbance, with an underlying large choroidal vessels in that peripapillary nasal area itself. So basically what we are seeing is just a choroidal hyperpermeability or some localized packy vessels causing a damage. Now since it's a one-eyed patient, the uh, SRF is progressively fluctuating. Uh, initially we did observe the patient for a while, but since the SRF is increasing, we cannot just sit back and say that we don't know what's happening. So we did try an anti-VEGF and what we just showed was that brolicizumab acted better. But again, it did not resolve the pathology totally, but it just acted better, at least anatomically, and we are just planning to maintain that anatomical benefit at maybe a four-month gap of the injection itself. But what we want to discuss is, what exactly is that fibrovascular PD? Is it a CNVM there, or it is just choroidal hyperpermeability, and should we be injecting in such cases, or should we just hold our hands? No, no, but you have a polyp, no? You had a polyp no, in no. your initial. There's no, def the no well defined, no. The, you show the ICG. ICG no, ICG just shows those prominent choroidal vessels, four, five vessels there. Can you just show the ICG? The initial ICG? Yes, sir. Yeah, just. So yeah, so there is a polyp there. No, I don't think those are well-defined. Uh, no, no, well-defined. The only one polyp is there. The rest are choroidal vessels which are thickened. Well, actually, they are not no, fitting not into all the criteria of polyps. Uh -huh. So, I. Uh, so what criteria do you want to look for? No, no. What is the late phase of that? What is the late phase of this? This is the late phase. No, no, so the late this is not a late phase. Okay, so according to sir, maybe it's a polyp, but see, what I felt was that these are just linear lines. To see for staining would be after 15 minutes. This is not 15 minutes. This is not mm. late phase. No. And in this phase, you can see these are three, four areas which are showing up, which could be polyps if you had taken them to the late phase. So effectively, you have a PCV lesion. And I the other, this thing, the only thing is that now, the, what you saying, OCT, go to the OCT. Mm -hmm. The OCT doesn't show double double layer vessel uh, uh, sign very clearly. Though it does show one relatively peak PED and the other irregular PED. So irregular PED with a 
double uh, with a, a relatively peak PED because more than 70 degrees is the angle considered for a peak PED. So this covers more than 70 degrees. The only thing is a double layer sign is not there. That is against it. Okay. Okay. Well, if we take it as a polyp, would you still keep injecting? If the fluid is there, you would have to keep injecting. Okay. So in my uh, but you are not treating you are not treating choroidal hyperpermeability. You are treating the you are treating the SRF, which is uh, basically there is a difference between what you are treating and especially if the SRF is responding to a particular treatment, then you need to continue it. If it was not responding, then I would actually put into a treat and extend category and and see what is the minimum number of injections with which it stabilizes. See, for example, if I didn't have brolicizumab with me, and like you showed, this is not going down further. Now, if it's not going down further, now you don't keep on injecting monthly. Now you decrease the number of injections. You you increase the interval between the injections so that the fluid should not increase. If you shifted to brolicizumab and you found the fluid go went away, like let's go to your. Yes, own, Yeah, so, so, I would, I would take it to the late phase, okay. In the late phase, the normal vessels would not be there. They would wash off. But if there is a polyp, they would be staining over there. And I'll t if you see this also, go back. Yes, sir. Actually, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so actually, if you see this area. So I would want to see the late phase of this and see whether they stain. If they stain, then I would think that this is a point. If it doesn't stain, if it all washes off completely, then I, then it's not a, then it's just, uh, the vessels are, uh, those way large vessels. So mm -hmm. this is one aspect. The second, the only thing which is going against at the moment is the, is the, is the OCT, where the, go to the OCT. Yes. Yeah, one second. Go back to the yeah. Let's even this. If you see the irregular uh, kind of OC, uh, 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 RP undulations, this is suggestive of a um, of a PCB. But one thing, incidentally, uh, uh, there's a recent um, study, 2021, where uh, the from the uh, Asian group they've done non ICG biomarkers of uh, of PCV this doesn't now, the, now the role of uh, of the uh, uh, branching vascular networks is when they are present they are not a diagnostic sign but their absence is so to answer you i not 100% sure because i can't see them clearly but i can also tell you something this is not a very good photograph the problem with all these lesions is on OCT if the quality, if you don't have the highest quality of your uh, OCTs, like the, you need a spectralist to, to differentiate these layers. You not pick up a, a, um, a layer in between this because the layer is between this and this, and you could miss that. So this is one problem there. So I would not, on an opto view, comment on a double layer sign. I would want to do a, um, a spectralist for that. So this is one problem. Huh? So this but is the problem with the MD. You can have uh, retina specialists disagreeing. Yeah, so I would disagreeing. still disagree with this. So don't worry. Don't worry. There is always disagreement. Yeah. Injection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, now yeah. one more thing. Even yeah. regardless of what it is, even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you have the right quality, you have the right quality. Even if you but if it is occult, I don't necessarily have to get an uh, a CNVM on my uh, on my uh, uh, um, on the OCTA, mm -hmm. okay? Because especially in RPEDs, you can miss uh, you can miss the uh, the CNVM. CNVM. Again, what would you what would have helped you confirm a late phase of an ICG beyond 15 minutes? Because if there's a CNVM, you'll get uh, you you'll you'll get a plaque there. Right. So, if you want to confirm, then the other thing to have done was 
to take the late phase ICG. And again, that ICG cannot be a, um, the, the normal ICG. It has to be a scanning uh, ophthal uh, ophthalmoscope, SLO based. Now, let's assume for a moment, dono ni pata lagla. Still, you have this lesion, you treat it. Injected. Go ahead. Eight minute. Let's go to this also. Go back. In, yeah. What do you have in this? Because this is the eye which you have ignored altogether. Why are you not treating this eye? No, so this is a three, four year long history with already received no, multiple injections. No, I'm just saying when this patient comes like this, if a patient comes to me like this, mm -hmm. this is either shrem, it's either fibrin or it's blood. It has to be one of the two. And this lesion could be part of a scar or maybe just, or maybe just the CNVM. Either way, I would give this patient a chance with treatment. Because mm -hmm. let's assume for a moment, I accept that this is a scar. Let's assume let's say this is a scar. In the juxtafovial area, this guy can still get eccentric vision. You've, not, you've made him lose this chance by not treating him. At least one injection was, was uh, mandated to see the response. And if you get a response, further treatment was indicated. If you don't get a response, you could say, okay, I don't want to do it. And I would even be happy giving just ranibizumab. I don't need to, in this kind of lesion, especially the type 2 kind of lesions, I don't need to give uh, aflibacet. I'm happy giving just uh, ranibizumab, and it works. Okay, let's go. This is one thing I wanted to point out, because I would have treated it. No, so, so this happened? patient had already so received four or five injections when he so came to see, us. Achha, we don't have so if you if you treated this, this should have disappeared. This should have disappeared. Only this would be left, and it will become more well defined. That would be a fibrotic scar. Right now, is not looking like a fibrotic scar. Let's go ahead. Sumit, anything? No, you yeah. You showed the response was there. No, it was initially you were not. Now if if I am on now, see one second. Even within this, you have a change occurring yes, on the OCT. Go to the previous one. Yeah. Even this is before. This is after. No, sir. This is just different. The other way around. Scans. Which is worse? No, no. This different. Oh, it's the same area. Yeah, different. So okay. So this doesn't. Yeah. Now that's the other important thing. When you are doing a follow-up of any patient with a CNVM. It's, sometimes what happens is one area becomes better, the other area is either the same or even worse. So it is not enough to just say, Ek area dekha, wo uska kya hua. you need to actually go through the whole thing. That's why I don't accept other people's OCTs, because sometimes you can miss a lesion because of that. Sometimes your own guy may also miss it unless you go yourself and check it out. Now go ahead. I want to show where you showed that it, yeah. Now here. You've got this was, this was with uh, bronchocism, right? And before this was this big. So that means bronchocism has done two things. It has reduced fluid. It's also reduced the RPD. That means something is happening there which is active and which is responding to bronchocism. Now let's go ahead. Now, once you, here, you've got a change in vision. A change in vision, oblique, a change in OCT are both improvements. So you've got an improvement, even though it's a small improvement. But you can't six twelve se kitna improvement hoga. Doi line to improve hoga kya ek hoga. So so to say that this was not an improvement is not acceptable. Let's go next. Now, supposing from there you've come to this, this is a recurrence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That means whatever treatment you were doing did work, and now whatever the duration you've given has resulted in a recurrence. So he needs something. Yeah, so we injected. Yeah? yeah, now. This is just now, injection. Now you may come to a situation where it stays at this level. Mm -hmm. Now if it stays at this level and you've given the previous injection one month later, mm -hmm. I would increase to six weeks. And say, if I increase to six weeks, does the fluid remain the same? Does the RPD remain the same? If actually they remain the same, then I will give the injection at six weeks and then go to eight weeks for it. But my follow-ups will always remain four weeks because I don't want to miss that early recurrence which can make the patient lose vision. So the follow-up remains four weeks. I see any increase in fluid, I treat. That means now it's no longer six weeks, it will come down then. 
or if it goes up to eight weeks, I may go down to six weeks after that. Remember the change in treat and extend from four weeks to 16 weeks is not a single exponent, a single straight line journey. It is marked by ups and downs. So you get the patient going up to eight weeks and comes down to six weeks. Then again goes up to 10 weeks, then goes back to six weeks, then goes up and then finally comes to 16 weeks. So it's not, it's not, and, and this process can take an year. So, you know, why I'm telling you this? Because uh, Pradeep talked a lot about, is it worth it? And if you say a patient lost his vision in an year or two, what, was it worth it? But you know something? Patients are losing this vision because you're not treating them on time. You're not, and I'll tell you something. I see this all the time. Injection is given, this is two months later. Why? Aflibercept is given. So, does aflibercept mean it has to be eight weeks? No. If you see the view, view trial, with eight weeks, it was a sawtooth appearance of the fluid, which means it was inadequate treatment in a number of cases. So please follow up four weekly, but treat as required. You may not give that injection at four weeks, but please follow up at four weeks. If you do that, I guarantee you, your patients will maintain vision for years. Most of the patients who are losing vision are losing because of inadequate treatment. And we, you know, um, treat and extend, that's why the Americans do, that's why the Europeans do, because they don't want to take a chance. But that is a lazy way to do it usually. Treat and extend is the second part of the journey. The first part, you, you have to follow up four weekly and see how the patient's behaving. And the treat and extend does not mean six weeks it means you come at four weeks I will see you at four weeks if it's eight weeks I'll again see you at four weeks then again see you at eight weeks and then follow you up not that I let you come back and with a recurrence so this is the important thing whether it's brolicizumab or it's a flibercept or it's bevacizumab the important thing is if you want to put the patient on treat and extend do it with four weekly follow-ups. And you could have done this before. Before I quickly summarize, can next I take case. a comment from Dr. Pradeep? Next on case. Me next, okay. next case. Good. Okay. Just you. to solve the confusion, nee, I nee, think nee, I'll just nee, say nee. that next. even if you cannot demonstrate on uh, nee. imaging a new vascular process, the... No, nee, Dr. Uh, Talwar is right because I have seen so many patients, eight weeks, subrenal bleed, vision gone from six. 24 to finger counting so judis that is why the we have to yes. it is so the new vascular process may exist and if it is responding to therapy uh, we cannot hold our hand and we have yes, to continue next, the next next yeah, yeah, we are yes. saying the same thing yes. in different ways yeah. okay yeah dr Par so uh, good afternoon everyone again i am going to talk about brolocism i'm only so <laughs> about the patient it was a 70 year old male in the right eye we had a type active type 1 CNVM and the presenting visual acuity best corrected was 618 parts. In the left eye there was a disciform scar there and the visual acuity was 6 by 60 multiple injections had been tried outside and this was the best uh, visual acuity which, which we, uh, they were able to achieve. So in the right eye we gave three loading dose of aflibercept one month apart and on along with the second inj injection we had also done a phaco emulsification surgery as there was IMSC there. So we can see scarred CNVM in the left eye. So after th uh, the third loading dose of aflibercept, there was resolved activity and the patient was again followed up. Uh, we followed the normal treat and extend regimen. At six week follow up of, of aflibercept, uh, reactivation was noted as we can see with the uh, SRF there. So the fourth aflibercept was injected at the six week interval. So in this case, there was no uh, reactivation at every four week follow up and on treat and extend, at every sixth weekly follow up, there was reactivation. So we could not extend the interval between injections beyond six weeks in this case. So uh, within, uh, in this case, a total of seven aflibercepts were given in th to the patient in the right eye, three loading doses and four injections at six weekly interval. So again, after the seventh injection, there was a reactivation there. So at that time, we had uh, we got our hands on rolicizumab. It was introduced into, into our center. So we counseled the patient and being one night, we again told about the intraocular inflammation and the chance of occlusive vasculitis. We counseled the patient, patient agreed, and uh, we gave a trial of brolucizumab there. Being a one-night patient, again, we were fearing whether there, was, there might be some inflammation or there or something or not. 
but on two weekly follow up like a magic along with the srf there was uh, excess um, uh, the pd decreased significantly there was significant decrease in pd along with the srf so again uh, we follow up the patient now at on reaching the dreaded six week follow up at um, with afli bursett on every six weekly follow up we had a reactivation but on six but on six weekly follow up of uh, first prolisumab there was no reactivation there here on eight weekly follow up although there was no uh, srf or irf there but there was slight increase in the height of the pd so on eight weekly follow up we decided to reinject second prolisumab in this case we didn't give three uh, loading dose of prolisumab one monthly interval now at six week again of uh, second prolisumab there was no reactivation there was decrease significant decrease in the height of the pd and uh, at eight weeks again there was increase in the height of the pd again don't no significant srf or irf was there so we injected the third brolisumab <coughs> so at again eight weekly follow up third uh, brolisumab there was increase in pd but there was no srf irf so we decided that we should wait and watch and we didn't inject this time at eight weekly follow up so there was increase in pd but no significant srf then we again call back the patient on 10th week follow up now there was more increase in the height of pd but still we did not eject because there was no significant srf or irf there now at 12 weekly follow up of the third injection there was clear clear reactivation with srf there so we injected a third injection prolisumab and there was again a decrease in SRF, srf and pd so the advantage we found here was it was much if more effective in reducing the activity um, there was decrease in both srf irf and significant decrease in pd we were able to extend the uh, treatment free interval to 8 to 12 weeks in this case and uh, luckily we had no in, uh, evidence of any intraocular inflammation in this case and visual acuity we were able to maintain in this one eyed patient at 66 six parts so thank you so i think this also highlights the same treat and extend so we may not discuss too much the next, only thing next, i next might say is that initial prolisumab response was quite good and i was i thought that maybe it will be work wonders but Initially, it just extended it by two weeks from six to eight. So that may not be that much of an advantage. But finally, it's not my case. Finally, he's next saying that it extended to 12 weeks. So maybe next that presenter is definitely. Next presenter, who is? Okay. So we'll go to the next, next session. Next presenter. Just one thing. Did the yeah. vision improve when the, uh, when the RPED became better? When the RPED became less, yes. did the vision become better? And when the RPED came back without the SRF, did did the patient say my symptoms have increased so the change in the height of pd there was no change in visual acuity at last in before the last injection at 12 weekly follow up the patient had a loss of uh, one line with srf with srf not with without SRF. the SRF. not without with okay SRF. Uh, pradeep my question to you is do you do we run after the peds no i think quiescent i would not go in fact no i mean if in this case the ped increased following the initial uh, resolution now the PDK has come back. Would you would you like to treat? Say the PD no, came back at four. No, no sir. PD yeah. came back four weeks. Uh, it's come back a little bit, and eight weeks has become a little larger. Yeah, so, so would you treat? Yeah. So one one thing is I would like to see the scans so that the vectors are at the same region. I think that precision is unnecessary. So I hope that, that yeah. So we are presuming that I would not inject. I'll just follow up. I'll not treat a PD. Yeah, six, that's what I asked. That's what he said. Six, six, that's what he said. The vision was stable. So the question, because the question is, are we dealing? If we are dealing with activity, so are we dealing with a activity which can now um, suddenly go to it could go to a stage of hemorrhage also? And if he's one-eyed, whether it's justified to treat at that stage when the PD comes back? And my only reason for not treating this guy would be because he's on brolicism. And I don't want to give brolicism less than eight weeks. So probably I would not have treated four weeks, but eight weeks if the RPD increased, whether that is an indication for treatment. What about you, uh, Rohan? Nick, contrarily, Sir. actually, I have a faculty member from cardiac anesthesia who's following up. So we had treated her again with ILEA uh, two years back. And then again, suddenly a small amount of PD started showing up. And then I had planned an injection. She couldn't come on that day, so there was a delay. So when repeated the uh, the OCT, 
again the PED on its own had gone down. So ever since, it's showing a spontaneous increase, not significant increase, okay. but spontaneous increase and then going back. That's one okay. of the difficult cases. Yeah, I've explained to her, she's got 6-6 six, six vision. I've explained to her about the situation and I've told her that I don't know how to manage your case. Yeah. And unless I see SRF, I'll not treat. Yeah. So, if it's yeah. too wide, I wouldn't bother. No, she is, uh, she is, but I've not but treated her. But if it's one eyed, my problem is which so, way to go. Yeah. So when so to you, treat a type 1 sort of I'm indium? I'm talking about the yeah. kind of yeah. picture so you got. Like I'll, the I'll talk about it in my talk. Okay. I have something in mind. Yes, uh, about Dr. Talwar, I have seen uh, three, four patients in which not injected and they came because of subretinal bleed. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a very careful, you cannot, you know, if you have to, you if you increase the... You can never predict the bleed, so Haan, that is why the cannot, fear. And, that is why I am saying. And that. that's the reason. You why cannot fear predict. Ke mein toh, uh, the Western world is hmm. is uh, sort Bankly. of bankrupting itself Haan. with the treat and extend injections. Treat and extend. Treat. For every case where every it's not case. needed, also. So we'll just give a ne memento to Dr. Shreyas. Uh, Dr. Shaurya, please. Dr. Shreyas. Pradeep, Pradeep. Dr. Pradeep. 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 Flight. <laughs> and Dr. Kaushik also. Dr. Kaushik. Okay, so we start. Sorry, so we start the debate session, and first we have uh, Dr. Ruchir, again ex senior resident at RP Center. He would be talking on innovator molecules are the way to go. A very good afternoon to everyone, and thanks uh, to everyone for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's always a great uh, pleasure to come back to Alma Mater and speak. So I've changed the topic a little bit. I'll be talking about why I still choose innovators and not why I only choose innovators, because that would not be the truth. So this is the disclaimer, there's no financial interest involved. Okay. So before we can start a meaningful discussion about innovators and biosimilars, we need to understand what these are. So innovators are basically the parent molecules which are developed after immense research and development. It takes years to develop a molecule. And they have a robust efficacy and safety profile. So before a molecule is released into the market, a lot of research goes in, a lot of uh, studies happen lot of data is gathered and only after that is the molecule released. So when we get a molecule, we know everything about it more or less and whatever we do not know, we get from the post-marketing data. It is actually the innovator molecules and the companies that are developing these molecules that, that, uh, that will drive the cycle of innovation further. You don't see any other company making new molecules. So if you do not use innovators, we won't be helping them make newer molecules. Now what are biosimilars? So biosimilars are molecules which which have a similarity to the existing innovator molecule. So these are not generic medicines. These are not exactly same molecules. But to be classified as biosimilars, they need to have a comparable pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic, immunogenicity, safety, and efficacy profile. So they might be developed in a different technique. Different cell lines could be used to develop these bio biologicals. They are not exactly same, but they behave in a similar manner. Because these molecules are already available, there is a technique described. It, they become cost effective. So technically, there shouldn't be any problem using biosimilars because they are supposed to be exactly the same. However, the real world data is different. So why would I choose innovators? Firstly, as I mentioned, we have long term safety and, safety and efficacy track record. We have lots of studies. We have lots of data. We know everything about these molecules. Secondly, innovators, the companies that are making innovators, they are, glo they are globally tested. So this, they adhere to strict manufacturing protocols and they have a very good inter-batch comparability. Now what that means is that if I'm using one, one Lucentis injection and if I am using the same injection again from a different batch, I know that if the patient is not responding, I may need to change the injection. It's not just that the injection was less efficacious this time. And safety profile, there is no doubt about it. They do follow a robust reporting of adverse events. 
So uh, till today, I don't think that the Indian pharmaceutical companies are, are following the same guidelines, and uh, and the guidelines are much stricter in the international market. Competition is much more, and much less leverage is given to the pharma companies as compared to what we have in India. Safety is paramount. With biosimilars, there have been multiple cases of infective or non-infective inflammation recorded. Unfortunately, most cases become anecdotal. They go unreported. So these are recorded by doctors, but they're not reported. What that means is that we'll be discussing them in webinars, we'll be discussing them in, in, uh, 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 in between our uh, colleagues, but the government does not know that that's, that that has happened. So company ka response is, sir, bad, bad batch. Hum isko badal denge, koi baat nahi hota hai. So this is such a nonsensical response to a complication which the doctor has to face, and the company is not held accountable at all. So this is uh, one of the reasons. So I'll share a personal anecdote. I was using biosimilars. Uh, this was in 21. I used about 120 vials of a particular biosimilar Indian company. I had three cases of steroid inflammation. Now these were all from different batches. I reported it to the company. I filled all the forms that were supposed to be filled. I sent all emails to or to everyone. Now the response that I get from the company is, because two cases were done along with cataract, they said the inflammation was because of cataract, so they will not even report it as an inflammation because of the injection. Fine. What about the last case which only had the response of the injection? They said that supposedly there is a government dictum that three, uh, a, a minimum of three cases have to have uh, happened for it to be reported to the government. Now. This case, these uh, cases were particularly interesting because this biosimilar molecule was being marketed by a different company and was manufactured by a separate company. So there was a webinar happening by the parent company where I raised this issue. A lot of Retina colleagues were there. A lot of company people were there. Lots of calls were received by me from the head of the company, from the head of the engineering team. I received a lot of calls. A lot of physical meetings happened between the company representatives. I was assured that something will come out of it. But uh, uh, till uh, today, I don't have any update on the cause or the corrective actions taken by the company. And unfortunately, everything was lost between the two marketing companies. So it is only in, di in uh, difficult situations that you start questioning your judgment. So what are the difficult situations for me? First is ROP babies. I have never till date used any Indian biosimilar in an ROP baby because I would never want to do that, to risk even if there is a 0.1 chance of sterile inflammation happening. Second is one-eyed patients. So one of the inflammation cases that I had was a one-eyed CRVO patient. I had sleepless nights for a month. I had to give him oral steroids. He was a glaucoma patient. He had IOP spikes. It was a very bad time for me. And third is something that I was taught at RP center. Always personalize. Are you ready to give that injection to your own relative? If you are so uh, convinced about using that injection in your own father or your mother, then maybe you can offer it to the patient as well. So what is the conclusion? I don't think we have reached that stage where biosimilars are same as innovator. We are on the right track, but it will still take time. We need more accountability from the pharma companies. We need better regulations. We need better adverse drug reaction things. And I think because VRSI has, has actually come up with an adverse drug reaction portal, that these things are now coming to the fore. One thing that has good has happened is because of the more uh, competition in the market, different patient support programs have uh, come up from the innovator companies, which have significantly decreased the financial burden to the patient. And finally, as uh, Talwar sir also said, you, know, you have to do financial planning for the patient. So you, you, you should choose your own patient. You should discuss the financial situation. But the final decision lies with the patient. Give the patient all the options. And if the patient chooses uh, the innovator molecule, there is nothing like it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Dr. Sumit Khanduja, I think we'll take the next talk and then the discussion. Uh, so Dr. Sumit would be opposing the motion and will be talking in favor of biosimilars. everyone uh, thank you uh, my teachers for the opportunity so my talk is that biosimilars are good for use in ophthalmology so for that I would like to tell you that why did I actually start using them uh, 
so back in 2015 i was working in haryana and we got 19 cases of around uh, of uh, botched up cataract surgery it was a cluster endophthalmitis now cluster endophthalmitis is not an issue the issue was that the doctor was ostracized and the case goes on on him till today and one of the issues that was raked up was that he had used ringer lactate instead of bss i mean maybe for residents who do not know at that time autoclave ringer lactate was a very common practice bss was in, was introduced much later and the ringer lactate bottle set for iv use and that was and not only it went to the consumer he it, the state actually put a criminal charge on him so at that point of time i told my teachers my i was working in pgms rohtak as a faculty and we said that probably you know that even avastin has that same problem we used to use avastin for most of our patients and we took a conscious decision we were ostracized again by our uh, you know hospital administration that you know suddenly you have put so much burden on the patients you know aims continues to give avastin pj chandigarh continues to give avastin and you are the ones who have stopped but then this happened a cluster end of thelmitis of avastin happened in cases of dr dogra in pj chandigarh and what did the company say the company said that this drug has not been used for use in ophthalmology what did the chemist say the chemist said that we are traders not manufacturers so that is how at one point of time we got came across this drug called rezumab why because uh, at that time intas was manufacturing manufacturing intasol and we were quite convinced so i took a leap of faith this was my personal decision along with my boss and that is how we started the use of biosimilars for our retina patients fast forward 2015 till today now you have lot of ophthalmic biosimilars in the international market not only in the national market and how it is made is actually that these biosimilars the uh, the drug sequence you know the uh, of the uh, dna and the mrna is available in public domain and that is what exactly intas has done is that they have taken this domain they have made some modifications have got a patent for that and used that that for making the drug and it's not for those of you who do not know that this biosimilar market is not an unregulated market there are guidelines that have to be followed by the dgci and by the dbt have made these guidelines that the reference biological has to be licensed it should be ha- you should use the same cell line you have to submit det- all the details of your host cells your cultures your protein pro- development processes down regulation processes and you have to have the same amino acid sequences same post translational modification so there is a level of you know uh, care that is been taken into the manufacturing of these biotherapeutics in india then often it has been made a concern that of anti drug antibodies that biosimilars have so let me tell you that anti drug antibodies exist both for the innovative molecules as well as for the biosimilar and this should not be one of the reasons that stops uh, restrict you from using biosimilar drugs then there is a very pertinent problem that is of intraocular inflammation that is discussed i admit that biosimilars that have been used have co- had in uh, you know in episodes of intraocular inflammation in the past for as in for uh, the intas it was because of the histidine that was being used and they replaced it then in other cases it has been because of the lps antigen or other impurities now i'll tell you like just you get one tas or you get one endophthalmitis in your ot that doesn't mean you close down your ot so similarly if you know a company has had uh, got a product which has kind of caused an inflammation that doesn't mean that you entirely throw away or discard so that actually happened that is shown that over 2016 17 the product quality has improved and now there are studies which are coming of comparing the innovative molecule versus the biosimilar so to what i actually do is that as long as you can understand see even i will not say that it is as i mean it's as good as so uh, probably an indian company like intas or uh, or you know reliance will never have the same robust model as you know the same robust lab as that of uh, novartis or genetic but at the same time you have to understand that you if you can understand the limitations that not all of them are bad 
so you can actually use these ones i have particularly been sticking to intas there is no i mean i don't have any financial association there with them but this is the truth i particularly have refrained from zybev i have given them in patients of rop as well one eyed as well and in my own relatives as well so my final point for you and for rucher is that when the pockets of the patients are dry and the armd is wet dr rucher still argues with me that eccentrics is the drug to inject but he will also look at the sky when the patient asks him sir how much vision will i get <laughs> thank you sir so very nicely put uh, dr sumit so i we won't next. spend much time on this next, uh, next. only thing is yes sir is in our haryana roadways mode <laughs> next, next. <laughs> so our companies definitely have to become better at manufacturing better. processes and better at yes, all the will. sterility markers and perhaps we can then go ahead with the biomarkers and as our experience increases all of us are adopting more and more of these biosimilars so let's go to the next yeah No, I Which would I would add to that. I would say perhaps many of the US people are importing drugs from Indian labs. Indian labs. So in future, we would probably expect so much better is, manufacturing just quality. Just because yeah. it is cheap does not yeah. mean that they have they shouldn't be sticking to those guidelines. We, they should be held responsible and and accountable for whatever is happening with their drugs. Yes, Definitely. I agree. I fully agree. Okay. Now, so in we'll next go to the next topic. Anti-VEGFs versus steroids for diabetic retinopathy. First speaker is Dr. Ambar. who is also our ex senior resident and now faculty at guru nanak eye hospital uh, uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i will be talking on anti vegfs for uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, for, for the junior residents i would like to summarize three studies which uh, documented safety and efficacy of anti vegfs over steroid the first is Uh, diabetic retinopathy clinical uh, research network protocol i which did a head on comparison of uh, ranibizumab with prompt laser and deferred laser with uh, interval of 6 months versus uh, intravitreal tramsinolon and prompt laser they documented that the visual outcomes of uh, ranibizumab group were superior to tramsinolon the effect was maintained over 2 years second study was bevodex where uh, monthly bevacizumab injections were compared with four monthly ozodex or dexamethasol implantable injections and they evaluated eyes over two years uh, in all the eyes uh, bevacizumab was considered superior to uh, uh, ozodex injections as far as the visual acuity was concerned when they uh, reanalyzed the subgroups of the pseudofecic and fecic eyes they found that bevacizumab fared better in fecic eyes and uh, dexamethasone implants were better in pseudofecic eyes but due to the majority of eyes being fecic uh, the overall results matched well with the fecic eyes third study was uh, diabetic retinopathy clinical uh, research network protocol u where uh, they wanted to evaluate if adding dexamethasone uh, along with ranibizumab injections at the same time did offer any additional advantage over the visual acuity and macular thickness so they uh, uh, evaluated two groups in the first group uh, ranibizumab along with sham injections monthly were given and in the second group ranibizumab injections monthly along with dexamethasone four monthly were given so they analyzed the patient for up to 24 weeks where they found that visual acuity was more or less the same in both the groups but when they analyzed the oct parameters uh, it was found that the combination group had a drier oct and a thinner oct parameter as compared to ranibizumab but this did not corroborate with any additional visual acuity advantage because the vision was identical in both cases the problem with the steroids we all know uh, the common use steroids are tramsinolon acetonide dexamethasone implants and fluoxetine acetonide implants are two, two main problems are cataract and glaucoma the rates vary from uh, 54% in tramsinolon injections to as high as uh, 80% progression in fluoxetine acetonide injections glaucoma in uh, patients requiring glaucoma medication and surgeries the chances of requirement of surgeries vary from less than 1% in dexamethasone implant patients to as high uh, as high as 8% in uh, fluoxetine acetonide injections prob there are certain uh, problems with anti vegf which have already been discussed uh, monthly injections are required in uh, vegf as compared to steroids which required three or four monthly injections every injection requires frequent follow up frequent hospital visits which itself adds to the cost bearing for the patient both due to injection the cost of the injection and cost of the follow up with every injection there are risks of infection uh, inflammation and also cardiovascular accidents 
but there are certain uh, uh, situations in which steroids will be preferred as a first line management and i would like to invite dr nawajish which she will throw more light on the same chalo okay next na she is also our ex senior resident and now faculty at gnec so she is going to speak against this in favor of steroids and she was senior resident unit 2 okay He was in unit one, so ah, it's unit one to fight. Good afternoon, respected seniors and my dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Nawazah Sheikh, and I'll be discussing whether corticosteroids are the way to go in diabetic retinopathy. So my approach to this topic would involve the following three subheadings. Firstly, we need to understand what is the pathogenesis of diabetic macular edema. As we can see from this flow chart. it is not just vegf which is the cause of diabetic macular edema inflammation plays a significant role and as you can see from the flow chart inflammation is higher up on the totem pole over here so if i control inflammation i don't only down regulate inflammatory mediators such as il6 8 icam1 tnf alpha1 but i also down regulate vegf itself which would help stabilize the outer blood retinal barrier and reduce the vascular leakage secondly as my worthy opponent discussed the advantages of anti vegf i would like to comment upon the disadvantages we know that there are a subset of patients who have been treated with anti vegf injections but do not respond to it or have persistent dme which can be as high as 40 to 60% of them as shown by these post shock analysis of the same protocol t and protocol i done these are the patients that would somehow require some sort of rescue therapy which would usually be a focal or a grid laser which is in itself a destructive procedure thirdly the frequency and number of injections required for an anti vegf is much higher adding to the treatment burden of a patient we are already in a developing nation our patients are already non affording they have a lot of difficulties to follow up with us they may be lost to follow up again this adds to the treatment burden for the patient finally what would be the advantages of a corticosteroid we know that in patients with chronic recalcitrant dme defined as patients who have had up to 3 to 6 anti vegf injections and have not responded corticos addition of a corticosteroid has caused a mean improvement in visual acuity we know that patients with hard exudates at with diabetic macular edema through the bivodex and the merit trial have shown that there is reduction in hard exudates in these patients as well as the central macular thickness with a dexamethasone implant so because of the long duration of action of these implants as high as 4 months for dexamethasone 4 to 6 months for dexamethasone implant and fluoxetine implant uh, allowing us a 36 month advantage in patients who are non compliant to follow up we can advise these at the forefront in patients with pseudophagia where we are not worried about the complication of cataract these patients with dme will fare equally well as shown by the protocol i that pseudophagic patients had mean change in visual acuity with trimethasone and prompt laser comparable with ranibizumab with prompt or deferred laser finally i would like to conclude by commenting on the special situations in which corticosteroids would be the preferred treatment modality so we know that patients with pregnancy we do not have safety data regarding anti vegf therapy in these patients we know that patients with recent arterial thromboembolic events per se are not included in the larger treatment uh, the larger trials so we do not have data for that safety in use in them with tectomized eye the there is a change in the pharmacokinetics of any injection in these eyes these patients may have chronic recalcitrant dme itself but because of the change in the pharmacokinetics of anti vegf the champlain study has shown that a single dexamethasone implant used in these with tectomized eye is equally good at uh, controlling the diabetic macular edema finally a patient who has cataract a patient who has proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema a preoperative corticosteroid implant would not only help us to treat the diabetic macular edema but as well as control the post operative inflammation for cataract as well as the future uh, inflammation regarding the 
pan retinal photocoagulation. It would be remiss on my part if I do not comment on the complications of corticosteroids. We know that corticosteroids cause cataract, which is easily remediable. It can cause IOP elevation. The SafeODex trial has shown that ocular hypertension of 32.6% is seen in 32.6% of patients, but thankfully 97% of them have been treated on topical treatment alone. Finally, I would like to conclude that anti-VEGF is not the Brahmasa that we were anticipating it to be. Corticosteroids are the, may be the way to go ahead in DR. Thank you. Thank you. There's a Cochrane analysis of uh, anti-VEGFs versus uh, steroids, which has shown that the incidence of endophthalmitis following steroids is 6.92 times more than that with uh, VEGF. Just giving uh, with anti VEGF. Just Bias giving the information. Or? With that information, would you prefer to have an anti VEGF in your eye or a, or a steroid? Mm. So I would like to take a informed decision with all of these considering. For your study and Dr. No, no, Talwar, for yourself. So, so I've definitely pointed out what are the special situations in which I would prefer corticosteroids. So, so I am faking. I think I'm young, so would go ahead with anti VEGF. Right. For your mother. So for my mother again, so she's faking. If she's pseudo faking. So, uh, depending upon whether or not we'll be if able to... If she's treatment naive, if she's treatment naive, would you prefer to go with anti-VEGF or steroids? Uh, so, anti-VEGF. Okay, I think that concludes the <laughs> argument. The basic, <laughs> the basic point is, in a treatment naive patient, I wouldn't start with steroids. That's all. Yes. But Except in special conditions. Yes, sir. But on subsequent follow-ups, these debates are providing you data which can tell you that when to switch and you can always have to tailor the therapy according to the patient. Yes. Yeah. So okay. Thank you very yes, much. Thank you so much. So we have the third debate. Primary therapy in uh, AMD and DME. Should we still stick with our age-old anti-VEGFs and VEGF <laughs> traps or shift to brolicizumab? Good afternoon, everyone. So since my preceding speakers have already touched upon this topic, so I'll quickly go to the relevant slides. So the conventional therapy constitutes uh, treatment with ranuzumab and uh, flibercept and uh, with recently approved uh, brolicizumab uh, uh, that was approved in 2019 for neovascular AMD and 2022 for DME. So I'll skip the cases. I'll come directly to the meta-analysis that has been published in 2022 of 19 randomized control trials comparing brolicizumab's efficacy versus the conventional anti-VEGF therapies constituting of ranibizumab and aflibercept. So this meta-analysis clearly tells that there are the BCVA gains with any monotherapy are comparable and the discontinuation rates whether they are due to serious or non-serious ocular side effects are also same. There is a better reduction with brolicizumab in the central macular thickness but if we really see the absolute value it is just 39 microns at one year and 35 microns at two years. So how significant is it in the real world scenario we don't know and the lowest injection frequency also it has been told it has been seen that it is lowest with brolicizumab but if we see the absolute mean value it is 5.7 for brolicizumab and for aflibercept it is 6.5 again there is a statistical difference but how significant is the difference we have to keep in mind if we see the meta-analysis done for the DME there are 14 RCTs that have been included in this uh, meta-analysis study published in July 2023 and in all the parameters including the BCVA, CMT reduction, discontinuation rates all are same along uh, among the brolicizumab and aflibercept treated patients. Now coming to the safety profile, this is where the ranibzumab and aflibercept have an edge. Brolicizumab has definite associated intraocular inf inflammation risk and it is up as high as 4.6 percent that was reported in the Hawk and Harrier trials and the inflammation could be as severe as uh, uh, vasculitis, retinal vasculitis and that could also be uh, that could also lead to an arterial occlusion in certain patients and moderate vision loss occurs in up to 0.8 percent of the treated brolicizumab patient eyes compared to 0.1 percent of the aflibercept. If we see the post-marketing surveillance that is also in sync with the published Hawk and Harrier trial reports that vasculitis and vascular occlusions do happen after brolicizumab. And if we, if, if we see these meta-analysis studies, there are not much studies from the Indian subcontinent. Only two studies are there, one of which is a randomized control trial from 
the RR hospital in New Delhi and in that also the comparable results were noted between the two anti-VHF therapy groups and only one adverse event was noted of severe vitritis but here the sample size was of nearly 115 patients only. And in another study which is a retrospective study with no comparison has been made, intraocular adverse effects were seen in 3.6% of the patients including severe vitritis. So to conclude, the conventional anti vegf therapy given their efficacy and safety profile remains the primary therapy for neovascular AMD and DME and brolucizumab is a viable option when we are considering switch from the conventional therapy, maybe it can be because of poor response or inability to extend the dosing intervals. Thank you. Dr. Pradeep is consultant at RNR RR Hospital. Firstly, I'd like to thank Professor Rajpal and all the faculty at RP Center for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. I'll be talking about new anti wedges for neovascular AMD and DME, whether they should be our first choice or not. So the facts which have been stated till now are that neovascular AMD is primarily anti wedges dependent, while DME has some sort of anti-inflammatory role also for treatment. Brolucizumab and farisumab are two drugs which we have for longer duration of action. The choice of treatment in a patient also depends on cost of each visit and there are definite risk of intraocular inflammation with brolucizumab. Now after this, I like to talk about the evidence which we have as of 2023 with these meta-analysis. We all know that there is a superior reduction in retinal thickness while having comparable BCVA gains. But these data do not tell us that in the long run, once we have a better drying effect, how long we are going to be able to sustain these kind of visual gains. So maybe with a better drying effect, the BCVA gains with brolisumab are going to be superior when we come to 3 to 5 year data on comparison. There is a definite feasibility of 12 weekly dosing. The probe study has shown that we do not need to go to three weekly, three loading doses with brolisumab and we can start with PRN brolisumab and regardless of the prior treatment status, brolisumab worked in both treatment knife and pre-treated eyes in REBA study. Indian data has already been shared by Dr. Devesh. Our data had shown that we were able to achieve longer inter injection intervals while India has definitely shown that there are lack of as much ocular inflammation as the West talks about. The check data shows again that there is a 3.83% ocular inflammation risk with injections. But the good part is that in almost all these events, the inflammation resolved with treatment. This was our study where we realized that brolisumab and eflibercef was given almost similar kind of visual gain results but the drying effect was definitely better with brolisumab and this was happening on the subretinal fluid compartment. But the best part about this was that the inter-injection intervals which were 4 to 8 week in most of the eflibercef group were running into 12 to 20 week in the brolisumab group. So the cost of treatment in long run is going to be much lesser with brolisumab. And when talking of this adverse event which occurred in our case, this patient required oral steroid, there was a talk about giving IV methylprednisolone in such patient, but we have been able to manage three such patients with oral steroids only. Talking about dioptic macular edema, the inflammatory part also needs to be taken care of when we are treating this disease with steroid, topical anesthetics, regaining euglycemia and exercise. The evidence for brolisumab comes from the Kite and Kestrel studies. It does talk about serious adverse events with brolisumab which were a little higher than eflibercept, but it has been shown that there is a definite Q12 week and Q8 week superior efficacy compared to eflibercept and the intertreatment intervals will keep increasing. In Indian scenario, there has been very little published data about DME which is encouraging till date and this is what we have been doing at RR and we will be coming up with this study at DRM and we have been able to establish that on using two different doses of brolisumab that is 3.6 milligram and 6 milligram in 149 injections in one group and 154 injections in the other group we had sustainable 8 to 12 week dosing intervals and patients retained good vision. So my take home messages will be that 
Rulismab gives definite prolongation of inter-injection interval. It shows efficacy in recalcitrant diseases as was shown by my previous speakers. The side effects with Rulismab are real, but they are manageable. None of the eyes which we have reported have lost vision. They were all able to regain vision after management with oral oblique topical steroids. And one, if a question arises, when should I choose anti-VEGF? I will say that primarily it can be chosen for any case. But definitely for recalcitrant diseases, patients who are unlikely to follow up, patients who are intelligent enough to report a serious adverse event but are not going to follow up with you for next two to three months, brolizumab is definitely a choice. It is economically more viable than ranibizumab or eflibercept. If anybody talks about the economics of it, Rolismab will work out cheaper, almost comparable to the biosimilars. And at RR, this remains our first choice of drug for neovascular AMD and diaptic macular edema as of date. We have completed about 1100 injections till now. We have had three serious ocular adverse events. All three were manageable with steroids. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So in interest of time, we will not discuss too much, but I will just summarize that with every new drug, there is a euphoria, initial euphoria. It was there with aflibercept. The same thing has happened with brolicizumab. Unfortunately, it has been dented by some of these side effects. But I think uh, it's another drug in our armamentarium and uh, judicially used and wherever, like in take-home message, Dr. Pradeep has pointed out, there are definite certain indications. And one thing which I definitely want to look out in the future is for diabetics. If I can extend the duration of action with brolicizumab, that would be much more of an advantage. So we can use all these drugs in combination. And I would again like to give a memento. Sir, Dr. Rajpal, sir, you want to say something? I, I was just saying that actually with uh, brolicizumab, the, the number of patients whom uh, you cannot extend is around, uh, I think, 20 to 25 percent. That figure goes up to probably 30 percent or 35 percent with uh, aflibercept. But even with aflibercept, you have 40 percent patients who are extended to 16 weeks and 60 percent of the patients who are actually at 12 weeks. So the difference between the two is of some 15 percent or so. Um, so in terms of the extension of the uh, frequency uh, of the uh, intervals, there's only a small difference. So, uh, so I would actually uh, normally use, since aflibercept is safer, start with the aflibercept. And if I can't extend, then prefer to use brolicizumab because that actually is working to weed off uh, a significant number of patients. So if I can take away 50, 60 percent of patients, now they don't have the risk of this inflammation and all those things which are coming up. And the ones who don't respond, then now I have two reasons for shifting them. One, they're not responding, and this, they may respond with this. Now that higher risk involved with the intraocular inflammation becomes more acceptable. So this is the, uh, a little difference in the approach that I, you know, I would generally use. And would you use brolicizumab from the beginning as once in three months, or would you use it as um, monthly initially and then three monthly? Once in three months, now, even for neovascular. Uh, starting from the beginning. Okay, so PRN from initiation is the difference with brolicizumab, which is something which can be an advantage. So PRN, I would definitely agree, but Dr. Pradeep, suppose you gave the first injection and after say six weeks patient is not totally dry. You won't repeat brolicizumab at six weeks, you'll still wait for three months? No, sir. The, in those cases. Sir, the talk about 12 week is only when the patient is dry. If the yeah. patient is not dry, definitely in a PRN repeat. regime you are going to repeat. But the strict three loading doses at four weekly interval, mandatory dosings are out. We are not doing that. Mandatory dosing, I think, are always probably uh, not that definite now. We all know maybe they are the company-sponsored part. Okay. So, Dr. Atfal, please, would you present uh, to Dr. Ruchir? Okay, Dr. Pradeep first. Uh, and in the previous... <laughs> Dr. Sumit. No, no, please, we can have it. Dr. Sumit.
डॉक्टर अंबर एंड डॉक्टर नवाजिश एंड डॉक्टर रिचिर So, Dr. Pradeep, sir, in the previous debate, would you like to just add something before we go to the next session? Any points from your side? No, sir, can have a minute. Sir, can take a minute. So, comment so, lele. Dr. Rohan ke baad. Yeah, so I'm very fond of uh, the Illuvian implant. Unfortunately, it's not available, probably because of the cost. So I think if pseudophagic patients, I have access to Illuvian, I think that will be my first choice. With a 25 gauge kind of an insertion, and uh, I think it's it's wonderful. I, I'd go with that, yeah. In treatment now patients? In, in, in pseudophagic, pseudophagic pseudo patients yeah, pseudo with DME, with DME. I yeah. would go with Illuvian if it becomes available okay. because it has a three-year duration of release. So I think it works well also. And, uh, and it's not like the 22-gauge Ozodex. It's a 25-gauge implant. Yeah. And it's costly. 4.5 lakh. In the US. It might soon come to India. Yeah, next. So moving on from therapeutics to diagnostics, I would be talking a bit on OCT angiography. So this is a novel new technology which is dialess, which can be done in spectral domain as well as web source domain and uh, the on fast imaging gives us a real segmentation of the and a possibility of segmentation of each separate layer of vasculature of the retina and choroid and better understanding of what is happening in these vascular diseases. But a drawback is we cannot see the leaking which is in some cases is an advantage and in some it can also be a drawback. So just for the residents and all those uh, people, just for their understanding, uh, what it does is it analyzes the decorrelation of the OCT signal of the RBCs as they move through the red blood cell, uh, these vessels. And the decorrelation is analyzed as a flow signal and you get the representation of these blood vessels without the injection of the dye. Now the limitations are currently we have a limited field of view and in case the retinal architecture is seriously distorted or too thickened then the image segmentation suffers especially in structures which have elevated pigment epithelial detachments we are unable to actually get the image of what we want to see like we can miss the choroidal neovascular membranes there and in cases of high refractive errors also imaging may be difficult. Other things which I would be coming to in subsequent slide but which you need to understand are the artifacts. So one of the most important is the projection artifacts which can lead to a false impression of vasculature and uh, vascular flow through small uh, low flow structures such as microaneurysms and polyps are not imaged well by this modality at present and even the deeper choroidal vessels are not imaged as well and presently OCTA cannot be taken to define the end point of anti-VEGF therapy. So just to give you an example of what segmentation actually is. So you see these four images depict the different layers of the retinal vasculature, superficial, deep, deeper and the much deeper below the RPE. So if you take these two lines, so you must always see the B scan flow and where your uh, optometrist or where the imaging technician has taken the image from. So this shows the segmentation. So these two blue lines represent the cut which you are imaging in this part of your frame. Okay, so this is the light green which they have bordered and so these two light green show that this is the part which they have actually imaged. So this should actually lie where you want it to be. If it lies at a different plane, you might misjudge the level of the vascularity. For example here, you might say that there is a new vascular membrane coming right up in the superficial or the deeper retina. Whereas when you 
properly segmented you will notice that it actually lies much deeper only in the deep retina or under the rp or the corocapillaries level so you have to ensure proper segmentation to improve image quality and to actually discern where is the level of the abnormal vasculature this is one thing you must uh, understand before you analyze these images uh, another example here you see so you these two blue lines is where the image has been segmented and so you will see the blue box over here and this shows the small abnormal vasculature just beneath the retinal pigment epithelium over here and even on the B scan you can see the flow signals highlighted with these colored dots so again you should analyze which colored dots are corresponding to my on phase image that will tell you what type of CNVM it is so this is the box to be seen when you are seeing those two blue lines so why are you seeing these vessels in this scan so these are superficial retinal vessels but again you are seeing in the deepest scan so this is what is a projection artifact so because of the retinal pigment epithelium being highly reflected the signal of the superficial vessels is getting reflected from the rp and again being captured even in the deeper cut so this is a projection of the superficial vessels in the deeper layer do not confuse it with anything else these are very linear dichotomous branching so you know that these are retinal vessels but sometimes you may have some smaller vessels also and you may confuse it with CNVM so please be sure that it is not an projection artifact and to get rid of it you have to just adjust these lines to go below the RP if you adjust the, your segmentation just below the RP many of the projection artifacts will go away just to show here so there is uh, and this have causes trouble in cases of Drusen people have defined ill defined CNVMs in these condition and this is nothing but a projection artifact because of the elevated RP over there this is not a CNVM another example in a different OCT again you might say there are flow signals so white things are said to be flow signals dark is a non flow signal there are flow signals in the deeper cuts and they may be new vascular membranes even in Drusen but they are again projection artifacts so you have to be a little careful while you are analyzing this so uh, like I said again look at the B scan to tell whether it is a type 1 or a type 2 CNVM here you can see the CNVM in the deep retinal cut as well as the choriocapillaries cut so is it a combined CNVM this won't tell you so you have to look here and as most of the flow signal is above the RP I would call this to be a type 2 CNVM so you have to correlate with the uh, B scan OCTA scan also and as opposed to this where the OCT is showing the pathology to be mostly below the retinal pigment epithelium and the OCTA scan shows the membrane but this is more of a type 1 CNVM over here again sometimes you can get artifacts like you have a halo here with some signal so halo with signal many people can call it a CNVM but look at the B scan this is just a PD and no flow signal here so that is just an artifactual impression that may, there may be a separate membrane there please this is not a CNVM so you have to be a little careful of these artifacts while you analyze it now coming to the utility so this patient came with problem in the right eye but when we saw the left eye OCT scan we again saw that it also has a problem it has a PED and it has this subretinal hyperreflective membrane and if you don't want to do an angiography just do an OCTA scan and you can get the crodal neovascular membrane so without injecting the dye and we know that the left eye also needs treatment so here is something what I was alluding to which in the last one Dr. Talwar asked that what about a PED should you inject in all PEDs so here have a look at this subretinal hyperreflective membrane and the discontinuity in the PED so I think these are I'll again come with some more images these are some markers which I take as activity when the PED starts becoming discontinuous and you start seeing some hyperreflective material above it even in the absence of SRF may be an indication for injection okay. uh, Rohan just one, one check with the previous image yeah. this could this just be a POHS lesion because it doesn't seem like AMD it, it's more so like this a patient was uh, 60 plus and uh, I would probably uh, diagnose it as a uh, type 1 or a type uh, mixed type 1 type 2 CNVM ocular histoplasmosis at this age group plus in our uh, subcontinent I would not diagnose and just by th and this also had a bleed adjacent to it if we look at it carefully and no other signs of inflammation in the eye yeah generally they are quite but at age probably okay fine everyone. thanks so uh, I found this to be very helpful in idiopathic CNVMs where you don't get the typical sometimes bleed or even fluid on OCT but just the subretinal hyperreflective material and OCTA scan immediately shows up the membrane and even on the after injection you get 
uh, good response, but this response can be variable. In this, you have got a very good response. Uh, image, the vascular membrane has gone, and we have published this. This is marked resolution. Whereas some cases you may get a moderate response, the size decreases, but you can still see the membrane. And in some cases you may get a poor response on the OCTA, but still the OCT shows a good response and the visual acuity improves. So we tried to correlate whether a response on OCTA can it correlate with the number of anti VEGF injections. But unfortunately, in our study, we did not find a very good correlation. Although, yes, marked resolution, number of injections were less, but not statistically significant. So in other case here, you see an atypical case with some fluid here. Someone does just one OCT, they'll call it CSC. If they look at the OCT a little more carefully, they'll say, oh, no, there is something more to it. Is it actually a pit causing a, um, a maculopathy there? But then if you do an OCT angiography, you see, no, there is a choroidal neovascular membrane. And that's probably because of this subretinal hyperreflective thing over here, which is showing the flow signal. So again, in some cases, OCTA is very helpful where you can pick up these idiopathic sort of membranes, and this becomes an injection for uh, indication for injection. Another young 45-year-old female being diagnosed as CSC, but you see the atypical features here. You have a double layer sort of formation with more of intraretinal fluid. You do a fluorescence angiography, you'll get some stippled fluorescence. Again, not very sure whether there is an actual CNVM lying there. You do an OCT angiography and you can clearly see those branching vessels. So you are no doubt that there is a CNVM lying here. If you had actually seen the ICG carefully, this network is reproduced over here. And you do see these linear lines in the ICG also. So if you do not have an OCTA, if you have an ICG, even that can be helpful. But again, this case, I gave Paginex, Brolicizumab and a wonderful response and uh, but yes this may have a recurrence uh, after a few months and may require more injections so and despite the response octa still shows the membrane so octa cannot be taken as an end point of therapy but again this is a young patient i would probably only inject once the srf comes again but octa cannot be taken as uh, the point of injecting again so parafovil telangiectasia has been talked of so beautifully it uh, highlights that the abnormality in the vessel lies in the superficial and the deep vasculature, retinal vasculature, nothing in the deepest layer and nothing in the choriocapillaries. But sometimes they develop a choroidal neovascular membrane which can be separately picked up. Now these are the projection artifacts, leave that. But this is definite uh, choroidal neovascular membrane separate from the parafovial network and this case would definitely require an intravital injection. Now this patient, relatively good vision. Maybe a little SRF here, but just a bump in the RP. Probably I would have said go, nothing to be done. But the OCTA shows a definite membranous complex here. Again, will you inject is little questionable. And these cases have been rather classified as non-exudative neovascular AMD. So presently, yes, we are not in a hurry to inject. Although 14% of these eyes, 14% uh, of dry AMD eyes have shown ACTA vessels on OCTA and these eyes will have a tendency to develop exudation in the future. So you have to keep them on closer follow up. But yes, no hurry again to inject just on the single scan which I showed you. And this is some scarring with some dead tree like linear thickened vessels. Again, based on this, we will not keep on injecting this patient. Another example of dead tree vessels, thickened vessels with uh, scarring there. Now another thing I wanted to discuss about recently I have seen is cases, cases of best disease which have a fibrotic pillar. Now they start showing a flow signal here. There is published literature on here and which people are causing calling it some sort of CNVM and they are injecting. But I feel that I don't know why the signal is coming in over there. But these patients do remain stable for a long time and unless you see any other feature there is no point injecting them. If they show a bleed then yes, definitely we do inject them. And again, you see what is happening here. The nice rounded configuration of the fibrotic pillar gets altered. You will get a breach. You will get some subretinal sub hyperreflective thing there. And probably even if the bleed was not there, if the breach and this reflectivity was there, then I would have injected this patient, not just on the basis of some vascularity in the smooth rounded fibrotic pillar. So again, after injection, you see again how everything becomes so uniform and the RP uh, covers the pillar and uh, the membrane lies below it and becomes a sort of type 1 membrane. Again, seen on Octa, but this would again, I would wait for the next injection in this patient. Other eye of the same patient also shows a uniform pillar and has been stable despite the membrane on Octa. So what I have summarized it that we would, if there are well-defined pillars, no bleed, no recent metamorphopsia, we would withhold. and 
we would only inject once i see those features in changes in the pillar walls or some subretinal hyperreflective material developing and another example peripapillary cnvm i have treated resolved good vision no fluid but octa will still show these uh, vessels so just based on the persistence of the vessels you cannot go on retreating this patient similarly in choroiditis now myopic cnvm again uh, was highlighted earlier that if there is a bleed it can help you but in cases of myopia and sometimes the imaging becomes difficult a uh, fluorescein angiography definitely helps better it uh, you can detect this definite choroidal neovascular membrane in this case whereas uh, the other eye shows lacquer cracks whereas when i did an octa there was a doubtful lesion it is you can hi you very high likely to miss it had i not done this fa so i would say that in cases where you have a doubt to differentiate between a bleed which is caused by a lacquer crack or a bleed which is caused by a cnvm if octa is not helpful please go ahead and do your routine fluorescein angiography you might pick up a membrane there yeah just one one word of uh, this thing over here the fluorescenes you no know, predominantly what happens is the late phase is always shown if you see the early phase get a sharp early phase image you will still pick it up it's not focused very well yeah, i mean initial when you do a spectral is you no know, the focusing initial phases on only later on you know where to focus actually so if you unless you get a clear early image you will not miss the uh, so the CNV. late phase obviously you're not going to pick up a cnv yeah. early phase mein pa raha hai cnv ha to it will not it will not miss i'm saying yeah so if you don't have yeah, an any way to make a diagnosis you need both the early and late phase yeah, yeah. late phase otherwise could be just staining of a scar yeah. so if you want to be sure you should have both and see how it varies uh the other thing for exudative non exudative amd if uh, i would consider treatment if the patient say uh, complains of metamorphopsia metamorphopsia yes so that's one uh, important thing uh, otherwise i would not consider treatment the other uh, important thing in oct angiography is you use it for your initial diagnosis you don't use it for retreatment retreatment then you use it for retreatment only if the oct angio shows a change in the pattern of the vascularization like if there's a dead tree kind of uh, vascularization and then you find that new arborizations have occurred now even if the fluid has not come this means an early new vascularization has occurred so i may consider this for treatment this is the same patient especially if it's like myopic or idiopathic where the fluid may not come early so after anti vegev you see all that subretinal hyperreflective material has disappeared and you are getting a small dent here just below the isos junction so uh, now this patient could not afford the expensive anti vegevs has been only on avastin despite avastin some fluid remains but again you see what i want to highlight is very nicely defined humps and all whatever activity is occurring is probably the type 1 sort of activity and i think these cases you are not in that much of an hurry to reinject unless the fluid increases or something else happens so again the octa shows this membrane but i was still waiting in this patient because i have given so many the, this much fluid doesn't go i cannot switch in this patient unfortunately due to economic reasons or like i would have tried looks like a drape actually yeah it, so then next month see what happens so next month you see what i again want to highlight is this subretinal hyperreflective material which comes up fluid level is probably not too much changed but the hump is not continuous and you have this subretinal hyperreflective material and an octa like sir just pointed out you have a new membrane here so new complex here so even if i don't have the octa if i have this i would now inject the patient and in may i did inject the patient uh, because of this and uh, it became smooth so this is another patient again showing the same thing this has discontinuity over this hump and this patient does require another injection despite only uh, maintaining this much srf with the all your efforts but now that this discontinuity has come up i would again reinject this patient at this level and you see after the injection again some rp healing somehow occurs and it covers the membrane and pushes it deeper and makes it probably safer for the patient and the like uh, it was pointed out the risk of a large bleed may be lesser now so uh, but again when this hump will come i will inject this patient uh, this is the again octa of the same patient so just to tell you that it is an impressive technology but you must understand how to properly ac uh, acquire the images and the artifacts and the segmentation issues and no imaging modality should be interpreted in isolation but with a clinical history 
and the fundus and OCT and only then we can decide which vascular networks need treatment for how long and at what interval. And I would like to also thank the contribution of all our ophthalmic technicians in our retina lab. They have been uh, taking all these wonderful images for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I invite Dr. Saurabh for the last talk. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be discussing about new anti VEGF molecules and drug delivery systems that we have at our disposal. Uh, so, enough has been discussed and said about Brolicism app today. I'll be skipping about it. Uh, coming to Conversept, it is not exactly a new molecule that, has, uh, that is available, but because it is not US FDA approved, it is available only in China. It is a recombinant fusion protein of human VEGF receptor 1 and 2 binding domains with IgGFC. And the way it differs from aflibercept is that it contains an additional domain 4 of VEGF receptor 2 which uh, helps it in binding VEGF in a much more rigid manner as compared to aflibercept. So phase 3 trials found that conversept was non-inferior to ranibizumab in treating patients of neovascular ARMD. A recent meta-analysis concluded that conversept had similar efficacy to aflibercept in treating patients of diabetic macular edema. However, phase 3 trials called PANDA-1 and PANDA-2 found that Combercept was not found to be non-inferior in treating patients of Aflibercept, uh, uh, in treating patients of ARMD as compared to Aflibercept. Uh, the safety profile of this molecule has been very well established in phase 2 and phase 3 trials in China. This is another new molecule which is being investigated called KSI-301. It is a conjugate of an antibody and a phosphorylcholine biopolymer. The advantage of adding this biopolymer to this molecule is that it significantly increases the molecular weight which makes its m migration uh, through the retina less possible which essentially increases its half-life in the vitreous cavity. So its molecular weight is about 950 kilodaltons and it has a very l long T-half of about 10 days which is almost twice as, as that of aflibercept. Again its safety profile has been well established in phase 2 trials. There was a phase 3 trial called Dazzle trial which compared its efficacy as compared to aflibercept in treating neovascular ARMD. Uh, though it failed to meet the primary endpoint of non-inferiority of BCV in the, both the groups at 52 weeks. Important thing to note here is that in the maintenance phase the patients who were in the KSI arm re were receiving 3 monthly, 4 monthly or 5 monthly maintenance dose whereas patients who were in the aflibercept arm were receiving 2 monthly maintenance dose. So right now there are multiple studies which are going on which are actually evaluating uh, a higher frequency of dosing during the maintenance phase and the results might be positive in future. Again there was a beacon phase 3 trial which compared its efficacy uh, with aflibercept in treating macular edema in cases of BRVO and CRVO and found it to be non-inferior. There are multiple studies which are going on in patients with DME and again the important thing to note here is that uh, a month, uh, maintenance interval of about 6 months is being evaluated in these studies. So even if it is found to be uh, non-inferior to aflibercept, the major advantage that it offers or that it can potentially offer is that the maintenance dosage interval can be significantly and meaningfully increased. So the most important molecule in our list today is farisimab which is available by the brand name Webismo. It has a unique advantage that in addition to uh, inhibition of VEGF, it is also inhibiting the activity of angiopoietin 2. It is FDA approved for treatment of DME and neovascular ARMD. So phase 3 trials called Tenaya and Lucerne found that it was non-inferior in the treatment of neovascular ARMD as compared to aflibercept. Similar results are also seen in treatment of diabetic macular edema by the Yosemite trial and Ryan trial. Again, important thing to note here is that in the farisimab uh, uh, arm, 
we are actually keeping the patients on a 16 weekly maintenance dose whereas the patients in the aflibercept arm are being kept on a 8 weekly maintenance dose so using farisimab in place of aflibercept results in a meaningful extension in the treatment interval thereby reducing the treatment burden uh, trial called balaton is going on in patients of brvo Abisibar pegol is the only anti-VEGF molecule that we have which doesn't rely on some sort of antibody reaction. So it is a genetically engineered protein which has very high affinity towards VEGF and binds VEGF. Uh, it has a half-life of 13 days, again very significantly higher than the existing more commonly used molecules. Um, CDAR and SECURE trials were done in patients of neovascular ARMD and found that it was non-inferior as compared to ranibizumab in treating neovascular ARMD. However, FDA did not approve its use in neovascular ARMD citing its unfavorable benefit to risk ratio because around 15.7% of the eyes showed some degree of inflammation and almost 1.7% patients had severe loss of vision. Though after this, they modified their manufacturing technique and this incidence of inflammation has been brought down to about 8.9% as seen by phase 3 maple trial. Uh, coming to the delivery systems, the, the probably the most important drug delivery system that we have to know about when it comes to anti-VEGF now is port delivery system which is currently marketed by the name of Suspimo by the Genentech company. It is made up of polycell phone, has dimension of 2.6 into 8.4 mm and at one time can house about 15 microliters of ranibizumab. It has a proximal end which, has, which is, uh, contains a self-sealing septum which remains accessible through the conjunctiva and allows access to implant reservoir for drug replenishment. And it has a distal end which has a semi-permeable titanium membrane which allows for continuous passive diffusion of the drug into the vitreous cavity. So in the phase three trial, uh, phase two trial called the Ladle trial, uh, ranibizumab PDS gave comparable visual outcomes as compared to traditional intravitreal injections. In the phase three ARCVA trial, again, they showed that uh, the outcomes were non-inferior and equivalent as compared to monthly ranibizumab injections. But again, um, important thing here is almost 98% of the patients were able to last on six months uh, on PDS without any medical refill. So again, we are increasing the treatment interval by a very high factor. Uh, multiple studies are going on currently uh, in patients of diabetic retinopathy. A very important complication that you have to know here is that it is a very rigid and a very large delivery system. So in phase one trial and phase two trials, almost 25% and 50% patients developed significant vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, after that, they found that this was primarily related to the surgical technique and they altered surgical technique. So this implant is basically in, uh, implanted in the subconjunctival space. You have to make a uh, localized peritomy about 6 into 6 mm in size. Then you have to make a small incision about 4 mm in size in the sclera. Once the sclera is completely removed and the choroid is exposed, you have to then ablate the choroid with 1000 millisecond duration 532 nanometer laser spots which uh, significantly reduces the incidence of vitreous hemorrhage in the post procedure period and now the incidence of vitreous hemorrhage has been brought down to about 5.2 percent uh, another important thing is that there is a significantly higher risk of endophthalmitis and retinal detachment which has been shown to be associated with PDS as compared to the traditional anti of injections. Recently, the company, not FDA or anything, the company has recalled PDS because of some quality control issues with the septum because they found that with repeated injections while loading, the septum was not working to the desired level, but they are trying to improve the design and it might come back. So there are several potential future options which this PDS presents us. It can be implanted with sensors that can monitor drug levels and adjust the release of medications accordingly. Improved catheter designs can reduce the risk of infection and improve drug delivery accuracy. And of course, newer drug formulations and even gene therapies can be delivered through this PDS. In conclusion, I would like to say that anti-VEGF molecules, these new molecules, have this potential to offer several advantages over the existing ones, such as increased efficacy, reduced side effects, and the latest research on these molecules has shown promising results, making them a topic of great interest in the medical community. However, there are still challenges that need to be overcome, and 
despite these challenges and these, despite these obstacles, the potential benefits of these new anti-VEGF molecules cannot be ignored. Thank you. Gene therapy chhod diya tumne. Ah, sir, I said that. Ah, gene, ah, gene therapy, you know. Ultimately, you should, you may get your, the best options may be intravitreal or suprachoroidal gene therapy. Suprachoroidal. And, and that is easy for the, for this, for, uh, for AMD and DME, it's actually just one step forward because you already have the plasmid, which has the ranibizumab. And all you have to do is put it into the um, uh, virus uh, uh, vector and you have the molecule. Unlike, unlike for uh, gene therapy for uh, uh, inherited diseases where it's a completely different cup of tea because then you have to create the entire gene and here the, the gene equivalent of the gene is created which is the ranibizumab. Nee, finally, gene therapy is going so to come. The, so forget the about all may, these things. So the, uh, superconductor, so quantum I physics, a lot I, of things is going to my next I, I 10 years. I think that is what's going uh -huh. to come up in the next uh, um, uh, few years. And there's a technology by putting drop in the sclera, it will go inside. So things are going on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. we have extended we are by one and a half hour, but still I think we had good discussions. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank everyone for uh, attending this CME and special <coughs> thanks to all our guest speakers. And they have come from not just Delhi, outside Delhi also. And uh, special thanks to all uh, the organizing team, especially <laughs> Dr. Shorya, Dr. Devesh, Dr. Saurabh, and their senior residents who have done most of the uh, working hard part of it. And thank you very much. And please, you are welcome for dinner, uh, for sorry, lunch. For dinner. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> almost dinner. There's a lab. Yeah. Lab ka batana, uske yeah. so dinner after lunch, you can proceed to the lab. Nee, before lunch, you, they, they are waiting. Just Three five minutes. Lunch, yeah. After, after lunch, you can. Ne, dinner will be provided? Yeah, dinner is providing. So, yeah, those sure. who can stay for the dinner, dinner will be provided. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Ritviz will be there in the retina lab, and there will be uh, Dr. Devesh in the. Uh, Dr. Somya in the uh, investigative lab, where you can see the intravital injection in the goat side. Okay. Thank you, everybody.